Viens, viens. Good morning everyone! Yay! Can I have some applause finally? Woo! Okay, so welcome to Riga. Finally, fourth edition of Bukhalt Bikani Badger. After three years, we're fucking back. 
Um, two rules of Baltic Honey Badger. No shit coining and enjoy the conference. Uh, I have some practical stuff for you to share. So we have two floors this year. It's the first time actually we have two floors. We have two stages. This stage will be recorded and live streamed. The second stage will be just recorded and put on our YouTube later. We have a street foot corner there. Uh, I wanted also to tell that general admission ticket holders, please, if you don't have a goodie bag, come by the entrance. We will give you a goodie bag. People from press, if you have a general admission badge, please come to the entrance. We will change for the press badge. Now, about your goodie bag. In your goodie bag, there's a lot of good stuff, but there's also a food stamps. Uh, and they have actually two, uh, two main goals or two main reasons to be there. First one, you can exchange those, those food stamps at our food court during the lunch for any meal that you want to choose. And uh, also these food stamps are a reminder why you like Bitcoin and why you're here. So you not use them anywhere outside the Baltic Honey Badger as a joke in your life. I wish you that. Now, um, we all have different opinions about, you, about all different stuff, but let's unite for this weekend at least around the one thing that we love, uh, and it's Bitcoin. So for those who are new, welcome to Honey Badger family. For those who are OGs, welcome back. Please welcome Mr. Stefan Levera, and let's begin. Enjoy. Thank you, Max. Uh, yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Stefan Levera. I host a Bitcoin podcast. I work at Swan. I do a couple things in the space. And I was very uh, happy when Max asked me to MC this conference. It's uh, uh, an honor. I love this conference. It's an excellent experience. And I think uh, I'm really excited. I've seen the agenda and I've had a chance to speak with some of the speakers as well to get a, a little bit of a, a hint about what they'll be speaking about. Uh, so without wasting any further time, let's get on with the show. So. Our first speaker today, he is a well-known uh, educator, consultant in the space. Uh, some say he's a, a Toxy Maxi. He is, uh, he's, he's been uh, listed on the shirt. You know, there's an infamous shirt going around now with three names. He's one of those names. So everyone, please welcome Giacomo Zucca. Good morning, everybody. Uh, okay, can see. Thank you. You know this this T-shirt is uh, it's called Nick Carter. is a singer. Uh, it's, it's good. Uh, you know, blonde hair, and um, so I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I'm happy to be back and honored to be opening. So I, I wanted to to basically pay a tribute to Hodl Hodl. They are running an, an, an exchange where you can buy Bitcoin without KYC trap, so you can uh, keep your privacy. But that's of course is hard because you have to manage your relationship with regulators and other kind of mafia guys. So basically you have a lot of problems for uh, no KYC. So I wanted to smooth things out for them and to give a speech which is a, a speech of uh, appeasement with regulation, uh, a speech which is uh, a little bit, you know, uh, relaxing, mainstream, without too many controversy. So I choose uh, this title. Uh, and it's... Uh, <laughs> but then, the, the reason why the title was not announced is that I, I still had to take a, a flight here. So it was better not to have it on the website. But then I, I realized it was probably too much. So I decided to pull a John Carvalho and make it a sweeter, like, good morning. Money Landry is beautiful. <laughs> So uh, let's start from, from a little bit from afar, from, from money laundering uh, beauty, beauty. And uh, let's start from the point that uh, speech must be free. And try, let me elaborate that for, uh, for, uh, for a few minutes. Uh, the first point to elaborate is that speech is a fundamental right. I, I assume you already agree. If you don't, uh, it's OK to be wrong. You just meet me uh, later, and I will explain. But let's just go over a very quick uh, list of the reasons that uh, uh, speech, free speech, is a fundamental right. There are deontological reasons. It's, oh, wait. Oh, they are censoring me already. Uh, <laughs> that was fast. So 
There are deontological, which is a word that is very like, uh, like uh, pretentious, but it just means that there are logical reasons uh, before e experience or before any kind of utilitarian logic that explain why speech should be free. Uh, the, the framework I like more for, uh, for uh, deontology uh, is uh, called argumentation ethics. Uh, this guy here is uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe. He's a nice guy, if you know him. And uh, I, I suggest you to read argumentation ethics. It's a fundamental, uh, it's my favorite framework for uh, ethical points. And uh, it's very interesting because uh, if you follow this, uh, this uh, ethical framework, uh, you don't only learn that uh, speech must be free, but also that speech is the foundation on the reason everything else must be free as well and every other interaction must be voluntary. So there are ethical, fundamental, first principle reasons why speech must be free, but also practical reasons like utilitarian reasons, like a society is better if a speech is free. This guy here is uh, John Stuart Mill. He's, he's quite ugly, actually. I, I've read a lot of him, but never, never really looked at the picture. It's well, impressive. But anyway, he's, he's, he's right on, I don't love the philosopher, but he's right on some things. One of the things is that society is better if people is free to speak up and to transmit information freely. Uh, of course, free speech doesn't mean that you are forced to give your platform, your private property to somebody else. If you run a journal, you, uh, other people is not entitled to your first page. So it doesn't mean that you owe somebody else uh, a stage, for example. So moderation in a forum is not censorship. But there are, uh, so uh, at the fundamental uh, deontological point uh, is that uh, at least you should not uh, aggress other people for speaking up. But there is an utilitarian point uh, for which society is better if everybody is not just allowed, but even facilitated in speaking out when they disagree. Why? Because so you can have more competition of ideas, you can find mistakes, you can basically debug society because there are more tests. Even if, something say, if somebody says something wrong, it's uh, nice to, that you can hear it because you can at least say why it's wrong and you can basically create immunity, uh, herd immunity, natural herd immunity for, uh, for bad ideas. So there, these are the reasons why speech must be free. Of course, uh, uh, there are some exceptions that are not actually speech. Uh, so for example, if you uh, are ordering an aggression, if I have like a voice commanded gun and I order the, the gun to kill Stefan, that's not speech, that's aggression. And the same if I have a military and I am like a head of state and I order my military to invite, invade the country, that's not speech. That's actually violence used through other human beings as a mean, as an instrument. So uh, that's not speech. That should not be free or protected. That should be fight, uh, fought, and should be basically uh, kept in check. The second uh, exception is uh, intentional fraud. If I tell you that I'm providing a service to you and then I don't, that's not just a different opinion, that's fraud. I'm basically robbing you. I'm breaking my contract with you. So that's also a problem which is not covered by free speech. But it's important to distinguish that uh, bad opinions are not aggressions. Like actual aggressions are aggressions that could be also ordered by voice, but bad opinions, no matter how bad, they are not aggression, they are not an exception, and the generic lies are not breaches of contract. So you can lie, uh, it's not nice, you shouldn't, but I shouldn't punch you if you do. And you should be allowed to have bad opinions, and I should debunk them with reason and not with violence. So we all agree on this, right? Uh, of course there is a problem, which is censorship. So during the, the course of history, every kind of tyrant tried to stop uh, a speech that they didn't agree with. This happened in the ancient times. So this guy, Philip IV of France, he didn't like free speech. He, uh, this guy, Napoleon, he didn't like free speech. But even more recently, this guy, Adolf, he didn't like free speech. This guy, Joseph, he didn't like free speech. Even more recently, like this guy, Mao, didn't like free speech. This guy, Fidel, didn't like free speech. And even now, there, there are still people alive now, like for example, this guy, Kim, doesn't, and this guy, Justin, doesn't. Um, <laughs> Sorry, okay. I know, I know why you're lighting. This, it's unfair on my side to use uh, Justin here. Uh, it's, it's a little bit too much. It's not fair because there is already another member of the Castro family. So it, it looks like an, like an overkill. Like, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, so uh, tyrants all, always fought speech. 
But there are new things that are happening now, now, right now that are a little bit unprecedented in history. Well, not completely, but, but they are kind of new and we have, to, we have to analyze them better to fight them. One is basically the fact that private companies are becoming very important in censoring speech as well. So maybe you don't have, the, you don't have cops coming to your home to arrest you because you protested against the government. Actually, you do, like in Australia. But uh, even if you don't, maybe you have a Facebook which was visited by the FBI before that is basically censoring you on the private platform. This is, this is kind of strange because what I said before is that you don't have the obligation to give a platform to somebody with your private property. So you can say it's their right to just decide arbitrary moderation rules. So it's, it's for us, for people that are free speech advocates, the fact that private people are deciding apparently privately to allow or not allow some speech can be messy to, uh, to judge. I see a lot of libertarians that are, that are basically uh, cheering for government controlling social networks, which is not a good thing, even if you want to do that in order to avoid censorship. So it's complicated. And the other very complicated thing is that uh, anonymous speech, I, I hope you can read it, but anonymous speech is the new boogeyman. So traditionally to, uh, throughout history, uh, tyrants were attacking speech against them. Now they're starting not just to attack wrong speech or wrong think, uh, like Orwell said, they're also attacking any kind of speech where they cannot attach a name to. So even if you're not saying anything controversial, they're trying to prevent you to buy an anonymous SIM, to say something, uh, even something good, even praising the government, but you should do that with your name attached on the SIM. They are trying to do the same. There are proposals to basically tie internet connection to your physical identity. Why? Because uh, no matter what you say, if I know who you are and where you live, if you do wrong talk, I can come to hurt you. If I don't know who you are, if you have anonymity, then I cannot hurt you. And it's not a chance that, uh, it's not by chance that many important political documents like a Federalist paper in the United States, they were uh, pseudonymous. M many uh, pieces of art and politics were pseudonymous because sometimes people just want to face uh, the, the crowd and just, just, they want to be brave and uh, martyrs. Sometimes people want to be tactic and they want to basically survive and keep spreading ideas and so they need uh, anonymity. So right now there is an attack not just on wrong opinion, on bad opinion, or what they consider bad opinions, but also on any kind of opinion where, it's not your name, uh, uh, where your name is not attached to them, which is bad and a problem. So, uh, what are the solutions to this? Well, the first solution is just outgunning the sensor. So, uh, if you have uh, enough guns, uh, you, will just, uh, uh, you will just fight the sensor and win. It can happen in history. It's not easy, but it can happen. Or you can just do jurisdictional arbitrage. So you move around, so for example, this flag is the American flag. Uh, it was the result of the first solution. So these guys were oppressed, so they just took guns and they fought and they won and they created the United States. Then they fucked up. But uh, on a few things, they didn't fuck up that much. For example, uh, free speech, if you look at many classification, uh, it's still pretty good in the United States. You can probably say whatever you want without serious consequences. So if you want free speech, you should move to the United States Unless, unless your speech concerns uh, uh, American soldiers killing people, then you should uh, probably not move to the United States. So it's not universal as a solution. <laughs> it depends. If you want to speak about anything else which is not the uh, United States military killing people, you move to the United States. Uh, the, the other solution is uh, Agorist tools. What is agorism? Agorism is a, is a current of libertarianism that say, let's, let's not just uh, claim that freedom is good. Let's build tools that can increase freedom and can basically empower us in the fight for freedom. Uh, agorism is very close to, uh, to cypherpunk ideals and to crypto anarchist ideals that are basically the, the cultural ground of Bitcoin. So you should recognize it. So if you use a Tor uh, network over the internet, you, you can be censored, but it's harder to censor you. They really have to spend money and time to really then remise you and find you and then to give you two life sentences for a website. But they need a lot of effort to do that. So these are the, the possible solution. Let's move from free speech to free money, not, not in that sense, in the other sense, not as in beer. Uh, so money must be free as well. It must be expensive to create, but free to move and trade and share and pay and transfer. Why? 
Uh, well, let's, let's uh, just analyze the, the reason. My claim is that transferring money is a fundamental right just like speech. It's just the same. It's not just the same in general. It's coming from the same sources because basically uh, property is kind of speech and I will try to address this point. I know it's a little bit, uh, it's a, bit a stretch. And uh, money is property, so money is speech. Why do you say the property is speech? Well, this guy is, uh, is John Locke. He's also ugly. I mean, what did they eat at that time? I mean, it's, uh, they really don't look healthy. But anyway, it was, co it was probably cooler than, 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 than Milton and the mill. And um, he, he basically said that there are two ways to acquire property justly. Uh, one is homestead. So you mix your labor with, uh, with a field. You, you work on unappropriated resources and you appropriate them. Your typical homestead principle. And the second one is contract. So you just give your resources away. You promise somebody else not to exercise your appropriation control in exchange for something maybe or as a donation. So these are the two ways you appropriate. The first way is not really speech, right? Because if you want to, to like uh, work on a, f on, on a crop field or, sorry, sorry, carnivores, if you want to work on cows, for example, you need to actually uh, do something physical. It's not speech. But uh, in order for other people to recognize your private property, you need uh, for them to be able to understand that's an appropriated resource. So many times you, you put fences, you put uh, like uh, signs, you, you have to prove that you mix it your labor with uh, an appropriated resource. So you have to give a proof of work. So basically, proof of work. And proof of work is speech. Even if your appropriation is a physical act, uh, your proof that you appropriated is you have to be, let's say, even in Bitcoin, you have to be able to publish a proof that you actually did some physical work. So speech is important. If you cannot speak, if you cannot write uh, private property, you cannot communicate that you own something. And of course, trivially, contracts are promises and promises are are basically a speech, like a signed transaction. You need basically to, uh, to be able to, to, to uh, give somebody else a, a, an attestate that will forever prove no repute, uh, in a no reputable way that you gave away that property. So just like a signed transaction, it's also speech. Uh, so it's, it's all about speech, basically. There is some physical part involved, but mostly property requires speech. There is also another point that I uh, don't have the time to make. Uh, uh, there is a third way that uh, John Locke thinks that uh, you can acquire just property, which is punishment, uh, uh, because, uh, it's, which is also speech, because uh, if I take your stuff, uh, in taking your stuff, I am basically implicitly claiming that I don't support the property rights, so you can take your stuff back, uh, or even more. And I wanted to make a comparison with Latin natural punishment, but it was too much, so I said, let's not. So, okay, uh, property is speech, kind of. Uh, money is property, just a, a kind of property which is uh, exchanges for, it's the most saleable property that you can basically exchange for everything else to solve the double coincidence of wants and the store of value problems, blah, blah, blah. So money is basically uh, speech. But money is even more speech than other uh, kind of property because money evolved to become, um, during history, more and more information and less and less physical object. The process started with commodity money, like uh, gold nuggets. Gold nuggets is not speech. Uh, the fact that I give you gold nuggets is speech, but the gold nuggets is just a, a physical object. But then they started to, to do coinage, printing the information about the weight, uh, official weight uh, on the coin, and now the, some people were not even accepting the coin for the content value of physical value, but for the nominal value of the information on it. So information started to become more important than the physical support. And this went on with custody, where you just give your uh, gold coin to a bank, and the bank will give you a piece of paper. The piece of paper is not gold, it's just information, just virtual money. It's information that will be redeemable for actual gold. But maybe not, because maybe there is fractional reserve, and so your, your information doesn't even match the, the physical reserves. So money became more and more virtual over time. And then you had fiat money where your piece of paper doesn't even redeem anything at all. So basically your piece of paper will just redeem another piece of paper temporarily because uh, the conversion is suspended in 1971 uh, and it still is. And then there is even worse, uh, digital fiat money. So in, in, a, in a, like physical fiat cash, 
This, does, this information on paper doesn't convert to anything physical, just other information. But at least uh, there is a physical support that you can trade around, uh, a bearer instrument, a physical token, a physical bearer instrument that you can exchange, so you have good privacy, you have some censorship resistance. With the digital fiat, you don't even have that. There is nothing physical anymore. Like in the, the current dollar monetary mass, there is nothing physical, basically. It's residual. Most of stuff is just information. So money is speech. Transferring money right now is just speaking with somebody, just speaking with the public about an intention, about a promise, and nothing more. Um, so you have a, a fundamental right, but you still have exceptions, of course. For example, paying for aggression is not speech. It's just like using speech to, yeah, to, to basically trigger a voice common gun, so it's not speech, that's aggression. And uh, intentional fraud with money, so double spending, so I give you money and then I take it back. That's not speech, that's basically fraud. Uh, but again, just like bad opinions are not aggression, uh, bad purchases are not aggressions, and just like not all lies are fraud, not all kinds of scams are fraud. So when we say scammer to people like she coiners, we don't mean that you should go to jail, you shouldn't, not all. And uh, so now you have uh, notable exceptions and you still have problems. The same problems of before, so these people are still not uh, allowing you to do the same, the, the purchases you want if you are wrong paying. Uh, they will try to stop you, to censor you. Again, apologize for the, to the Castro family, I didn't intend it. And, uh, and we still have this other problem of uh, private companies censoring money. So for example, when you have uh, American soldiers killing civilians and laughing and you have Julian Assange doing journalists and so basically publishing that news. Uh, now, uh, the, now you have the government imprisoning him and torturing him and uh, trying to kidnap him and to kill him. So now you have government censorship. But before, you didn't. You just have Visa and MasterCard uh, spontaneously or, 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 or with some push just uh, using their property rights to deny WikiLeaks uh, from receiving any kind of, of uh, financial support. So there is this kind of mixed problem as well. It's not easy to defend from censorship where censorship is mixed with uh, private moderation because you may not have the right uh, to compel Facebook to publish whatever you want. It's a, uh, just build your own Facebook will be the obvious response, which has some merit. So uh, you have this problem. And the second problem is money laundry laws. Money laundry laws started in the 70s, and they started to switch the mentality again of censorship. It's not just about uh, you cannot do this payment, but you cannot do any payment, even if harmless, in my opinion, if you don't attach your history and identity and reasons and traceability. So the idea basically is switching from uh, uh, presumption of, uh, of innocence to presumption of, of guilt. So it's not that if you pay this thing, you are a criminal, which is already very questionable. If you pay anything and I don't know why and when and from where and who, then you are a criminal as a base layer, as a, as a, as a first assumption. You have to prove your innocence by giving me any information about any unrelated question. So it's a, it's a huge switch in censorship because it's not about punishing some sort of payment, it's about punishing every payment where you don't give up your privacy completely. And they, of course, the money laundry laws, uh, they are recent, just like fiat money. People like, people like us uh, that are born after the 70s, we may think that uh, like fiat money was always there, but it was very uh, recent reckless experiment. And the same for money laundry, anti-money laundry in KYC bullshit is very recent. It's also a, a typical example of economical illiteracy because uh, take, for example, know your customer. Uh, know your customer laws mean that uh, you don't understand economics. The whole point for money is that you don't have to know your customer. The customer has to know the, the, the business because they have to trust the good and the service. So you go to, you go to a shop, you have to trust that the shop is not uh, defrauding you. But the shop, in order to scale, he has to accept cash because it doesn't have to know personally every customer. So the whole point of money is not to know your customer. Otherwise, just use credit, just use an exchange of favor. If you know your customer, you just exchange favor with him. So the point of money is not knowing your customer. Um, so we are at this point, uh, solutions. The first uh, solution is, of course, uh, outgunning the sensor. And now I took a more modern version of, uh, of the Canon. Uh, of course, uh, uh, next year, I will uh, come here to Riga and I will entitle my speech uh, uh, printing guns is beautiful in order to make everybody comfortable and uh, but, any, but 
Yeah, uh, uh, probably guns are not the, the best example because like the, the president of, of, the, of the United States just say that uh, uh, if, if you try to use guns against overreach government, they will use uh, F-15 uh, f uh, fighters to bomb you. So you need, uh, so the president, the president Biden said, you don't need guns, you need F-15. And I think that's acceptable. Uh, so let's print F-15, it's more complex, but we will get there. But until we are there, so printing F-15 is, is a little bit, it's a slow process. So we can try jurisdictional arbitrage. All these countries like Isle of Man, the Switzerland even, uh, or Dubai or whatever, they used to be places where you can go and your payment will not be censored, uh, or mostly not be censored. Uh, this is actually almost over. Like, uh, like 20 years ago, you went to this place and you can do whatever. Now, some of, this, uh, some of them are, are, are keeping up a little bit. Uh, like, like uh, Emirates uh, are still good. Uh, Switzerland is basically censored as the rest of Europe, almost, at least for non-citizens. And so it's, it's actually deteriorating because the problem with, uh, with the jurisdiction arbitrage is that there is, not, uh, there is a fixed amount of nation states and uh, you cannot create a new one, so they can just make a cartel and they just uh, eliminate any competition and they, just can, they can just make life worse for everybody. So we just remain with the last option, which is agorist tool building. So we should bu build tools to enable censorship resistant payment. Unfortunately, I didn't find an image for this. I don't know what to put there. So it's a uh, joking, of course. Um, so this is the, the speech and it can be basically, uh, it can be basically summarized. Incredible, I finished in time, right? This, I, am I in time? Is this, this, this is unprecedented. So, um, <laughs> Uh, this, uh, this sentence is, is very nice, it's very famous. Uh, I, this, this, this guy is Voltaire and he's a little bit less ugly, if you think so. Good, good job, Voltaire. Uh, I disapprove of what you say, but will defend to the death your right to say it. I know, I know, actually is not really an original quote by Voltaire. It is Evelyn Beatrice Hall, so it's uh, apocryphal, I know, but I don't care. Uh, the, the main point I want to make with this, uh, with this slide is that Money is speech, so, the, so we, we, we can keep this motto, we just have to slightly change it and update it uh, with two letters. I disapprove of what you pay, but will defend to the debt your right to pay it. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you Giacomo for an excellent talk. That was excellent, really enjoyed that. So just one quick announcement before we move on. We've got, just a reminder, we've got the SATS stage up on the second floor, so that's also running now, hosted by Luna, the host of Lunaticoin. So that's on also for anyone who's interested there. Now, our next speaker, he is a worldwide known Bitcoin educator and expert. He hosts uh, a podcast called Bitcoin Fixes This. He's also uh, the author of, the, of a newsletter. Uh, and also teaches people about Bitcoin. He's authored many books. His name is Jimmy Song. So welcome, Jimmy, to the stage, everybody. All right. Welcome to the bear market. Doesn't seem like one right here, right? Like uh, the entire place is full. You got a whole bunch of people standing in the back. Um, very excited to be here. Uh, so three years ago, I gave a talk here, how Bitcoin changes incentives. And I, I wanted to point out what, what the current uh, system incentivized and then you know, what, uh, what Bitcoin incentivizes and how they were better. Um, since that time, I, uh, and starting in 2020, I started to say this phrase, fiat delenda s, at the end of every show that I do, at the end of my newsletter and everywhere else, fiat delenda s. And I wanted to, explain this phrase a little bit more because if you know Latin, this phrase doesn't make any sense. So what does it mean? Well, the phrase comes from this phrase, Carthago delenda est. And Carthago delenda est means Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage must be destroyed. And, uh, and that is due to this man. Um, okay, there was... They're censoring me just like Giacomo. I don't know what's going on. Um, hopefully they can get, get it back on. Uh, but yeah, there's a nice picture of, um, there's supposed to be a nice picture. This, 
Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, please don't pull up Lisa's thing. Um, yeah, Acrobat Reader. This is why I gave you a Google Sheets URL. Somehow they uh, put it on a PDF. Anyway, there's a nice picture of uh, Cato the Elder, hopefully, which you will get to. There you go. Now press slideshow up on the upper right, and you should be good to go. <laughs> Slideshow, upper right, guys, upper right, all the way on the upper right. You see that button? Yeah, almost there, almost there, just a little more. All right, down. Okay, to the left a little bit, to the left. Oh, come on, man. Seriously, it's, there's, there's a slideshow button. Yeah, there, okay. Yeah, press the button, yes. Thank you. Did not expect that to be that difficult, but all right. Anyway, Carthago de Lenda Est, um, that is due to this man, Cato the Elder, and he was a Roman senator, and at the end of every speech that he would give in the Roman Senate, he would end with this phrase, Carthago de Lenda Est, which means Carthage must be destroyed. Now, why was he saying this? It was because Carthage was a rival to Rome. He was a Roman senator, and he realized that Carthage was their mortal enemy. And if you study some history, you know that they were involved in the Punic Wars uh, with each other, Carthage and, uh, and Rome. And, you know, Hannibal was a Carthaginian general who brought elephants down, down the Alps and attacked Rome from the north, which they totally didn't expect. Anyway, they were mortal enemies. And what Cato the Elder was saying was... Rome wouldn't be able to expand until they destroyed Carthage. And in fact, we don't know that much about Carthaginians for that reason, because Rome ended up destroying Carthage. And not only did they destroy it, they didn't just go and sack the city. They pulverized the city. They turned it to dust. And to make sure that the Carthaginians couldn't rise again, they salted the fields around the city so that nothing would grow. That's how much they hated Carthage. And that's why I say fiat on the S. Anyway, let's, uh, let's look at the word fiat. This is uh, Genesis 1-3 from the Latin Vulgate, or, or the Latin Bible. And uh, dixit que deus fiat lux et facta est lux. Or, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So that phrase, fiat lux, means let there be light. That's where the word fiat comes from. And in fact, fiat means let there be in... Latin, it's a verb, but we use it in English as an adjective. So what happened there? Well, what happened was that fiat money means let there be money. It's money created by decree, and that's why we say fiat money as an adjective instead of a verb. Um, so really, fiat means by decree or creating something by decree, uh, by saying so. And really, that's the big problem here. And that, that's why I say fiat de lenda est, because it is creation by decree. Now, I'm not God, so if I say, let there be steak, a steak doesn't magically appear in front of me, right? If I wanted a steak in front of me, I would have to either go buy that steak or raise a cow and butcher the cow and, you know, sear the cow, and, and then I would have a steak in front of me. It requires work. It requires action. It, it requires energy and time. Creation by decree is more or less impossible for human beings just to do without those things, like time, energy, and effort. So what fiat, the fiat mentality um, does is it gives you this illusion that things will just happen by decreeing something. It's this, it's man's, uh, uh, you know, deception that they can create something through just saying so. And the key question that we have to ask is, who or what makes it so? Because somebody has to do the work. In the end, somebody has to do the work. You can't just decree something to be so and it magically happen. Somebody or someone has to make that happen. They have to put in the time and effort. They have to do something. And ultimately, that usually means requiring force of some kind, force or violence of some kind. And I know Latvia used to be part of 
you know, the former Soviet, you know, satellite state or something like that. It required a lot of force in that era to, uh, to make people do things, right? This bill, uh, you know, the, the people up on high would decree that there be a building in some place. And then somebody else would have to go and build all that stuff and figure out how to get all the labor and so on. And unsurprisingly, that didn't go over very well, right? Uh, and th this is the major reason for revolutions, is when you force people to do things, when you decree that they must do something for you. Fiat money was sort of like a brilliant alternative, if you think about it. Because it gives you this sort of soft mandate through money printing. It makes you do something through the illusion that it's a market force by paying you to do it. Now, we all know that inflation is theft. It's, it's taking your purchasing power away. But by using fiat money, it makes it seem like you're obeying market forces. They're paying you to go do something when in fact, they're stealing from you and then paying you to do something. It's a very soft power, but it's also extremely effective. And this is how I like to divide how the two systems between the East and West after uh, after World War II were different. The people in the Soviet Union, they were very hard authoritarians. They made people do stuff. In the West, they were soft authoritarians and they used fiat money to do so and had this illusion that it was market forces at work when it really wasn't. So instead of demanding people do something, they really got, <laughs> kind of got tricked. You stole from everybody else to pay people to go do something. Really, you were just stealing the whole time. And you might say at this point that, uh, okay, well, what's, what's wrong with it? All, all these people, you know, like, are happy about uh, receiving the money and doing all this. And, you know, generally, it's been prosperous in the West for the last 50 years or so. What, what's so bad? Well, here's what's bad. First, it centralizes power significantly. The, because the theft is very subtle and obvious, the centralized power just keeps growing. And it gives this very gentle authoritarianism, but it's still authoritarianism. You're being made to do stuff that you don't want to do. And in fact, it gets the people in power to think that they, they should have more power because they're so benevolent in distributing the money. Really, it's a soft form of slavery. Like I said before, the people in the East, they, they had a hard form of slavery where they had to do something or else they would go to the gulag. In the West, it was a soft form of slavery where they would pay you using the money that they stole from you. It's a really neat trick if you think about it and kind of brilliant. Second, it's, it's bad because of anti-civilization incentives. Cheating and theft become very widespread in any sort of fiat money system. I had a friend a while back who, uh, who managed in high school to get access to the school's grading system. Now, it's usually a closed system, but somehow he got access to it. He was able to change his own grades. And of course, that meant that he didn't have to study, and he was able to be lazy, and he would still give himself A's afterwards. And of course, he couldn't shut up about it. He told his friends, and his friends were like, hey, I'll pay you some money if you can change my grades. So of course he did. And then, you know, some cute girls found out about it, and they would ask him really nicely, and he would go change their grades. Soon, the entire school knew about it, and of course, he got caught got expelled from the school and he had to transfer high schools and figure something out from there. But that's what cheating and theft become. It's, it debases the entire system. I think anybody trusted straight A's in that school after that? Fiat money, while it lasts, it acts as sort of like a cheat code to the entire system. And if you've ever played a video game with a cheat code, you know that 
deep inside, it's not that satisfying to beat it, right? I, I remember playing SimCity and giving myself like two billion dollars and I could build whatever I wanted. It's not a very satisfying end to the game. But that's what people prefer because it's a lot easier. What you're not realizing is that you're debasing the entire system by doing that. And as a result, bureaucracy grows like cancer and destroys civilization. And that leads to my third point. Politics becomes ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And the reason is because rent-seeking positions are by nature political. All of these bureaucratic um, you know, positions where you're not really doing anything, you're just like rubber stamping something, you're essentially taxing transactions for your own benefit. That, that's a very desirable job because you don't have to work that hard. Everybody wants those. So how do they get distributed? They get distributed through politics. And the way you get, you get certain poli political positions is by having the moral high ground. And how do you get the moral high ground? You claim to be a victim. And it's no surprise that there's like a victimhood Olympics going on, right? I'm a victim, no, I'm a victim. You should give me money, you should give me money. It happens because of fiat money. That's the society that we're under right now. And then it becomes like all about appearances. You can claim victimhood status only if you identify as like a seven foot tall black woman or something. I don't know, whatever it is. And it becomes all about appearances, not about truth. Because if you can get enough people to believe that you're a victim, that's good enough. You don't actually have to be a victim. And that means that politics penetrates absolutely everything. We're becoming more and more extreme politically these days, right? There's a reason for that. It's because of the money. It does that by nature. There's this giant prize out there for whoever wins. And of course they're going to fight very hard and dirty in order to get it. Fiat must be destroyed. Because fiat is all about enslavement through money printing. It's a soft form of enslavement, a brilliant form of enslavement, but it's still enslavement. Leads to the destruction of productivity. And it's based on lies. You can't run any sort of uh, economy with, on lies. It just doesn't work. But here's the solution. We have Bitcoin. And if you contrast that, we know that it's freedom money. You can do whatever you want with it. You're, no one's like forcing you to do anything and you're not getting tricked. And it incentivizes building and production. And finally, it's based on truth. It's not based on lies. So when I say fiat must be destroyed, I say that because it's true. This is our biggest impediment to civilization thriving. If we want to grow as a society, as a civilization, fiat must be destroyed. Fiat the lenda est. So what does that mean? How do we actually destroy fiat? Here are some suggestions. First, we must absolutely destroy the entitlement mentality. This is very prevalent today, largely because of fiat money. But every entitlement means that somebody has to do the providing on the other side, and they must be enslaved for your entitlement. You might think you're entitled to health care, but some doctor or nurse or pharmacist, they, they have to provide that care. And you have to enslave them to do it in some ways. Now, you might do it in a soft way through fiat money printing, which most of these countries that provide free health care do. But that's, that's not a good trade-off. Second, we must punish rent-seeking. This is what everybody wants to do. The best and the brightest over the last 50 years, they've all been going into investment banking. Why? Because it pays so well. We've got to punish and shame these people. 
I, I, it still bothers me that so many people have so much reverence for someone like Warren Buffett. Think about like a hundred years ago. Who are the most admired people? Nikola Tesla, Thomas Edison, people that created stuff, invented stuff. Instead, the people that we admire now, they're money managers. Seriously? I mean, he's calling Bitcoin rat poison, but he needs to be shamed for other things. Like the fact that he just moves money around. He's not providing anything. Third, make truth great again. It's the only way a market economy works is if people respect the truth. Everyone's sort of like going on lies. It, it, it doesn't work. You, you can't believe a convenient lie. You have to be committed to the truth. This is how we destroy fiat and prevent the theft that's been happening to all of us. Fiat Delenda Est. Fantastic talk, Jimmy. Thank you very much for that one. All right, so next up, we have uh, a speech from Lisa. So Lisa is, uh, she gave a talk yesterday at the Layer 2 Day. She works at Blockstream as part of the core Lightning team, uh, working in terms of the Lightning protocol and uh, the Lightning client, core Lightning. And she also has the side uh, venture of Base58, educating people about Bitcoin and Bitcoin uh, transactions and how Bitcoin works. So uh, we're going to hear from Lisa. So everyone, welcome Lisa, aka Nifty9. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Hey everyone, how are you guys doing? Okay, uh, all right, I got my speaker notes on my phone here, so I'm gonna see if I can juggle three things at once. All right, uh, how many people have heard about Bitcoin having layers? Just like quick hands here. Most everyone, okay, great. So hopefully this will be review for most of you. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is, uh, hang on, all right, let's see. Great, oh no, where are the, where are the slides? That's not very conducive to, oh, great. Okay, we're getting some warm up here, it seems like. Um, cool, okay, so we're talking about layers today. Uh, it seems like most people have heard of them. And we're waiting for slides to come back up? Question mark? I'll go back? Move forward? No? Okay. Present button. Present button. Uh, does that work? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. We can not play the video. Yeah, that's fine. Does this work? Oh my God, that works. Okay, great. Great. Okay. Cool. Okay, great. So this is a talk about layers, um, but what kind of layers are we talking about? Are we talking about layers in a cake? Are we talking about layers in rocks? Uh, no, those things all have layers, but so do blockchains. So today I'm going to give you kind of a uh, overview of how to think about layers in uh, on blockchain, specifically Bitcoin, um, and hopefully kind of lay out a framework of stuff that I've been thinking about. Um, but a little bit about me before I get started. My name's Lisa, also known as Nifty. Um, I go by Nifty and I on Twitter and the internet and GitHub and any internet platform that you can find. Um, I work at Blockstream on Core Lightning. Um, obligatory post about Blockstream does a lot of other stuff other than Lightning. It's really cool. Um, I also, as uh, Stefan mentioned, I do um, Bitcoin education at this project I started in February called Base58. Um, to date, we've trained, I've had about 50 people come through my online classes uh, learning about how Bitcoin transactions work at a very nuts and bolts uh, protocol layer thing. Um, we just launched the first three weeks of our class on Udemy. So if you want to check out, you know, kind of try the massive multiplayer online course thing. Wow, what's going on? Come on, guys. Uh, cool. Yeah, so you can check that out on Udemy. We've got a Base58 Bitcoin transactions class. It's pretty technical. I don't think there's, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's cool. But today I'm here to talk about layers, um, specifically Bitcoin layers. So let's go through the kind of this framework I've been laying out on how Bitcoin layers work. And, um, and then we'll kind of get into how those different, how that framework applies to three different projects in the Bitcoin space that are, um, 
three different projects in the Bitcoin space that are doing kind of layered things with Bitcoin. And hopefully this will help you all kind of understand how to think about layers and um, what, uh, what kinds of things to, great, okay. Okay, cool. So let's just start off with like layer one. So in order to understand a layer of Bitcoin, I think the first thing you need to understand is what layer one looks like, right? So let's talk really fast about how transactions work on layer one of Bitcoin. And then we'll take that understanding and we'll like move it into layer two. So on layer one, it's like, you know, Bitcoin is kind of, I like to call it, think of it as like a, a way of holding on to like state updates. So what does a state update mean? Uh, in Bitcoin, that means who has money. So let's say a guy named Bob starts out with some Bitcoin and then he wants to send it to someone else like Carol. Um, and Bob's gonna update the state of his money by sending that money over to Carol, right? Okay, so that's a state update. State updates in Bitcoin are something that I'm going to call global. So that means that as the state of who owns that money changes, everyone in the world needs to find out about it. So the world, you know, it's gonna rotate. Everyone needs to know that the world is changing, so to speak. Um, so it's kind of like if we put everyone into a stadium and you know, Bob decided he was going to pay Carol back for some beers. Let's say there's 10,000 people in that stadium. When Bob gives his money, his Bitcoin, to Carol, everyone in that stadium needs to find out um, about that change, right? So this is global. This is a global state update. It means that when money changes hands, everyone has to find out about it, right? Um, this leads to, so this like, this, pro this, like, everyone needs to find out about it means that you can only send out so many updates to everyone at a, at a time, which means you kind of start getting into questions about how many state updates can we have at one time, which leads to big, long conversations like the block size war. And then you start getting some information like this, which is how many people do we need to tell? Uh, how many updates can we make in a block? How often are new blocks made? And so you sit down, you start doing some math, and you find out that like Bitcoin doesn't scale, right? You get some memes, which are like, how is Bitcoin going to scale if we have to, like, we can only do so many transactions because everyone has to find out about it, right? Okay, great. So this is where layers come in. So we, everyone has this like fairly basic understanding that the number of global updates that can happen on a layer one is limited, right? This creates a scaling problem. So from there, it's like, okay, if we have, we have global updates, we understand how those work. What if instead of making global updates where we have to tell everyone in the stadium about what's going on, we just tell a small part of the world? And this is where I say that layer two comes in. So um, I've kind of come up with like three uh, principles that layers use about how they kind of make it such that instead of having global state, all of a sudden you can have not global state. So what does that mean? Okay, so the first thing when you're making a new layer of Bitcoin, which means you're taking the ability like global state, and you're changing it from needing to tell everyone to only having to tell a small group of people. The very first thing, first goal of layers is don't tell everyone. Great, okay. So how do you do this in a blockchain? How do you go from having to tell everyone about state to only having to tell a few people? Um, the way in all the protocols that I'm gonna talk through today, the way that we do that is with something called multi-sig. So you get a group of people together in a pool and that pool is governed by a multi-sig contract. Great, and this is something we can do on Bitcoin today. It's really great. Okay, first goal of layers is don't tell everyone. Okay, what's the second goal of layers? Second goal of layers is now that you've got a bunch of people into a little pool of Bitcoin with a multi-sig, how do you tell who owns what? So it used to be you would use the Bitcoin blockchain to say who owns what and who's sending people to whatever. But the problem with that is that you had to tell everyone in the world any time that the state in that situation changed. So by moving the money into a pool, all of a sudden you need a new way of accounting for who owns what. And this can be more private. You don't have to tell everyone in the world about changes to the ownership of Bitcoin in that pool. But now in order to like keep track of it, you need a new way of keeping account of it. And this is where all the different layer twos that you hear about have different methods of accounting that they've invented or come up with or protocols. Um, so this is kind of like a method of accounting. So we get a little abacus to represent this one. Great. Okay, third and last goal of a layer. Now that you've got a multi-sig and you've got a method of accounting, method of accounting, which is typically not global, right? Because that's how we're making it faster. That's how we're scaling. Um, 
Now you have to know how do you get out. So you've got a multi-sig, how do you get your Bitcoin out of this little local state thing where you've, lo you, you've locked it and back into the global pool where everyone gets to see your transactions, right? So where's the exit? Great. Okay. Now that we've got three general principles about how layer twos work and how the accounting systems for them are developed, et cetera, let's walk through three different existing protocols that are layer twos for scaling Bitcoin and kind of walk through how these three different principles apply to them. So we'll start with one that I know best, which is Lightning. Oh, oh, wait, here's a good summary. All right, don't tell everyone who owns what, how do you get out? Great, let's start with Lightning. Okay, so how, uh, what was the first one again? Don't tell everyone. How do we not tell everyone in Lightning? Uh, super simple, we make a multi-sig contract, which is gonna be a th common theme here for this particular topic for all of these protocols. Um, in Lightning, today, the type of contract or multi-sig that you use is a two of two. So there's only two parties. That means that there's only two parties that ever need to know about state updates to that particular little like multi-sig pool, right? Okay, great. That makes sense. So how do we keep track of who owns what in that two of two for Lightning? And Lightning, we use something that I call pre-signed Bitcoin transactions. So this is a little, uh, my little rendering of Bitcoin transaction. Um, cool, okay, but yes. So we use Bitcoin transactions themselves as a method of account in Lightning. The important thing about these transactions is that they're not published. They're not on chain. They're like proposals for what could be published to chain. Um, and every time that the balance updates, we update that transaction. It's an unspent Bitcoin transaction. So we have these little outputs. There's one that's yours. There's one that's mine. Anytime that the balance in that multi-sig pool updates, we update this transaction with who gets what, right? So you can just keep updating this very cheaply. It's very fast to do. Great. Okay, they're immediately spendable Bitcoin transactions, which is an important part of the third and final part of a um, third and final part of our framework, which is how do you get out? The answer for how do you get out is, well, you have an immediately spendable Bitcoin transaction that has your current balance in it, right? So you just spend that Bitcoin transaction. So that is how you get out of a layer two in Lightning. You spend the immediately spendable Bitcoin transaction, which also is your unit of account um, or like you're basically your accounting mechanism for this layer two. It's pretty cool. Okay, cool. So that's like a very fast tour of how lightning contracts work. Uh, let's move on to a, another fairly well-known layer two liquid project by Blockstream. Um, okay, so how does this do the layer one thing of don't tell everyone? Um, liquid is a multi-sig. It is a 11 of 15 multi-sig. So there's 11 Federation members located around the world. Each of them has a key. They've got this big pool of Bitcoin. Anyone can lock Bitcoin into Liquid. Um, in order to get it out, you have to do the 11 of 15. Great, so we make this big pool of Bitcoin that's an 11 of 15 multi-sig um, with a bunch of decentralized key holders. Okay, cool. So that's the layer two, right? You can, anyone can lock Bitcoin into here. All right, once it's locked in, how do you know who owns Bitcoin in that big pool of Liquid holders? Um, the cool answer for Liquid in particular is we, we came up with a second blockchain. So there's now another blockchain called the, Bit the Liquid blockchain, right, that keeps track. This is now a way of keeping track or accounting for who owns what Bitcoin in that big pool of multi-seg stuff. Um, and the fact that we came up with a new blockchain was pretty cool because it allowed us to add a lot of um, new and interesting kind of primitives to a new blockchain that the base layer of Bitcoin didn't have. One of these is confidential transactions, which are pretty cool. Um, we added a whole bunch of new opcodes, which lets us do um, new and cool smart contracting stuff. I think there was a cool presentation by some of the BitMatrix and Bullpen Ventures team yesterday. Um, Cool, so new opcodes which let you try new contracts and stuff. Um, blocks come faster, you can issue other assets, et cetera. But this is all because we have a totally different blockchain, right? It's a different method of accounting for who owns what Bitcoin. Great, um, operates like a signet. And uh, one of the problems about a blockchain though is you end up back at the global state. So at some point in theory, Liquid will run into the same problem in terms of like how many updates can you do at a time, right? So there's some trade-offs here. Okay, cool. So now we know how who owns what in Liquid. We have a whole separate blockchain which keeps track of it. And then how do you get out of Liquid? Um, the answer is you have to go ask 11 of the 15 Federation members to sign you your Bitcoin out of it. Great, okay. Uh, third and final protocol here. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Hopefully we're okay. Uh, Fediment, so this is one of the newest layer two projects I think that got announced. Um, 
this is a project to this is basically a project to kind of do a similar thing to Liquid does. So basically, you will. So how do you not tell everyone? Um, you also have to have a multi-seg. The number of people in the multi-seg, uh, I believe that these haven't launched yet, so it's kind of an open question. I was talking to one of the um, engineers who's working on this project. Um, he told me that it's an n minus f of n multi-sig, where f is the number of peers that you sp you can be evil, so to speak, or the evil. You know, you've got like bad actors and good actors in these protocols. So f is the number of bad peers. Um, and so n is equal to three times the number of bad peers plus one. Anyways, what this ends up being when you do the math is you could have a multi-sig of three of four, a five of seven multi-sig, a seven of 10 multi-sig, et cetera. Um, again, these like haven't shipped yet. So this is like kind of the blueprint for how you would do a multi-sig for a fediment. There's this many people. Um, but the general idea is like, yes, you're taking Bitcoin and you're locking it to a multi-sig. Great. So once you've got your Bitcoin locked into this multi-sig, now you've got a new accounting method to keep track of who owns that Bitcoin in that pool. The way that they've solved this problem for Fetty Mints is something called a chow mein mint. So um, who owns what in a Fetty Mint is, uh, <laughs> so I've created this guy named Chaum. Um, and so when you lock Bitcoin into a Fetty Mint contract, now you need a new way of accounting for that Bitcoin. So what you do is when you put your Bitcoin in, Chom is going to issue it. You put your Bitcoin into it. Chom, this guy named Chom, is going to issue you a ticket. So you're going to get a Chom or token. They call them like e-mint tokens, Chom and tokens. Um, so basically, it'll give you a, a token, which gives you the right to get money out of the Fediment at some point in the future. Um, so now you've got like this little ticket object. Um, and that becomes your unit of account. So now, instead of having like a output on a blockchain, you have a little ticket that you can go and get money out at some point, and this becomes the accounting system for the entire layer two, these tokens, which is cool. So how do you get out? Well, you take your token, and you go back to Chom, and you say, hey, Chom, I've got a ticket. I would like to get out, please. Um, and they're like, except, except, except it's not Chom. It's the Fediment. It's like the federation of that particular token holder. So you go and you say, hey, Fediment. Federation of three or four or seven of or five of seven or whatever. I would like to get out. I have a token, and they're like, "Great, uh, here's your Bitcoin back." So that's how you get in and out of the system. Great. Um, so I wanted to like kind of quickly go through like how does okay. So you have a token. What's that worth? Um, so in our original thing, so if we had Bob and Carol originally, and Bob had some money and he wanted to pay it to Carol, um, now Bob has a ticket, an E, like a Chalmin mint token thing. Uh, he's got a token. He wants to give it to his friend Carol. He's going to give it to the Mint, who's going to create a new token that he gives to Carol. So that's how. And then Carol can take his token and go to the Mint and get normal Bitcoin back out later at some point. So it's a whole different unit of count. And the cool thing is you can now use these tokens to do a lot of little transactions with a bunch of anonymous people um, without actually having to make updates to the global state that is Bitcoin because you've locked them into a multi-sig contract and created a whole new method of accounting that you're using using Xiaomi and Mints, which is cool. OK, so there's a few trade-offs with this. Uh, they're kind of hard to audit. Maybe that's a good thing. One of the nice things about them being hard to, hard to audit is it's hard to know who has funds. So the anonymity on these is quite good, which is cool. OK, those are the, oh no, OK, that's fine. Uh, no permission. How do I get to the next slide? OK, cool. I'm just going to skip that. Uh, cool, so that is my very quick update and framework of how I think about layer twos and how I like to compare and contrast them with um, really quickly, we'll go back through it. Uh, how do you not tell everyone you make a multi-seg? How many people are in your multi-seg? That becomes like kind of one of the big questions. Once you've locked your money into the multi-seg, how do you keep track of who owns what? That becomes your like method of accounting. And then finally, now that you've got this multi-seg, how do you people exit that multi-seg? How do they get back onto layer one? And that becomes kind of the third thing. It's kind of nice to look at when you're looking at different layer two proposals. Great. OK, so I am Nifty Nye, and this has been a presentation about Bitcoin and layers. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, the uh, clicker. Uh, Lisa, the clicker. You've got that clicker. No worries. OK, so uh, thank you very much, Lisa. We've. Um, We've got our next one up. It's going to be a panel. Uh, we'll just check if everybody's available. Is uh, Adam, Paul, Obi, you guys around? Just checking. All right, so uh, anyway, I'll introduce our moderator for 
Oh, uh, sorry. Just give us a just give us a, give us a minute while we get set up for the next one. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you all for waiting. So we've got our next panel, and I will just introduce our moderator, and he can introduce everybody else. So uh, Aaron is a long-time Bitcoin journalist. His, uh, it's interesting. If you look on his uh, Twitter handle, it's actually OG at Bitcoin Magazine. So you know, take that, from what, take that for what you will. He's well known for breaking things down in a very accessible way. And uh, uh, please, uh, everyone, welcome Aaron, and he'll introduce everyone else on the panel. Hello, hello. All right, there we go. All right. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is the panel on sidechains and L2. Lisa just gave a great introduction on what that actually means, so I don't think we need to go over that. Uh, I will let you guys introduce yourselves, actually, as opposed to what Stefan was uh, promising you. Uh, <laughs> let's start from the right, or your left, Lisa. Hi, everyone. I'm Nifty Nye. I work at Blockstream on Core Lightning. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Obi Nwosu. I am one of the co-founders of Fedi which is powered by Fediment. Hi, my name... Hello. Okay, there we go. My name is Paul Stortz, and I'm behind uh, BIPs 300 and 301, which are about sidechains. Um, I'm Adam Beck, and uh, co-founder of Blockstream, which does a few layer two things, um, some early Fedi stuff, uh, some Lightning stuff that Lisa talked about, and also Liquid, which is a different uh, sidechain variant to what Paul mentioned, which is a drive chain. All right, so the, the, the topic of the panel, as mentioned, is L2 and Lightning, which are two very big topics in their own right. And we have a lot of, uh, we have four very knowledgeable panelists as well. And we only have like 25 minutes. So the way I figure we're gonna do this is we're gonna sort of zoom in on one uh, angle specifically, which I think is an interesting angle because I know there are some different views on this topic. So that's scaling. So because, uh, you know, other angles we could take is privacy or smart contracts, but scaling I think is one that, that there's some divergent views on. So on that note, I'd like to start with Paul because I think Paul ha has a <laughs> the, the most alternative view of anyone on this panel maybe about scaling. Uh, because you don't believe that Lightning is actually a scaling solution, is that, am I misrepresenting your view? Well, that's a little bit of an extreme way of putting it. I mean, I think there's no, Lightning doesn't really help with onboarding, so that uh, to, to onboard to the Lightning network, you need a layer one transaction, 
and that that once you're onboarded, it helps tremendously. But it, the you know you have to onboard someone before they can do anything else, so it's kind of like the first hurdle to jump, and that is why this is the main difference between the sidechain scaling strategy and the lightning scaling strategy. So that's why maybe I mentioned it to you, and maybe the view sticks out especially. But I think this part of the issue with the sidechain scaling topic is that uh, right now people think of lightning as a kind of like a scaling messiah that it will fix everything and if you just don't think about it too much. And if you really talk to the, the, the big lightning experts, uh, they are the ones who try to pour some cold water on that. Um, and so the question is, what do you do instead? And this well, is so ca can you break down why that is? So wh what is the onboarding issue for people that don't know this? Well, every, uh, the Lightning Network is made up of channels, and every channel is a multi-sig output on layer one, so you must broadcast something into the blockchain that has that output at some point, and so that will take at least like 30 or 40 bytes, 43 bytes if it's taproot, I think. So per uh, per output, and so that number is uh, greater than zero, so it means every time you want to onboard a new person, you need more layer one bytes. And those are the layer one bytes. The whole point of this is to get stuff off of layer one, uh, because layer one has the fixed block size. Yeah, essentially for e each person that wants to get on Lightning, you need a transaction, and the number of transactions that Bitcoin can handle means that would take decades to onboard the whole world, right? Yeah, in practice, it would take a lot more than 43 bytes per onboard because you need usually about one input per output, you know, usually. Uh, Lisa, is this something that Lightning developers indeed agree with? Are there solutions for this? Uh, I mean, I think, I think that's correct in that, like, so we were talking earlier about, like, multi-sigs, and the Lightning one is a two of two, right? Which means that every time you want to have a Lightning relationship, so to speak, with another peer, you have to create an on-chain transaction. So I think that's pretty accurate. Um, I think that there's probably some ways that we could change the protocol in the future that maybe makes that a little less restrictive in terms of how many on-chain transactions you need to establish new channels. Um, but that's all like kind of future research stuff. So I think in, in today, in terms of the protocol, I think that's fairly accurate, yeah. So then, uh, Oh, do you want to weigh in on that, Adam? Well, I was going to say that um, there, isn't, there doesn't seem to be a silver bullet so far, though we haven't yet talked about Fiddy, which is another trade-off. So everything has trade-offs, and um, I think you can sort of benefit from extra layers. So you can have um, Lightning on top of Liquid, which is itself a layer two, so kind of a layer three, and that would kind of produce this channel onboarding challenge that each and every channel, this is Paul's point, right, that each and every channel that is in the Lightning Network corresponds to a transaction on a Bitcoin network. And if you're unlucky, you might need to close it and reopen it or splice it. So you want it, you want the channels to be reused a lot and you want it to be re rebalanced and that's improving over time. But it's still, you know, like if you, if you want billions of people on there, it takes a while to get a billion transactions through the Bitcoin network, like years, right? So. The other way to do it is say, well, let's use Lightning channels on top of Liquid and the core Lightning implementation that Lisa works on at Blockstream and you know some open source contributors as well. You can it's had support for Lightning on top of Liquid for a number of years now, and a lot of people don't realize that Lightning can work on top of other UTXO things, right? It could even be shared across multiple UTXO chains. So the point there is that Liquid itself is a form of scaling because it it's has UTXO space that's not on the main chain. People can buy UTXOs on Liquid without there being a corresponding UTXO on the main chain. Um, and so there's an opportunity to scale there. And I think it's reasonable that you can get a certain amount of scaling within limits on Liquid or drive chains because the point for, for a, a blockchain is that people need to be able to verify it. And that's why the Bitcoin blockchain is kind of optimized for verifiability and compactness. But with a sort of opt-in layer two, you can push the envelope. Let's say, you know, it uses 10 times as much space or 20 or something where it's still reasonable for a power user to catch up and keep up. If you go too far, it loses the point. If you can't verify it, it's not really a blockchain. Now, the Fedi protocol is not a blockchain, and so that has different trade-offs, but has possibly improved scalability as well. So, so we should talk about that too. Yeah, I think um, at scale, if you think at a global scale, 
with billions of users, you're correct. There is a limit to the Lightning Network. However, um, sorry, my voice went uh, yesterday. All right. So I'll stay very relaxed so it doesn't go worse. So, um, but if you um, consider a Lightning node as a person, you're right. But if you consider it as a group of people, then you can scale. So each a Lightning node needs an on-chain transaction. However, a Lightning node could represent tens, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of people. And that's what we are doing with Fedi and the Fedi Link protocol. Each federation can have one or more Lightning providers providing access to them. Now, again, at global scale, right now, most people acquire their Bitcoin by buying it. A few people acquire their Bitcoin by being gifted it by someone else. And very few acquire it by earning. But at global scale, the vast majority of people will earn it. And a few people will get it gifted to them by friends and family. And then a very few people will buy it. And at that scale, most people will be acquiring their Bitcoin over the Lightning Network. Only Lightning Gateway providers will be the people who are making on-chain transactions. So in this world, and I think this applies to both Fediment and sidechains, it, would it essentially mean that most people would just never touch the main chain? Is that the vision, so to say? Paul, yes, yeah. I think so, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the sidechain conception, and I'm not really trying to say like uh, anything is doomed or anything is uh, clearly much better than something else. That's not really what I'm saying. I do the, the, the sole spectrum idea, the trade-offs idea is, is the key idea that people are very different and each transaction is very different. Like you may have some transactions that need to be private or need to be very censorship resistant. And then you, you know, th and then two hours later you may make the coffee transaction that may not really it, but one could be on the, the uh, large block side chain or whatever and the other could be on something else, Lightning Network or the main chain. But uh, I think the, the, the spectrum idea and the trade-off idea are key, but the, uh, the vision with the, the, the sidechain onboarding is that someone, one guy can just send lots of coins over from layer one to layer two in one transaction over there. And then since they have 10,000 coins over there, you can onboard people directly to layer two. And that is a lot like when you open a, I don't know the European equivalent, but we have like Wells Fargo, we have like commercial banks in the United States. And those banks are all part of the Fed, and then the Feds, they all have, you know, Bank of International Settlements or something. When you onboard or you open a checking account, you don't get, a, you don't get a, an account with the Fed or an account at the Bank of International Settlements. You only get the account at uh, Wells Fargo or whatever it is, Bank of America. Um, I remember, Adam, this is a question for you. I remember that a couple of years ago, during the scaling d d debate specifically, uh, developers were claiming or th they didn't think that sidechains could be a scaling solution at all because in the end it's still a blockchain and it has all the limitations. Is, has that view changed or is that still something you, you think is accurate? That's a, that, that seems like something you would di yeah, disagree on then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think Paul and I are on the same viewpoint on this, which is that it does scale a bit, but um, you, know, you, you don't want an enormous blockchain where only data center located nodes that are very expensive, you know, thousands of uh, CPU cores, gigabits of bandwidth can keep up because that's a high availability database, it's not a blockchain. It, it's a blockchain when power users and individuals can verify it. Now, then you're talking about what is the, in, the sort of investment or the maintenance cost to stay on the network, to verify everything and to catch up. And for Bitcoin, that's very low. What we're, what we're saying in the sense that a side chain or drive chain could be a partial scaling solution is that you know we could probably tolerate being 10 or 20 times higher and still fit within the bandwidth envelope and a desktop CPU of modern equipment and liquid has that characteristic in fact because it's blocks of the same size as Bitcoin maybe a bit bigger if, if fully utilized and they're 10 times as often so it's a bit bigger it, and it, it generates a lot of signatures because of the confidential transactions a lot of crypto loads so it's more CPU heavy so, you know, and it could be pushed a bit further, but I think if you push it too far, it stops, if nobody can verify it, it stops becoming a blockchain. And you see this with some altcoins that basically, you know, the number of nodes is shrinking, and in some cases it dropped to zero and they lost some history, and clearly it's just not a blockchain. Or if it's only running in data centers, it's also not really a blockchain, because, you know, 
you can have accountants auditing books from databases that live in central servers, and that's that's going back to you know pre-Bitcoin. So I think it just needs to be verifiable to a reasonable number of people, and you can you know have some of the decentralization, though less than Bitcoin, right? It, all these trade-offs are always a little bit less than Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I guess the question would be why use a big block sidechain at all instead of, for example, Fediment, which is more centralized, but a big block sidechain would be central oh, as well. Oh, I mean, uh, so not to speak for Obi, but I think the point with the um, the federated Tromian Mint is it it's, a, it's making different trade-offs. So all of all of these, you know, the main chain is the most secure, doesn't have so much privacy, and isn't so scalable, then a uh, sidechain can be a bit more scalable if it has confidential transactions, which Liquid does, then it has a bit more privacy, but it still has some scalability limits, but you can audit it, so it's a blockchain, whereas the Fedi Mint, the Mint, it's not auditable, but it's extremely private, like it's more, it's more private than confidential transactions, and those things are sort of side effects, right? You, you get the privacy, but the side effect is you can't audit it, nobody found a sort of efficient, scalable way to audit that kind of crypto, but you know, on the plus side, it's scalable, so and you, you can't audit it. So you have to choose whether that. So you basically have to use the right tech for the right trade-offs for what you want. Do, do you both agree on I, these? Are these the trade-offs? I will echo that. Um, privacy is also very important for us. We think privacy is paramount, at least within your um, community. You don't want your neighbour um, or your brother or sister to know your exact wealth. It can lead to negative externalities. So um, by Leveraging the Charmian eCash protocol, we have the potential for some of the best level of privacy you can imagine. And it also has the trade, has the benefit of being able to provide what we call layer free, effectively layer free scaling. Um, there are always trust trade offs with any model, including sidechains and uh, Fedimint. It just depends on who you are looking to trust. And it's just important with all of these systems to be very open and honest that there is always a trust trade-off. Do you want to weigh in, Paul, or do you just agree? Well, I think I definitely agree with basically everything that Dr. Beck said. Um, the, you, the, it's, the unfortunate thing is if you defend the large block sidechain, you, you kind of, it makes it look as though you're defending the large blocker philosophy, which is really not at all the case, but it, it, it's just unfortunate that it resembles that to such a great degree that you kind of look like a guy saying that there should be, and even I've done math about, like napkin math, about like what does a one gigabyte node cost, but that's obviously, that's like too far, going too far. But it's, it's worth just doing the napkin math to point out that, you know, you really only need like, you could have something like 10, 11, 12 side chains that had, maybe if you push the envelope to, um, like 100 megabytes or something, which since it's now 4 megabytes, is only like 25 times larger, you could really hit the entire planet's transaction usage and you could onboard all those people tomorrow. So that's just, that's just like an idea of like one extreme if you took it, if you pushed it to the exact uh, extreme. And I just think that's something people should keep in mind because all of these other things have uh, their own trade-offs and flaws. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't know about with, with Fediment, like the user's gonna open up the software and then they're gonna start to choose like which group should you join and there'll be this big list of groups. I think most people would just be like, what? And then close the software right no, after that I happens. I think that's, uh, that comes from a, a sort of centralized thinking mindset. Uh, um, you have to understand that uh, people will join groups based on their existing social second party relationships. So friends, family, church or um, work. So the way you will find them is you would talk to your friend and say, hey, um, where do I buy Bitcoin? And that friend would, instead of saying, go to this exchange that I really don't want you to go to, um, and I know it's bad, and I'm also not gonna tell you, sort of figure out first party custody because I realize you're not ready for it. Just download this app and connect to this scan this QR code, which is my federation that I'm already a member of, and it's made up of our friends. That's how we find it. So there's not this centralized database in the, in the cloud. It's hundreds of thousands of relationships. I mean, it might work. People have Discord servers, so it might, you know, it might work, but I don't know. You I'm can just, just talk to a friend. Like, you don't need a Discord server. You're, 
Well, I'm just saying father, I, that's an example of something father. where people make lots of different little rooms and groups, but I don't know if it's the same for your well, life Let's saving. zoom into Lightning a little bit more. So we've um, discussed the onboarding bottleneck. Are there other scaling issues? Uh, I guess this is a question for Lisa. Is, the onboarding, is that the main one? And what are other scaling bottlenecks? Yeah, I think the onboarding one is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, I think the other like scaling problem, so to speak, with Lightning is the um, current, given the current protocol, some of the on, like, if you're running a light, if you want to be on Lightning and you want to be doing it in a way that's like self-sovereign, right, which means you're not depending on a service to run the Lightning node for you, now you have to be keeping a server online all the time, right? So I think there's definitely kind of a scaling issue in terms of like technical capacity or capabilities in running a Lightning node. Um, so I, that's something at Blockstream we're working on Greenlight, which hopefully will help with that because um, that helps build it. Basically, we're building a protocol or project that will let you kind of still main sover sovereignty. I'm going to get that. You're going to still be able to hold your private keys. Um, and you can offload a lot of the infrastructure requirements or like the burden of running infrastructure to Blockstream who will help keep your node up and do watchtowers and make keep the data, et cetera. So I think there is a real, um, yeah, I think that, you know, kind of looking past this, like every new relationship on Lightning requires an on-chain transaction currently. Um, there's currently, I think, a lot of just kind of overhead in terms of keeping, you know, that, that node online, because it is to some extent like a hot wallet, like it has to be always available. Yeah, a, qu a quick note for the organizers, I don't have a clock here or anything, so I assume someone will wave at me at some point if we're out of time. Or we'll just keep you going forever. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> but uh, one thing um, I wanted to yeah, so what, what are, oh. go on. Yeah, I think like, so one thing that I don't think we really talk too much about, um, so those who aren't super familiar, the, one of the cool things that the Fediment proposal, my understanding is, the idea is you kind of create a community bank. So, you know, kind of I was talking earlier, you get like these eCash tokens that are, those eCash tokens are only good at your local bank. So kind of like, I think Paul was mentioning Wells Fargo earlier. So you would have some Bitcoin, you deposit into your local Fediment with all your besties, maybe it's your church group, and you get some church group tokens. But if you wanted to, the cool thing is Lightning then creates kind of this like, tissue, I don't know, what do you call it, like uh, connective tissue for the wider ecosystem. So there's kind of this cool opportunity to sort of link these different layer two technologies together. So you could have like a local balance at your, your local, you know, Fedi cash bank, um, but you'd still have access to the rest of the Bitcoin payment network um, because you could use those tokens to pay a lightning invoice, so to speak. So I think that like, you know, if you look at each of these things individually, they each have their drawbacks and things that they're good at and things that they're not so good at. But I think there's like kind of this like new sort of like dawn coming in Bitcoin layer twos, which is, you know, we have these things like liquid and fediment, which are federations and different ways of doing accounting. And then what if we can kind of connect them all together with these cool lightning channels? And so I think we're going to see in, in Bitcoin and layer two space, you know, not like one scaling solution, which fits all the problems, but I think we're going to start seeing more kind of interconnectivity between how do we link all these little multi-seg projects together in cool ways such that we can all transact with Bitcoin and the unit of account across the entire ecosystem will be in Bitcoin and you'll be transacting in Bitcoin, but the method and the, the accounting systems that we're using and the technology will kind of be hopefully like a hybrid of a bunch of kind of different protocols that have different trade-offs and stuff. Basically what, what uh, Lisa said. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I mean, yeah, it's um, when we first looked at um, Fediment, uh, when I first saw it, I thought it was an, in, an incredible um, form of new form of custody where you had third party, what I call stranger custody. You store it with a stranger who may go off and gamble your money or lend it to people who will gamble your money, like regulated exchanges. Or you've got first party do it yourself custody, which is the best form of custody you can have. But for many people, it's currently out of technical reach from them or economic reach. And this is this form of collaborative community custody 
the only closest example was uh, Galoi. But the more I, we looked at it, um, in fact, I remember uh, we were, I was at Oslo Freedom Forum and I, um, I met up with Rene Picard and he was telling me some of the scaling challenges he, he saw in, in Lightning. Um, but we realized in that conversation that there was the potential for um, federations and this, this world where there are hundreds of thousands of um, federations out there, Fedimint federations where the onboarding problem is solved at scale with most people, um, users, receiving their, their first Bitcoin through earning it, which is going to be the norm at global scale. Most people will earn, they won't buy, um, as, as is any other world reserve currency. And in that scenario, the people who need to settle, because a transaction for you, whether it's internal to a federation or to another federation or to someone with their own a, a sovereign um, lightning node and, and wallet appears to be the same. It's, it just looks like a lightning transaction. Um, the federation and the lightning gateway providers handle all the details. But what happens is the lightning gateway providers, the people who are providing access from the federation to the rest of the lightning network, are the ones accruing large amounts of these e cash tokens in different federations, and they're the ones who have to settle on chain to rebalance. So it's only the large, experienced Lightning Gateway operators who are the ones who are incurring that onboarding cost, not the user. And that makes sense at global scale. Yeah, we have about five minutes left, I think, and I have, um, I, this will be a question for all of you, but I'll start with Lisa. Um, what protocol change would you really like to have on Bitcoin to, in, in your case, presumably help Lightning? Yeah, 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 I do have a favorite. I'm really excited about this new protocol called L2. Um, it's not new, it's been around since I've been in Lightning as of like four years ago, but in order to get this, we need a base layer, layer one change for something called APO, any previous output, it's a SIG hash change. Um, so I think that it would be really awesome, not only for Lightning, but for other protocols, like we saw Revolt guys yesterday, I think it helps them, I think it helps some state chain projects, so, um, my, my layer one, like, you know, like, would love to see is the uh, Sikash any previous out APO stuff. Right. Obi, you can make one change to Bitcoin. Um, what would it be? No changes. Um, right now, it does what we need it to do. Yeah, it's a good answer because, um, but anyway, since I'm the author of Bit300, uh, I have to say that. So it's a, it's a pinup question, but I think... Um, is this something you can explain in a minute, you think, <laughs> what, what it is? <laughs> it's a, uh, well, uh, I don't know if I can explain it in a minute, but basically it's, uh, you, it lets you send, it lets you add, remove side chains and send coins to and from them, but the, the side chains are all ignorable. So that is the, the scaling comes from the fact that there would be like 10 side chains or whatever that would have maybe a larger block size, but you would, you would tend to only use one you would use like the Europe one or US East or something. And uh, so you could ignore the other nine. That is the sort of the strategy. Uh, so that's it in a, in a nutshell. Adam, one change to Bitcoin? Um, simplicity, which is uh, next generation smart contracting, up smart contracting upgrade for Bitcoin. Which would, would that be a protocol change? Uh, it would be a soft fork. Oh, okay. I didn't and, know that. Um, the point is it could be the last soft fork because Bitcoin becomes self-extensible with that. And so, you know, the, the two things that Paul and Lisa were talking about could be directly implemented in Simplicity. I think even confidential transactions could be implemented in Simplicity. You can implement a lot in Simplicity. And then the sort of efficiency drive becomes a kind of upgrade to make the mode more efficient to handle commonly used uh, extensions, basically. Um, but it's done in a way which is, you know, uh, fits in with UTXOs, is a similar model, like, the, you know, it, it, it builds on the current model, and uh, it's sort of formally secure, so it has formal security semantics, so you can get good confidence in the security of the system uh, through that. So uh, people want ossification, so I think simplicity is the best path to ossification, and there's an old Satoshi quote somewhere on Bitcoin Talk that says he added... Um, the contracting system to Bitcoin at all so that he could freeze it so it would never need to change after it was launched. So it turns out he was wrong. Like we, you know, people who've been involved in Bitcoin have added quite a few opcodes since then. Um, 
but simplicity finally makes that realistic, I think. And so, you know, hopefully we'll get that into liquid relatively soon. And, you know, it takes many years for things to make their way from liquid or other proposals into Bitcoin. Like Schnorr was in uh, liquid, I don't know, probably five or six years ago and finally last year in Bitcoin. So something like simplicity coming to Bitcoin would be pretty exciting to me. Um, just interesting. Um, I didn't mention, but with um, Fediment, we have a module based capability where you can add modules of functionality. In fact, all of the base functionalities are modules in the system already. Multi-sig Bitcoin, Charmin eCash. Um, and um, one of our co-founders, Justin Moon, um, made a uh, FediSimp, adding simplicity functionality to, to uh, Fediment. And that took, a, I think, an afternoon at a hackathon. Do we have time for a follow-up question? I think so, right? I'm not being waved at yet. All right, so we have Simplicity, BIP300, and any prev out, right? As if, why don't we have it yet? Well, let, let's go the other way around. Why don't we have uh, So, yet? So we don't have Simplicity yet because it's uh, still in development and it's security first. Um, and I think generally Bitcoin is, you know, cautious and careful about making changes at the, at the base layer. It's much easier and faster to innovate on layer two. So that's why, you know, uh, Fediment and Lightning can, you know, make changes more permissionlessly without needing core changes, and Liquid can innovate a little faster. You know, we've gone through a few iterations there, and we should get simplicity there first. Paul, why don't we have BIP 300 yet? Well, one reason is that the protocol is ossifying. If you can, you can just look at how many soft forks there were, like per year in the past. Uh, a long time ago, there was like two a year on average, but now there was only. Segwit, which took a very long time, and, and Taproot, which took like twice as long. So already it's slowing down. I think with, with VIP 300 in particular, it really is just the, the misconceptions around the idea. The idea is very old. I published it in November 2015. Uh, in the post, I wrote about how it would be misunderstood, and I was right. And uh, people just do not grasp like the idea that you can just have a, something with a larger block size uh, for free that doesn't in increase the any of the layer one node costs or node requirements or that you can just it's like maybe it seems too good to be true or something but I think people don't understand merge mining people don't understand uh, side chains so I think it is the you can't have consent for something unless it's informed consent and so people n need to really understand what the idea is before they can agree to uh, merge it into Bitcoin core so that is the real bottleneck, I think. Uh, do you agree with this, by the way, Adam? Is, is this the main reason, or yeah, do you because see other? Don't, can't you see a different version of this, where I published this thing in November 2015, and then everyone was like, oh, that would just fix the block size war, and then everyone kind of coordinates. Or do you think that's like a complete delusion on my part or something? No, I mean, I think it's, um, I mean, I think that Bitcoin has, you know, the, the opcodes that get added as soft forks, tend to be simple and self-contained and win-win. So I think Bitcoin is slower and has more difficulty bringing things in with trade-offs. Um, well, that's you know, true, but you know that SegWit, that doesn't really apply for, SegWit was very different, you know, it was very, it changed the entire structure of the block. It was a mandatory block size increase. So that's, so SegWit is kind of like the, uh, the hair in the soup of that uh, oh, that's premise. True. I agree with that. Yeah. Premise, but I, uh, and then Taproot is also not really an opcode, right? That's not just like uh, check lock time verify or something. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing is that there has to be kind of building on what you said. There has to be some kind of, you know, excitement and demand from the wider community. So people get excited about something like Lightning, and then they want the features that Lightning needs. And it's also you know the open source contributor phenomena where. People will work on about what they're excited about or what other people seem to be excited about. So maybe there needs to be some kind of, you know, community demand for it. I think uh, drive chains and side chains that are more peer-to-peer -peer are pretty cool. But yeah, for whatever reason, yeah, it's you know that's that's not something that's progressed as fast and arguably could have been, you know, more important or useful than let's say Taproot, right? We, we, we got to work the, towards the end of this panel. So I, I just. There. Okay, Obi, you didn't want any changes to Bitcoin, right? But so is, so you should be happy. Here, but, <laughs> I, but there is a point here. There's, there's a trade-off between the need for um, ever 
greater scrutiny on changes to what is going to be the next world reserve currency um, at the base layer. And that's going to continue, and it's needed. But at the same time, there, we have to recognize that there's a, a desire for experimentation and so on. And a lot of the challenges are how do you sort of square that conflict? Um, the approach, one approach, is with something like Fediment and Federations, is that effectively you have this sort of sharded um, opt-in layer free. Each federation is able to add any modules they want. You don't have to have everyone implement a module. And so you have ultimate levels of experimentation. You as a group of friends could set up a module adding a drive chain as a federation and see if there's demand. If there's demand, other federations will take it. And over time, if it becomes a large percentage of people who have chosen to elect to add that, that allows you to, for the community to communicate the fact they find that, that, that valuable. And then it could be, get more credence as a layer one implementation. Right. OK, last question for Lisa. Why, why don't we have any prev out yet? Um, what are we waiting for? Uh, I think you know changes to the Bitcoin core require consensus. Um, and I think there are a few things that happen with APO. Uh, my understanding is like, so APO, I don't know if it was proposed. Well, L2 was proposed by their three co-authors on the paper. I don't know what the relationship between that and L2 is, so to speak. But one of the main kind of proponents behind the APO push is Christian Decker, who works at Blockstream. And my understanding is he didn't want to, it would have been, we would have APO if APO had been bundled with Taproot, right? So that was one potential way that we could get APO. Christian Decker, who is kind of like the main force behind a lot of the spec proposal for APO, decided that he didn't want to have contention in terms of coming to consensus about Taproot around the APO project. So I think it's like there's a little bit of like political like scheduling, so to speak, um, around how we were going to build consensus around this particular update. So we built consensus around Taproot that just went in last November, right, got activated. And so APO is like one of the things that I really hope gets into layer one, you know, Bitcoin core at some point. But that requires consensus, which requires people at the protocol layer, like championing it, kind of like I'm doing right now, um, and people learning about like what it adds, why it's cool. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, we don't have it yet because we haven't reached consensus that it's a thing that we all want and need. Part of the way we reach consensus is by talking about it. Um, yeah, so I think it'll come eventually. All right. Well, that's our time. Uh, please give a hand of applause to our panelists. And thanks for being here. Thank you, everyone, for that panel. Aaron, Adam, Paul, Obi, Lisa, fantastic panel. Now we've got a coffee break until 12.20. So I'll see you guys back in here at 12.20. Thank you.
You can announce that we're starting. Yeah. 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 Okay, we're starting up just very soon. Just uh, for anyone else who's outside, come in. Just pull in your friends if they uh, don't want to miss out on uh, this panel with, with all of our VCs. All right, everyone's got a microphone. All right, cool. So let's get it going. So today we've got our panel, uh, and I'm going to be moderating this one myself. I'll give everyone a chance to, you know, just everyone just take 30 seconds and introduce yourself so, um, so our uh, audience know who you guys are. Hey, I'm Muzz with uh, Lightning Ventures. We have a small fund that we raise, friends and family, and we have a syndicate where anyone can invest in Bitcoin companies. And uh, we've funded maybe about 20 so far. I'm Andy from Ego Death Capital. Um, we are investing in companies in the Bitcoin space, seed and pre-seed. Uh, really, really excited about what we're seeing in the industry and excited to be on the panel today. Christopher Calicott, uh, co-founder and managing director at Tramble Venture Partners, focused on backers building the Bitcoin protocol stack, typically early stage. Um, been around for a little while, backing companies like Unchained Capital, Kraken in the early days, and et cetera. So excited to be here. Thanks for having us. Hey, Grant Gillum uh, from 1031. Uh, similar strategy to everyone here investing in Bitcoin companies. Uh, we've invested in about 30 companies uh, to date, and I think there's about 10 of them here today. Fantastic. So let's get into some discussion. I think uh, one key thing that sets apart a lot of Bitcoin mindset is really thinking about the long term, and obviously, we, you know, those of us into Austrian economics, we love this term, low time preference, right? And so I think that contrasts a little bit where people think of typical VC where they're often looking for a, a quick exit or maybe, maybe that's not technically true. Maybe it is meant to be a long term, longer term investment also, but perhaps that's the way people are viewing it. So I don't know if you guys have any comments on that and how uh, Bitcoin VCs have to sort of balance that long-term uh, thesis with potentially, as an example, you might have investors uh, who maybe they're looking for a shorter-term return or a short-term flip. Uh, Mars, do you want to start with any comments? I'm, I'm going to pass it over to these guys here. Okay, sure. Sure. I, I think <clears throat> I think about this in a couple of ways. First, in the crypto ecosystem, these very absurdly high IRR, kind of internal rate of return, kind of Drivers have obviously driven a lot of institutional investment in that end of the landscape. Um, I think of Bitcoin companies much uh, more akin to long-term um, company creation. Venture is actually notoriously, and for some, depending on your perspective, one of the longest lived assets that there are from seed, pre-seed, series A. It can be a decade and a half. I think it was maybe 13 or 14 years, for example, with Twitter before Twitter got public. So this is actually a very long live data set. It takes a long time to build that kind of value. Um, what, one of the things that we did to solve for this problem that's largely, you know, crypto, I, I keep using air, air bunny ears, um, is we just try to focus on alignment of interest, which I'm really big on all the way down. So we actually only took capital from LPs that are already off zero. They really get Bitcoin's value proposition specifically because similar to founders that have uh, conversations, um, you know, I'll keep the names of the, the firms uh, uh, private, but it said, Yo, you know, Bitcoin's cool, but I've got this big bag of Solana. Why don't you build on Solana? Like, we don't want founders to have to be subject to that kind of conversation anymore. Similarly, we want to not have, like, the same old educational conversations with our investors. So we just solved for that question by not taking capital for people that don't get Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with a lot of that. Um, venture capital really is a, a long-term play. We, we don't even like to refer to ourselves as, as venture capital because I think there's a lot of stigma uh, that comes... Um, with that term, um, but I think it's the prolifer proliferation of crypto funds, which has really sort of highlighted this more short-term mindset, which has not previously been associated um, uh, with venture capital. But you know, we've had a similar experience to to Christopher here in that we only really have Bitcoiners who've invested in us and who want to support uh, this ecosystem, and that's. 
that's sort of by design, but also because, frankly, having the conversations with people who are interested, you know, more broadly defined in crypto, I've, I just wasn't able to convince them about why Bitcoin only is an interesting strategy. So it's sort of a, a little bit of coming into, coming into that strategy because um, you believe in it already. You know, everyone up here is just investing in Bitcoin companies. So when, you're, when that's the bar, every email we get constantly, all day, Web3, Web3, crypto, token, and it's just delete, 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 delete. You can get rid of so much so fast, you know, when you, when you set it on the Bitcoin standard. And, and, and it's kind of elastic because in the late 90s, you know, companies were going public at record rates, man. Everything was going public. And then it came to a screeching halt. You had thousands of IPOs, followed by the next year, there was like maybe less than 20, you know? And, and we just saw that now. We had a very robust IPO market. You know, companies were going public faster and then everything comes to a screeching halt. So, you know, that changes with the market. I personally have never really asked a founder about an exit strategy. It's not something that I'm thinking about. And everybody who's investing, everyone who's a Bitcoiner and investing in Bitcoin funds or with Bitcoin VCs, they have that low time preference, it's built in. You know, uh, so I, I mean, I'm not always thinking about what's the exit or when can I get out of this thing. I mean, those things just come in time. But if you're going to invest in a venture fund, it's, it's basically a 10 year horizon, you know, and you got to have that same view. Yeah, and I think the short term nature of investing in the crypto space more broadly has just created such a toxic culture around founders. And also the whole point of venture is to really protect a company at that early stage. They're going to be going through lots of different challenges, ups and downs. And if you have a publicly listed token, it means the market is seeing that they're focusing on what their, what their price is, it's going up and down, and they're really subject to so much attention because of that. And so really being able to kind of be in this traditional venture space and protecting our founders um, and giving them the space to grow, to figure things out, to have challenges, go through the ups and downs, um, just means that they can just get their heads down and focus on building instead of worrying about what a share price is. And then also it means they're not focused on kind of getting this short-term liquidity, which just creates so many negative incentives. Um, so kind of going almost back to a more traditional venture model makes a lot of sense here. Bringing it back, I like that. Um, I also think it'll be interesting for people just to hear any of your thoughts around dealing with bull and bear cycles, right? So in Bitcoin, if you, you know, people have been, you, plenty of you guys have been around for a while, you've, you've, you've weathered these bull and bear cycles. What is that like for you when you are running a Bitcoin fund and let's say, you know, are you getting pressure from investors because, oh, hey, we're down? Uh, what, how do you deal with Bitcoin's bull and bear cycles? I think similarly to everyone on this panel, all of our investors are really believers in Bitcoin and understand the market. They're not giving us pressure. Um, and we think that now is a great time to build. It's really in the bear market that you can build. It means there's less capital, there's less competition potentially. There's none of this kind of frothiness of people wasting money on competition. Um, it's a time where you can kind of come to ideas, have solutions, and really be building for that next uptick. Uh, you can find good talent uh, as kind of, at the moment we're seeing layoffs in the broader tech. So there's more opportunity to actually bring people into Bitcoin who are really, really talented. So we think now is, and kind of in this down cycle, is a really, really great time to build. Yeah, I'd say, you know, now is a great time to build for a lot of reasons including the fact that like this this panel kind of represents that even just a couple of years ago founders that were bitcoin focused in a bear market they were if they got funding they were facing a cash out date um you know one of the primary issues that any founder um, assesses when they're going to build a company is the career risk the opportunity cost of what they could be doing somewhere else <clears throat> so so bitcoin focused venture capital has had its zero to one moment we exist for times like this uh, to smooth, you know, despite cyclicality of the markets to support founders longitudinally. I, I remember the last bear cycle, you know, brilliant founders like Joe Kelly, Drew Bansall at Unchained Capital, you know, they had these kind of uh, considerations and talking with generalist VCs that don't get Bitcoin, they don't understand uh, the Internet's monetary layer and why, why that's so important for humanity. So that's kind of passed. So I would say like now is not, not only like for sure the right time to build, but that career risk assessment has fundamentally changed for everyone thinking about building. Now, uh, Mars, I know you had an interesting comment on some of this as well, dealing with, let's say, the timing of a raise for different companies. Now, obviously, people who are raising in, let's say, the, the, the 
the heat of the bull last year were able to raise it very that high. That was them. They were lucky enough to raise their <laughs> funds uh, when, it, when everything was great. Yeah, so uh, how do you uh, deal with that over the longer term if, you know, uh, let's say a company or it, let's say a company you're working with, they, they go through a round at a very high valuation and now there's, maybe there's a challenge uh, in terms of growing over the next year to sort of meet that valuation. So, like, it, the bear markets are ultimately healthy, right? Um, it, it's kind of a good thing because what we saw a while ago was everything was, was out of whack, you know, and you saw very inflated valuations and everything was oversubscribed and it was so fast and they know all about this as well. And if you slept on something, you circle back with the founder a week or two later uh, and, <laughs> oh, sorry, we're closed. You know, it's oversubscribed, or, you know, at valuations that you may not have liked in the first place. And what these bear markets do is they kind of wipe the smiles off all those uh, founders' faces who just think it's so easy to go out there and, you know, you've got hundreds of dollars in revenue in your company you know, we're going to raise it a $25 million cap uh, with uh, hundreds of dollars of revenue. And, and then it, what it does is it, it sets in reality um, and, and it really kind of levels everything. And it'll go back to the way that it was before. But the, the main thing is, is the LPs in these funds uh, or the syndicate backers or people who angel invest and participate, they're really on that low time preference. And a lot of these companies are decoupled from the Bitcoin price. You know, a lot of the companies, even the companies are here, even with a depressed Bitcoin price days, the NASDAQ sheds 5% or so, um, they're, they're, still, uh, they're still having record months, you know, and all of these companies that raised last year at those inflated valuations, they got fresh capital. So they're quiet right now. Nobody really knows what's going on. But next year, if they failed to grow into those valuations that they raised at previously, when everything was rosy, that's when the real uh, title will come in. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, dealing with bull and bear markets for a company and with, with founders, um, it, it really can come into play despite some of these companies having their best months ever through the bear depending on, you know, what is their treasury management strategy. And, you know, we, we all like to think of this, this idea of companies operating on a Bitcoin standard, earning revenues in Bitcoin, holding all their reserves in Bitcoin. But if you're doing that, and then all of a sudden you've raised money, you know, in the last 12 months, and then your treasury gets cut in half or gets cut by 70%, then your whole plans can be completely disrupted. So I think that's a really important thing for founders to be thinking about is, how do they strategically manage their treasury um, so that they can withstand you know, tough time periods and then get to a next fundraise successfully in the future? I would just add, I think one of, one of the, the nice things overall, I think maybe the, one of the points um, Mike was making about, it is, it is a little bit of a forcing function on getting very serious about a tight operating model, the business model that the company functions on. If you are operating fairly well, um, you're trimming burn rates during a relative bear market, and you're building into your business model some amount of operational leverage, that really makes you shine during a very robust, healthy uh, bull market. And so um, right now, that's a forcing. If you have maybe staff that's just a little bit superfluous or uh, redundant, a lot of companies are thinking about those kinds of things. But really, for me, it's all about focusing on the business model and growth now. If you're doing okay now, you'll do great in a bull market. Real quick, one thing that Chris just said, which is so important if you're a founder and you're out there, um, my favorite founders that, that I'm working with or that I catch in with right now during this bear period, you trim up everything. You know, cut the burn, exactly what he says. Maybe open up a small strategic tranche to get a couple hundred K to kind of pad the balance sheet. Maybe you go on a hiring freeze. Whatever you're doing, you're, you're, you know, winter is coming or whatever, you're batting, batting down the hatches during this time. And I think the best founders are doing that right now. Okay, and so one other question I, hear, I see some people talk about in the space is they mention that maybe in certain maybe in certain verticals or for certain business types or maybe in hardware as an example, they say, okay, maybe it doesn't work as well, VC doesn't work as well for hardware as an example. I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts on that, on whether there are certain business types that make sense for VC. Is it, is it meant to be SaaS businesses only or what kind of businesses can, can work with a VC model? I don't think there's any kind of 
necessarily really strict exclusions, but generally we're looking for businesses that can really scale. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One of them is, um, you know, it's, it's about what impact we can have on the world. Um, so some of, obviously all of us in this room are really focused on bringing Bitcoin to the world and that kind of means that we want to invest in the companies that have the opportunity to actually really grow and scale and, and have the most impact. Um, so something like hardware can be a little bit more challenging because it's a very challenging business model. As you know, there's so many variables that come in, whether it's supply chain dynamics. Um, and so it's just a matter of like, are we set up as a business to actually assess those risks and understand those companies? So I'm not a supply chain expert. We could bring in someone, whereas for something that's more like SaaS, it's more down the fairway. It's easier to understand. Um, or consumer, you know, there's so many exciting different business models we're coming out with. So it's really a question of what have, what expertise have we built within our team to understand? And if it sits outside that, it's harder for us to assess, um, but it doesn't necessarily preclude it. Yeah, uh, the, the old saying, hardware is hard. Um, yeah, I think we've actually done you know, uh, uh, SaaS companies outside, in venture capital outside of the Bitcoin space, applied AI companies with a lot of security privacy deals over the years. Um, I think one of the most, I don't think there's a, like, a bespoke or a relevant business model per se in, in Bitcoin land because if we're talking about money, we're literally talking about everything. Um, so it's, uh, while some, some uh, LPs might say, well, that's, 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 that's cute, it's, it's niche. I'm like, it's actually the most broad uh, investment strategy on earth, which is challenging in its own right. Bit of an aside, I would say for me, one of the things I'm most personally interested in, intellectually um, super exciting that we definitely do not know some of the most powerful asymmetrical business models yet in terms uh, of adoption. There'll, we'll see things that emerge. There's kind of two buckets of venture type uh, investment returns. People talk about technological innovation, technology. I'm a, I'm a career technologist, obviously exciting for me on a certain level, but most of the bigger returns have come from a foundational shift in the actual business model of the company. And we just know that we don't know everything yet, which is really interesting because if we're seeing uh, conferences like this, there is a whole lot happening on Bitcoin right now. I would say that we, of course, are looking to invest in, in some of the more traditional technology plays where you think there really are exponential returns. Um, but I also think that um, non-traditional venture style investing can work like hardware. You know, the way that we think about what do we want to invest in, it's we want to invest in companies that are building products or providing services that ultimately holders of Bitcoin will want. And I think that that can apply to hardware. I think that it can apply to capital intensive businesses. And ultimately, if, if you have a company that's providing products or services that Bitcoiners will want, what does that mean? You're, that means over time, likely, you're going to be paid in Bitcoin. And I think this is a really interesting long-term play where if you own or you run a business that is getting paid in Bitcoin, ultimately that can become this sats flow generating business. And I'm really interested in the idea of investing in companies that can more quickly become profitable. Maybe it's not you know, scaling to a billion users and generating your traditional um, venture style investment returns that way, but it's actually generating cash, generating sats, and actually paying dividends to the investors. I think that's really interesting. I think that's likely a way that hardware investing can work in this space, and that's something that we've done. You know, hardware, it is, it is hard. Uh, but a lot of these companies, it's not just a pure hardware play. There's, there's like a SaaS component to it. You know, without dropping too many names, you know, at Surface, uh, Start9 uh, appears to be a hardware company, right? They're really not, you know, or something like Foundation Devices appears to be a hardware company. You know, there's, there's a whole other, um, you know, SaaS business in a lot of these things that are kind of built in. So I, I, don't, I can't think of a true hardware play in, in Bitcoin. Um, there's always a little bit of a, of a SaaS component. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, one other area I think would be interesting, just for if we have any founders in the room, maybe if you, if you are up on the stage have any, uh, let's say, uh, tips or ways to, uh, if, if a founder is looking to raise money, do you have any tips for them on how to make their business or their idea 
applicable or you know, appealing for yourselves. Um, and maybe if you want to touch on like what kinds of ideas, like are you interested in privacy, security, uh, you know, mining, like lightning payments, like what kinds of things are you interested in uh, that you would like to see? My number one advice for founders is to really get good at pitching. Um, and the reason is because we see a lot of pitches and it not only means that you're getting our attention, it actually means you're thinking through your business. So by putting together a pitch deck, and there's a lot of resources out there, we'll have a bunch on our website, um, it's making you think about, okay, what's the market? What's my business model going to be? What's my competition? What's my product differentiation? What's my business strategy? What's my team? All of those things that you'll see on, on the various places that tell you to what to incorporate in your pitch deck is not just, okay, great for VCs, but it actually makes you think about the business, makes you really kind of work through it. And then as you're presenting to us, it means it makes our life so much easier because if, if you're not covering that, then we're having to dig in and there's this kind of cognitive kind of method we all have as humans that we don't like to think. It's this kind of cognitive laziness if you've read Daniel Kahneman's um, Thinking Fast and Slow. And so if you're making us do work, it means it's just harder. If you make it really easy for us, then we get excited easier. And that's like we try and overcome those biases, but that's just a natural bias. Um, and then we really like to see that you've kind of thought through the team. You've really thought, okay, who do I need to build this business and brought together an amazing team? Um, I think team is really, really key. Anybody? All right. So first, um, if you have to explain Bitcoin and you're raising money for your Bitcoin company, just that's it. Just hang up. All right. Unless you want practice pitching. Uh, if you have to answer questions or sell anyone that might invest in your company on Bitcoin, they're just not a fit. So I would just cut them immediately. Um, and then I would make sure that everything is together as far as your incorporation, be a Delaware C, have a Google shared drive, have everything in there, your certificate of incorporation, cap table, use Clerky to manage it. You know, have as much together um, and then keep the pitch very short. Uh, you know, you go through a 26 minute call, you know, haven't said anything. I still have no idea what the company's doing, not because of a technical, I don't have the technical wherewithal, it's just they are not really concise with explaining uh, what they do. And there's so many other things you can do. You can do what's called a roll up vehicle. You might be able to get some money from some friends and family. Um, and just write a personalized email when it's ready, right? I mean, have built something, right? Sometimes we get, I mean, I don't know, I'm speaking for them, but I'm sure. You get approached by a company where a founder looking to raise, there's no website. You know, there, there's nothing built yet. It, it's nothing more than idea, and they want to raise $4 million. So don't put yourself in that situation. You know, have something built. Set milestones. Milestones is the way to go. Say, I'm going to have 500 users, and then I'm going to start talking to some of these people, you know? And then we're going to do an extension round. I, I would add, <clears throat> there's a little bit of murkiness between companies that are built on Bitcoin and also very clear, strong needs for things like developer tooling, uh, libraries, and, and this kind of stuff. For our approach, my, maybe it's slightly different. I spent over the years uh, time you know, coaching in accelerators like Techstars, et cetera. I really find it very intellectually stimulating. It's, uh, I'm just kind of notoriously curious, and it's very beneficial, I think, to think through problems with founders I actually prefer it as early in the process as I can um, to, to develop a little bit of a thought partnership relationship with founders. Um, sometimes that might not necessarily lead to a company, and I think that's okay. Uh, you know, I'm a part of the community just like everyone else, and I want to see Bitcoin succeed. I think that's part of it. And there's a more practical reason from the investment side. Um, I actually prefer it when we've known someone for a little while. We understand their development process, the developmental arc. Um, you know, I think Mark Suster had written years ago, investors invest in lines, not dots. It's not, hey, uh, here's, here's my fully baked plan. Um, nice to meet you. We would like, you know, $2 million, please. Uh, I had to understand the, the development over time. Uh, and so we're, we're very open to that. So don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out, even if it might be not necessarily uh, a company in the making. I think it's, it's very interesting for us to know what's going on a little bit broader as well. So uh, please do reach out. I would just say I, I really like partnering with founders who are trying to scratch their own itch. You know, they're not, they're not out there looking for a problem to solve. They're out there looking to solve the own, their own problem that they're experiencing. I think what that results in is real passion for what you're trying to do. 
and then it, it ultimately has all these ripple effects where you understand the story that you're trying to pitch and you understand why it's important and you're willing to you know work even through you know the tough times that we were talking about earlier can, can I just add one quick thing? So if you're a founder, the most important thing, what I would be doing also after, is leverage your investors. Send updates. Send updates off, often. If you can send an update once a month, it doesn't have to be much. You know, a couple of metrics. Hey, we hired this person. Or what's good, what's bad, what we need. And a lot of times founders, they write updates, and it's here's what's good, here's what's not so good, nothing else. Right? So you respond to that, and it's like, well, how can we help you? Like, what can we do? Like, you have to ask for help. Even when things aren't going well, reach out to your, that's the best time. Like, it's, it's okay if things aren't going well, but if you don't ask for help and if, if, you're, if you're not communicating with your investors or leveraging them, uh, it, it's, it makes it harder for you. And that's what I would do as, if I was a founder. Whoever invested, they're getting updates, they're getting asks, and I wanna make sure that they're doing something to actually participate and help my business. Fantastic, guys. Well, I think that's all we've got time for for this panel. So everyone, uh, put your hands together for our uh, Bitcoin VCs. Thank you, Grant, Christopher, Andy, and Mike. Okay, so uh, we've got our next one, uh, which is actually an announcement, I believe. So uh, we've got uh, Blockstream and Jan3 around. Uh, yep, okay, fantastic. Hello, hello everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here with the Honey Badger family to present the project that we have been working for the last eight months. We anticipate the bear market. By the way, I'm Simona. For those that don't know me, I'm a big corner. I have funded Savel Lab, which is a software lab specialize in Bitcoin, liquid, and we believe in empowering pioneers, self-sovereign individuals, but also those that want to be unplugged and don't have access to the technology or they know how to do it because nobody should be left behind and we build Lifeboat. Today I'm with Ivar. Ivar. Hello everyone. Thank you, Simona. It's great to be here. Thank you so much, MK, the whole, whole, whole team. This is the first time I'm here in Riga, in the beautiful country of Latvia. Um, I'm enjoying it a lot, so thank you so much. Big up for, for the MK and all the team. Thank you so much. And thank you, Simona. So uh, my name is Ivar. I'm a Bitcoiner. And uh, I'm the um, business development director for Blockstream. I think Probably a lot of you know Blockstream, but for those of you who don't, uh, Blockstream builds Bitcoin infrastructure. That's what we do. And everything we do, we do to ensure that Bitcoin becomes the foundation and the backbone of the future financial system. Uh, so today, uh, we are here to make an announcement about something that Seven Labs, Blockstream, and Poseidon Group has been working on. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very, very excited. So. And it's, it's something that is, uh, I think is very important. It's, it's in the vein of what I just said, to make sure that uh, Bitcoin becomes the foundational layer where everything else in the financial system connects. So today, uh, we announce... Yuri, are you ready for the video? Today, we want to announce a new, open, decentralized financial platform that is built on Bitcoin and built on Liquid. It offers security tokens and every other liquid asset as well. So Yuri, please play the video. AMP, issue and manager, and manage, sorry, uh, securities. So, we have built the first step towards Internet of Capital Markets. It's in Switzerland. And why we built it? Because a fantastic text 
doesn't make any sense uh, if there isn't a need. We believe that uh, if we were in a Bitcoin standard, we still need to raise capital, uh, to raise equity, to issue bonds because company needs to fund projects. Grants are not enough. And, uh, but we are not there. We need sound asset after sound money because uh, we are in a fiat standard and already the big guys are tokenized capital markets because everything can be tokenized. Uh, governments are issuing government bonds behind the scene. Oh, I mean, it's not something that is relevant to us, but it's coming. So what do we want? I mean, everything can be tokenized. Money, Bitcoin, okay, government got it wrong with central bank digital currency. And uh, they are doing it. And we will end up with a 1984 digital version of the actual capital market. But it's not the way. Shouldn't we, Bitcoiners, build a system that is based on our value, peer-to-peer, -peer, decentralized, where Alice and Bob are empowered. Issuers and investors own and possess and trade freely. This is why XDEX. And we want everyone to build on top of it. Yeah, thank you, Simo. So, so again, to summarize, so it's an open peer-to-peer exchange, it's a new system, it's built on Bitcoin, it's built on Liquid, Liquid is a, it's a side chain developed by engineers at Blockstream, and it opens up a whole new era. So we want to bring traditional finance onto our playground. We don't want to have a 1984 type system that is centralized, controlled. We want to have a financial system that is open, peer-to-peer, -peer, confidential, and that wel welcome, welcomes in the world, to, in, in our playground, in our premises. And this is what that we're presenting today. We're very excited for everyone to, to start using the platform. It will be available in Q4. Uh, it, this is based in Switzerland. It's going to be available to individuals and companies globally. And uh, the launch date is Q4. So if you want to read more about it, go to xtex.ch. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll just invite now Jan 3. So, Samson, do you want to come along? And uh... Thank you. Is this thing on? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Samson Mo. I'm the CEO of Jan 3, and I'm up here to make a short announcement. Uh, we would like to welcome Prince Philip of Serbia, who is joining Jan 3 as of today, as our Chief Strategy Officer. So this is the next step for us to advance our work on nation-state Bitcoin adoption, bringing on board Prince Philip to help us spearhead initiatives around the world, but especially in Latin America. So I'm gonna pass over to Prince Philip now to give a short intro and address you guys. Thank you, Samson. So yeah, I'm Prince Philip of, of Serbia, or Yugoslavia, and I'm a Bitcoin maxi. I love Bitcoin. I uh, currently well, was working in the legacy financial world in the asset management and I always thought that uh, it needs a massive upgrade and Bitcoin of course is that upgrade. Um, so I, when I met Samson in Miami earlier this year he offered me the position that he announced just now and I'm very proud to, uh, to take on this thing to spread the love and the word of Bitcoin around the world. I come from a lineage of of my f mother's side, she's a princess of Brazil, and I'm the direct descendant of Pedro II, the last emperor of Brazil. He was very anti-slavery, and his, his work paved way for the uh, liberation of slaves in, in, uh, in Brazil. And on my father's side, I'm the direct descendant of Cara Jorge, who was the f the, led the first uprising against Ottoman rule in, in, Ser in Serbia, and paved, paved way for the freedom of Serbs. So I have freedom close to my heart, and it's something that I want for everybody, and Bitcoin's that tool. Uh, 
Um, I mean, Samson mentioned South America. I speak Spanish, which is a, an advantage. My mother is I, it's my mother tongue. And I look forward to, to, to uh, going there and uh, spreading the word of the love of Bitcoin. And not just there, but all over the world, Europe, and meeting other royals, politicians, and the likes, and yes, accelerating hyper Bitcoinization. Um, this is, yeah, this is something I'm really proud of. I'm really happy to be on this team with Samson. So thank you so much, Samson. Yeah, thank you. So it's great to have Prince Philip on board. We have another major player in our arsenal to get Bitcoin adopted worldwide. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, so we've got our next one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I'll, uh, I'll uh, invite uh, Marty Bent up uh, to uh, introduce uh, our next guest. Marty. So for obviously, for those of you who don't know, Marty is the uh, founder of uh, uh, TFTC.io, a modern-day media company, and uh, a very well-known Bitcoin host. Uh, so, so guys, welcome, Marty. Thank you, Stefan. All right. Let's get ready to rumble. Uh, getting joined by John Carvalho from Synonym and Paul Storick, Bitcoin developer, to talk about drive chains, scaling, pass forward for scaling Bitcoin. I'll sit right here. You two sit there. Are they on? So I think we start with you, Paul. I think it's for people in the audience and people watching the live stream, it makes sense to start <laughs> with the history of drive chains. What is a drive chain and how? That's what this whole thing is about. <laughs> we prepared a lot for this. <laughs> you guys took uh, notes. That's what we just yeah. discussed. No, we did. Well, because, well, because the preparation was so thorough, drive we what? each independently made little notes of like things we agree and disagree about. Yeah. So, but this is probably one of them. I mean, I don't know. This is an idea I had a long time ago to solve everyone's problems. And uh, the, everyone included the large blockers and the small blockers. And so both of the groups were like, how can you side with them? And they, uh, they sort of didn't like the idea. But it, uh, now it's, uh, the idea is so good that its merits are slowly being seen by everyone seven years after I wrote about it in November 2015. John, do you agree that Not the merits big, are being uh, seen by everybody? No. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'll be uh, dramatic and say I think pretty much all the narratives of drive chain are false. All right. All right. Let's do it then. All right. Let's do it. We're rumbling. Um, so do you want me to just say a narrative or something? Sure. Like what do you think is the, you know, the, the, the biggest problem that drive chains solve? I would say, well, it's all quite a few, but I'd say the, the core problem is that people will never agree completely on what the blocks chain should contain. So you, you can't have the blocks be both large and small. So no matter what you have, someone has to go away empty-handed. And that is one of the problems that it solves. Why would a side chain handle that problem better than a shitcoin? Because the, with the shitcoin, you have a completely different investment. You have like a rival investment that has its own fate. Whereas this is just like kind of like converting cash to money in a checking account or something. They exchange at par. That's the whole side but chain. But I, I still have to convert my asset into the paradigm of a new blockchain, right? The, yeah, but, uh, it depends on uh, exactly like there's like the details of what happens under the hood and then there's like what really. So, but yes, you, you have two pieces of software. They both can be blockchain software. One has a large larger block size, for example, and one has a smaller block size, for example. And one of the things that we could do with this is shrink the layer one block size and then ossify. Uh, but that's going on a slight tangent. Um, but the point is you have two completely different pieces of software. And then you have, um, you, the, you'd, on the layer one, you'd send coins. You take coins that you own there, and you'd send them into layer two, the, the other piece of software. But the value won't show up be one there. to one. Sorry? Right. The value won't be one to one because the rules will be different on the separate blockchain. The they exchange one to one in the software in the Bit three hundred rules when they go across. So if you have four BTC and you send them across, you end up with four coins and the other network. And then uh, if you go through the long withdrawal process that is not intended for lay people to use, but anyone can use it because it takes so long. It's not intended for regular people to use. But you can. 
And if you do that and you have you still have 3.2 coins or something, you will get 3.2 back on but on layer one. So even whatever the market rate may be, instantaneous, which may be different because of the delay, the uh, the BIP 300 lets you send them at exactly at par. But my my side chain, my side coin is most likely going to have a different market value than Bitcoin, right? Well, it could be like point. It could be like 99.99 cents on the dollar or something. Well, wouldn't it? It could it, be anything. It could be really. totally different. And so, how do you deal with the? the well, it conversion? can never be above one, right? You can right, see why we would, never, you would move it. them in. Yeah. Well, there would be a delay on their arbitrage, and there's more risk to using. But the chain. moving them inside from layer one to layer two is basically instantaneous. It's like. It's like a 10 minutes or one block or whatever, so. But moving them out is 90 days. Moving them out is, takes a very long time. Yeah. Uh, but, so, the question is, there are certain situations where the, the market value may not be like 99 cents on the dollar, which include the sidechain developers tried a terrible idea and the entire software has crashed and no one can figure out who the rightful owner of the coins is at all. It's not possible to figure Aren't it out. are all blockchains terrible ideas? <laughs> It's not a joke. It's not a joke, including Bitcoin? No. Well, Bitcoin is like Bitcoin, and then blockchain is like pretending you can do other things in Bitcoin. Well, I think this may be another disagreement between the two of us, where do you really think, is that hyperbole, or do you really think that like every single idea? I really idea, think that. No. Like you don't see any value in like the Zcash uh, technology, even just as a mixer on Bitcoin. Even if you stripped away of the, the dev tax, you stripped away the... Um, Weird, weird stuff that Zuko does. I, I, like, like each use case, I could probably mention a, di like a specific reason, but I think all of them have a reason why they are faulty designs ultimately. And you think that's going to be true forever? Like no one will ever come up with a good idea? I think it's possible, but Doesn't I think that require that kind of omniscience on your part? I don't think you need drive chains to, for that possibility. Can I, can I break in here? So you think these other ideas have faulty ideas. What in your mind is like a good idea, a secure idea? in terms of building on this stuff. In other words, why, what w if somebody presented a blockchain that was like interesting, what would it look like? Or why do you see Bitcoin being the only valuable? Ah, because like a blockchain has a specific purpose and solved a, like, a specific problem. And a lot of people want to attach this narrative that there are actually other things this format solves, but they all root in the same thing that Bitcoin does. And so ultimately, a better Bitcoin would be like a simpler or, you know, a more, a more streamlined, simpler Bitcoin. And no altcoins are really attempting to do that. So they're all blockchaining is just adding complexity to Bitcoin and adding attack area, adding centralization, adding censorship in order to make a claim that a blockchain can do something that it can't actually do. And bringing this back to drive chains specifically, I mean, that's the biggest knock that I've heard historically on drive chains is expanding this attack vector and uh, basically creating this incentive to bring insecurity to the chain via... Yeah, I think that's just people who haven't really, I mean, I, that's very forgivable that people say that, but they just, um, I don't think they really understand what's happening, which is just on layer one, there's just money like going into a box, and then if enough hash rate accumulates on it, you can take money out of the box to a certain destination. And so if you're relying on an external source of income, and I don't think either of those things are actually true. I think they're actually both negatives, where I think that one, if there aren't enough fees for people to run Bitcoin, it's because nobody's using Bitcoin and Bitcoin is dying. It's not because we failed to add more features to Bitcoin. It's because people don't need any blockchain for anything. And that's really unlikely. It is not the trend. We have seen evidence in the past where, you know, the blocks will get full eventually and the fees will be fine. And addressing whether or not there's enough fees for miners is mostly just, you know, how many blocks you want to wait to have a confirmation if there's not enough or mine yourself. Yeah, but didn't you read the long article I wrote on exactly this topic, which addressed both of those issues? You have any short articles? No. <laughs> there is long, you know, it's like the too many notes from Amadeus. It's like they're as long or as I short as I require. I love your long yeah. blog. <laughs> so I wrote a long post about this, though, but it's like this is the, um, and I wrote, I made a long presentation on sidechain risks in 2016. So it's like um, we can get, we'll get to something later maybe if we have time, but the, um, the number of confirmations is not really relevant because the, if the security budget is too low, the attack is an endless campaign of 51% attacks. So that, does, that doesn't make any difference at all. So the, the problem but is the even question if you're right, the, fees, the second the, part still comes into the, effect. The issue, the first part about um, 
the fees can only be really, really low if Bitcoin is failing for some reason. First of all, it could be failing for some reason. But second of all, as I say in the post, there's plenty of things that people really like that the market clearing price is very low for. And so I give examples like a, a paywalled uh, news article or music. You can just go on YouTube and type music, whatever music you like into YouTube, and you get it for free. So the market clearing price is very, very, very low. But people love music. You know, people really like music. Just because, and people really like water. I have water in the article. Like, people love water. But water is cheap because the supply is abundant. So, and this, so this is a situation where just because something is really, really what great. What does any of this have to do with Bitcoin? Because the supply the of Bitcoin is not price, abundant. The market clearing you can't price put can music be low. on Bitcoin. You can't put water yeah, the, on the Bitcoin. Something, you can like something and the market clearing price will be low. It depends on the economic factors, the supply and demand. Bitcoin is not responsible for all the things that you like. It is just there to be an abstraction for value. No, I, this has nothing to do with uh, what Bitcoin is responsible for. I'm just telling you that. So the other thing I talk in the post is I do the imperial empirical and theoretical case for the slow, the, the low fees, which is that the empirical case is very dire. The, the fees will go up sometimes when there's a big bull market and the blocks get congested temporarily. But then the bull market goes away, and even if the price goes up by a factor of 50 and stays up, the, the fees will go back down to less than $1 per transaction, and so they, they stay very low. The people are not willing to pay the fees. I think you're the trying to predict low. the future. And but neither, the case for sidechains is not built on, on this in particular. This was just because people started talking about this issue, and I did the math, and I realized how horrible the situation was. So I thought I would write about it, since everyone has such vast misunderstandings about this issue, which include that more confirmations uh, make any difference at all, which they do not. I could just assain, change the assumption to say that the demand for block space is infinite, and the only reason it doesn't, it's not apparent is that there are actual costs to using it. And so it, it, I think the demand will eventually hit the you block could, size. You could say, but it depends on what, uh, what the audience will buy. If they really buy that the demand for block space is infinite, then. I think what they should buy the, is neither of us calls can out for quite future. a few more other things to be explained, like why you can buy an entire block these days for, uh, call it, uh, Fifteen hundred dollars or something, then it's not infinite. So uh, instead of bike shedding this further, like in like in the end, the, I think the audience should just say neither of us can actually predict the future, and so well, all of this is theoretical. But the second half of what I mentioned is also important, which is you portray the idea that miners relying on side chains for incomes to some degree as good. I actually think it's bad because, like for example, what if you take what if a side chain becomes more valuable than Bitcoin? Or what, it, or what, what if, if an the, what if it becomes the majority what if an of fees? becomes more valuable than Bitcoin, you know? Right. It's, do you think that would be an you, existential threat to do Bitcoin? Do you think altcoins be? compete with Bitcoin or they help Bitcoin? Do I think altcoins I think every rival investment anything you could put your money in is a rival investment to Bitcoin. So, I think they're particularly all particularly abstracted monies, right? Cuz those right. are yes. there's no differentiation. It's the same. They're competing to do the same thing. They, they're kind of all flavors of money, yes, I agree. So you want to put a bunch of competing monies on Bitcoin? No, the sidechain is not a competitor because they exchange at par. Why would they exchange at par if they had different qualities? No, the software exchanges them at par. <laughs> if they do exchange at par. But why would, I does. why would I value a it's Bitcoin? It's like why, saying, why would I, you put $20 bill into an ATM and you say, why did I get $20 into my checking because account? Because the, the risk of the designs are going to be much higher, so the values are going to be lower. Like, if I go to ZK, Bit Zcash, then there's going to be a whole different design to how that blockchain works. Right? Yes, right, but that affects only the people who opt in to that. Why would it I opt in if the value person. is lower? Sorry? Why would I opt in if the value is lower? No, the... The value may be lower than by a, a trivial amount that reflects the the inconvenience of coming back slowly. So, but if you, but yeah, the sidechain situation is designed for something where there's a feature that people want. It has to be a popular feature. So, if there's no reason, but you would use the Zcash sidechain because it's a vastly superior mixer than everything that exists today. It's vastly superior than all CoinJoin or Zcash whatever. Zcash requires things. a trusted setup still, right? Sorry? Zcash requires a trusted setup, right? No, but we, the Zcash sidechain that we built is just a carbon copy of the, so we copied the same set. But actually, they changed, they upgraded from 4 to 5, and I may be wrong, but I think Zcash 5 doesn't have the trusted setup, although I'm not a Zcash expert, but I do know that we upgraded the, the sidechain after they spent a, a year and a half going from Zcash 4 to Zcash 5, 
in about a weekend, we moved the side chain from I don't know the copying Zcash, Zcash 4 to Zcash, Zcash 5. Yeah, so I, I, I think they got rid of the trusted setup. I'll say I don't know about Zcash, but I'll mention like... The I point is it doesn't matter, though. There's no, we, there's no way that everyone can keep track of all these ideas because everyone has that, all these ideas. Some will be good and some will be bad, and it's up to you. The, you, the customer, should have them all at your fingertips, and there's but, no way that we can keep track of all these ideas. I'm worried about that. Suppose that a large amount of Bitcoin ends up in a side chain, and that right. side chain becomes a majority of the Bitcoin. But value. to me, this case is analogous to uh, something else becoming more popular than Bitcoin. So in that case, the Bitcoin faces an existential threat and may be destroyed. And I think right, but a, if you put the it side on chain, at least, it's uh, the side chains are always subordinate to. To Bitcoin, they can't. The, if you run the sidechain software that we have, they're to miners. No, if you run the sidechain software that we have, if it cannot find a layer one node to connect to, it just won't do anything. So it cannot exist without layer one. So they're very subordinate. Right, but what? Like, isn't this sort of like a way to hard fork Bitcoin? Like, if I put all the Bitcoin in a sidechain, no, it's, you exact, have... it's because the sidechains are optional and ignorable that it's not a hard fork. But it gives you all the freedom of the hard fork with just this this tiny assumption that. One TXID that's acted by the miners every six, three to six months will be accurate. And even if that doesn't work, it only affects the people who put money over there. Yeah, I, I don't think it can only affect the people in the side chain because it, miners also mine Bitcoin. And once you change the incentives to miners caring about external supplemental income, now, they, now those well, people let have Let me ask you this. The Where's the, what should they care about instead? So, like, I have a little graph with a little triangle in the article that you didn't read about the security budget at the bottom, uh, where I say if the I'm fees sure I are, read it and it the years fees are ago, persistently but. low, then, you know, because we have, we have a Peter Todd has said that he, want, he advocates this tail emission concept of violating the 21 million coin I don't limit. Know, I don't you don't agree know, with that, right? Uh -huh. So the triangle has 21 million coin limit or enormous block size increases or greater than 51% of the revenues come from merge mining. And you know that we've been doing merge mining already for many years. Like Satoshi invented merge mining. This is not like a BIP 300 idea. BIP 300 has nothing to do with merge mining. It was invented by Satoshi in 2010. We've been doing it with Namecoin for a long time. Let me ask you this. Do you think Namecoin is a good idea? Also invented no. by Satoshi. So you think it's just not you a good idea? You don't need a blockchain for that at all. Really? No. To, to, uh, oh, because you have a synonym. I forgot about this. He's, I mean, <laughs> he's doing this. But, he's, uh, but I don't think that synonym is... I don't want to turn this... I don't want to go completely off topic, but with synonym, you have to like pick... like who you think is going to be the name provider or something, get a whole list. Of, you can't like own Google.com in synonym, right? So as like a, That's what a dynamic primitive, names are mutual. They're not assigned. And so in other words, we both have to agree on what a name is when we're pointing yeah, out Yeah, I can't something. just own Google.com and say, yeah. Nobody I actually a owns I have a property right on Google.com and whatever you think about it, I don't, no one cares. So I think, that, I think people would prefer the property right personally. And that's what I think Satoshi thought as well when he invented Namecoin and co-invented Namecoin in uh, 2010. But, but putting a domain name on Namecoin doesn't prevent somebody else from having that domain name in another index. No, I agree. But it's a question of does it solve a problem for the actual user? I think people think about the user, dark net market, you know, the onion link, and they, they get phishing and stuff. There's actual problems in the real world that, it w that Namecoin would solve. And that other things would solve, even if you just stamped out the so-called horizontal scaling, just stamped out copies of Bitcoin Core that are just... You, you just don't need a blockchain just to establish a, a yeah. list of domains that only attribute to certain endpoints. And, and your reaction to the idea that, like, so like Ethereum, the fee, the transaction fees, you, uh, the, to me, those represent paying customers. And so when it goes from one one-thousandth of Bitcoin's value in 2015, to over a hundred times on a basically a straight line on a, a log chart. To you, that just that, that doesn't mean anything at all. It doesn't can mean I, like so. You just can I just use the transaction fees of Visa to compare to Bitcoin? I'm saying that those are paying users. They're using. They're paying to use People a blockchain. People pay for Visa too. What's the difference between Visa and Ethereum? Um, I, well, in this case, there's no. In this particular context of my question, there is no difference because I'm just saying this is a customer that wants something. Okay, but I'm if, saying that the Ethereum. If a customer wants, wants something that's not Bitcoin, well, Ethereum is a, Bitcoin should do. Let's talk over each other, gentlemen. Okay. Ethereum is a blockchain in this case, and a, more directly a competitor to Bitcoin than Visa is, I would say. I mean, wouldn't you or no? Well, what, my point is that Ethereum it requires the assumption of a censorable, centralized blockchain. In order to have an Ethereum, you need to be censorable and centralized. And so what's the difference between that and MasterCard or Visa? Well, I don't, certainly don't think it's black and white. Uh, you, you think it's exactly the same like w MasterCard and Ethereum as far as how easy it is to just like... 
call them up on the phone and say, uh, take this person's money? I think you have private at the keys same scale, yeah. In Ethereum, you have, a, you have a key pairs, right? You have addresses. So I think, I think the there's much more of a spectrum than you might think. Yeah, I think the closer Ethereum gets to the size or scale and amount of customers as MasterCard, there will be one-to-one -one that censorable. I mean, I don't know about that because you don't have your own key pair with MasterCard, you know? You There's no customer service. Maybe there will be a customer service number for ETH in the future. That would be funny. Yeah, that would, that would be really be something. I, I, this I is my whole thing about blockchains is they all require accepting the prerequisite of a censorable blockchain, a broken blockchain at scale. Uh, but you, that doesn't apply to Bitcoin at all or something. Like what if the Zcash sidechain had a very small block size? So that's even easier to run the Zcash node than the Bitcoin node. That's, that's the hang up for you or, or what? I don't know that if, there, if there's something that's worth doing on Bitcoin, it's worth doing on Bitcoin. And if it requires some sort of other blockchain to do it, it's just probably not worth doing. Well, I think this gets, brings me to this other idea that I wanted to try to mention, which is that I think that we, we do disagree on something else, which is that the, the freedom to ignore good ideas, which is that you, I think you claim it in every case. You say, I'm a, I don't have to pay attention to this idea if I want. Uh, no one should change Bitcoin um, unless they can prove to me that uh, this idea is good and I can just choose to ignore it. And I say, if you, if, you t if you try to claim that always, then you actually have to allow people to shitcoin, I think. Because what you, what, think of like a Ricardo Monero situation where there's like he has this ring signature idea back in the day, as you know, a long time ago. And then it was kind of like, what was he supposed to do instead? Like, just nothing? And then he created Monero. So I think, like, only when we have <laughs> side chains and there's no need to shitcoin can you go back to ignoring, say, I'm just going to ignore all these ideas. Otherwise, you have to pick one of the three. You either have to say, I'm going to research every single idea that exists and have an informed, fully informed opinion on it, which I think is impossible. Or you have to say, well, we'll let people shitcoin. Or you have to say... I don't we, quite look at it that way. Um, I'm not saying that somebody can't come up with a good idea. I'm saying that you know, if nobody has shown me a good idea, that's, so that's pretty, uh, pretty uh, g good way to justify my just general you know disinterest and disinterest in accepting risk on Bitcoin to to enable this. Well, let me ask you this though: you think an idea isn't good? This is why I brought up the Ethereum fees because you maybe you say that you don't think an idea is good. But shouldn't it be up to each individual user to decide what they think is a good idea, right? They, they're allowed to sell their Bitcoin for fiat. I'm they're allowed to sell their Bitcoin for goods and services, right? They can buy Solana if they want. So shouldn't they decide, not you, what, what, what ideas are good? I don't, like I said, I don't think Bitcoin is responsible for all things. So if you think something else serves a use case for you, use something else. Gentlemen, our time is up, but... Wow, really? Okay. It flew by. Wait, I, I do want to commend you. I, I think it is important to make the point. Like, this is a very civil discussion. Obviously, you guys agree and disagree on some stuff, but I, I like this format, Max, and uh, I think it's good to have cordial, civil conversations like this. So I want to thank I you. I like Paul, for the record. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also like John. I thought about I was like, he introduced us so well, but I was going to sit down and I was going to say, like, we meet again or something like very <laughs> ominous, but I never got to say it. All right. Well, gentlemen. Thank you. It was a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Guys, we got uh, Matthew Mazinkshus coming up next. I saw the presentation. It's really good. I would stick around. All right. Thank you, gents. That was a fascinating discussion. Our next talk, our speaker, he is uh, the host and founder of Paul Coppolis Economics. He uh, does some great economic uh, statistical work and explanations and education around uh, base money and the different money uh, types. So uh, please, everyone, welcome Matthew Mazinski. Next up. Okay. Hey, everybody. All right. Yes, Matthew Majinskis uh, hosts this podcast, Crypto Voices, for about six years. Also, for about four years, we've been doing these reports on money under this Porkopolis Economics brand. Today, we're going to do gold, Bitcoin, CBDCs, very concrete, very real stuff here, some lessons from central banks. So, uh, just one quick slide before we start. We've got to do it. This is uh, some of the stuff in my research, okay? Just get the terms right. We have this uh, economic term called the monetary base or base money. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real term. All right, historically we had, as what we know, what most children know, right? Gold, silver, shells, read Nick Zabo's shelling out. Shells almost made it worldwide, but didn't quite. We also have, uh, of course, we have Bitcoin, okay? 
don't need to explain too much why that is, but it's final system settlement. It's your asset, nobody else's liability, it's base money. We also have, uh, in the last 50 years, it's been, as most people know, now the historical base money of gold is fully untethered uh, from the current base money, which central banks produce. Okay, so when I talk about fiat base money or the fiat monetary base, this is the stuff in your wallets, you might love it, you might hate it, the actual physical notes. There's also some digital base money, don't worry too much about it, but all of it is issued directly from the central bank, all right? All of it is media, monetary media. It's on the central bank's balance sheet. It is directly issued from the central bank. So when they talk about the printing press, digital or physical, that's what it is. Everything else in the world, Visa, Amex, tokens. It's a big one in this space, right? Not in this space, but in other spaces. Uh, gift cards, uh, checks. To the new legal tender, new in, in quotes, the legal tender fiat money that central banks issue. All right, so we got gold here is the gold bars, and behind it, it's not stacked, but imagine it's behind it, is all of the base money, the euros, the yen, uh, the yuan, Argentinian pesos, all the rest stacked up. Now, it's, it's uh, Wittgenstein's ruler. I have to do this in dollar terms. I know this is in the U.S. dollar, but uh, let's just take a look at it, okay? So we got old base money that was in central banks, that's gold, versus the, cent the, the, ba the fiat base money that they would issue, okay? And we would know in the 70s that was a tough decade, all right? It always seems to be a tough go, tough decade. But in the 70s, we had stagflation, rising prices, rising uh, unemployment. The Vietnam War was raging. Uh, the petrodollar was starting. It was a difficult decade. It was a tough go. And if you were a gold bug, if we were fans of gold and sound money and hard money and the trade and uh, a lot of the virtues that we believe good, sound, base money brings to the system, what would we be thinking from the beginning of the decade when gold was $35 an ounce to the end, the price is not here, but most people might know, in January of 1980, gold hit $850 an ounce. A little bit of trivia for you. How long was gold at $850 an ounce in January of 1980? It was about two seconds on the COMEX and the world markets, about two seconds. Nonetheless, this is valued their gold at uh, $850 an ounce. All, now, this is not just the Federal Reserve. This is all the gold and all the central banks. This is all the base money in the world. So we went from, you know, roughly there was 15% backing, if you want to use this word, in, uh, in the start of the decade. By January of 1980, we're over 100% collateralized in gold. So if we were gold bugs, what would we be thinking to ourselves in January of 1980? We had won. This is it. The world is tough. Sound money is going to be restored. The market has shown the value of base money, and the free market has shown that it's much stronger than fiat. And obviously, you know what I'm setting you up here. Let's look at the next 40 years after that. It's the same chart. It's the same exact chart. Instead of just looking at the 70s, we have 40 more years all the way till today. You see there, instead of a couple hundred billion dollars worth of gold and fiat-based money in the 1970s, now we have, as of Q1, 22, there's $30 trillion equivalent of government fiat money and only about $2 trillion of gold in the vaults. That's about 1.1 billion ounces of gold is in central bank vaults. So, again, we thought we had won in January of 1980. The world was seeing things our way. Look at how much gold is in central bank vaults now. It's 6 7% uh, on average in the last many, many years. This quote from Alan Greenspan, basically I'll summarize, he was knowing he was known for being quite an elliptical uh, Federal Reserve chairman, didn't exactly speak very clearly. What he's saying is a rising gold price is a rebuking of our policy. We do not like a rising gold price. We're not going to allow a rising gold price. And I ask you, was he wrong? Did he, did he win or did we win as gold bugs? And this is a 50-year time period. Like, Let's not talk about gold a thousand years from now or if we're mining asteroids or whatever, but if we were gold bugs, we spent 50 years of our lives in defense of gold. I ask you, did we win or did we lose? Gold is very centralized in many institutions. It's centralized in central banks. So I think that there is a lesson there. Here's some quotes, also can be helpful. This is Ludwig von Mises, his theory of money and credit, his tome from 1912. The state should at least refrain from exerting any sort of influence on the value of money. A metallic money, which is kind of a bad uh, translation, he probably meant commodity money, as I mentioned. A commodity money is becoming 
the modern monetary ideal. He didn't wade into politics too much. He did more later in his life. It was mo mostly about theory and catalactics and prices and economics. Here he's talking about politics. And he's saying it's good to have a commodity-based money separate from the state. Again, based on the prior chart, this was 110 years ago. This is one of the best economists in the 20th century. I ask you, did we win? Did we make that happen? All right, this is a completely uh, different view. This guy I respect a lot as well. His name is Chris Powell. He's a co-founder of GATA. If you don't know GATA, it's a gold antitrust action committee. They are very much skeptical of that quote that Alan Greenspan made in the last uh, slide. These guys are hardcore. These guys have sued the Federal Reserve. They've sued the Treasury. They have treasury checks that they've won in little lawsuits. They have tons of documents on their website. They're all about getting the gold markets more transparent, is what he says. Therefore, we take the thing out of the hands of government. That is, we can't take it violently out of the hands of government. All we can do is, by some sly, roundabout way, introduce something they can't stop. Obviously, very prescient. Most people have observed, I think very, very correctly, very much agree with this quote that he was predicting Bitcoin, even though he didn't know exactly what he was predicting. So again, three quotes, highly respect all of these people, different ways to look at and learn from what happened with gold. All right, just very, very quickly, some value stuff. I'm not about CPI, I'll talk about that in the second slide. I never, never do CPI. As John Williams from Shadow Stats said, it's probably at least double. They don't use the same variables they used in the 80s. It's all, all different. Nonetheless, I like to just look at the growth of supply. Let's look at the growth of stuff, all right? Start at the left-hand side, population, how much did we grow? This is in the last 15 years before the slide of 2008, so I'm not cheating with the down years of 2008 or 9. This is December 2007. Population has grown 19% in 15 years. Okay, we've got 7.8 billion people on the planet. Oil, interestingly, is about lockstep. We consume about 36 billion barrels of oil a year. That's 20% higher than 2007. Gold and silver. Uh, contrary to what some people think, silver actually grows a little bit slower than gold. That's because it has a bigger base. Yes, there's more industrial use, but if you're talking about all-time ounces of silver, all-time ounces of gold mined throughout humanity. Nothing to do with prices here. I'm talking about ounces, supply. Silver up about 27 percent, 55 billion ounces gold, 31 percent, 6.3 billion ounces of gold. Okay, now we get back to Wittgenstein's ruler. We have to do GDP. This is a okay metric for economic growth, but not a great one. It also, you know, we got the dollar interacting with this. We got 100 different currencies around the world inside of this number. Nonetheless, world GDP is going to be about 104 trillion dollars this year. That's about 79 percent higher than 2007, okay? And then we got this one. This is from our research. This is the growth of the monetary base. Top 50 central banks in the world. This is everything, the dollar, euro, yen, yuan, pesos, like I said, uh, all the big central banks in the world and more. It grew 7.5x, okay? That's a 15% compounded annual growth rate per annum. 15% blended compound annual growth rate. Okay, so again, I just asked, and it's about 28 trillion, as I mentioned. So I think there's some lessons in the supply. Very, very quickly reconciling these numbers. Again, I, I don't use CPI, I just don't recommend it. I think it's gonna confuse people. Let's just look at actual units, okay? So again, Wittgenstein's ruler, it's just dollars in the numerator, do dollars in the denominator, but you don't need to CPI adjust this, okay? It's a, it's a ratio. You got 15 bucks of GDP for every $1 of base money in 1969. That fell to under $10 in 2007. And today you get $3.70 for every $1 of base money in the world, in the world, not just in the U.S., in the world. So they tell us, you know, we got to print, print, print in order to grow, grow, grow. We only got two decimal places. We're always growing. We got to print. If that worked, this monetary transmission mechanism, I don't know what the leverage is or what the ratio is, but those bars should at least be flat. We shouldn't be getting less dollars of GDP every year for every additional dollar or euro or yen or yuan, remember that's all behind that, in base money that we print. All right, very quickly now, the third, uh, the third uh, topic I wanna to talk about CBDCs, all right? We got 50 articles about CBDCs a day. CBDCs are like the best thing since sliced bread. It is a third new type of central bank money, okay? It's the same thing as physical cash, physical retail cash. Also, banks have some digital cash it's part of the monetary base, as I mentioned, doesn't matter if it's physical or digital, it's all the printing press. CBDCs will be a third rail of that. It'll still be issued by the central bank, but a digital base money. And of course, they're you know, taking a lot of Bitcoin hype in, uh, in their research. But I want to address this question. 
Nobody uses cash. Nobody uses cash. I was going to quote, maybe even people in this room decided not to because about everybody in the world says it. But is it true? Is it true? Again, I'm not disputing that, that topic of fiduciary media, that bucket of tokens and credit cards and whatever sort of claim a bank wants to issue. That's all it can be digital and it's great. I'm not disputing any of that. What I want to talk about is actual growth of physical currency. Are you sure that nobody uses cash? Everybody writes about CBDC, 50 articles a day on CBDC. Please, someone tell me about CBPC. What is CBPC? Central bank physical currency. Has anyone ever looked at it? Are you sure nobody uses cash? All right, this is the same thing uh, as I had before. This is, again, this is part of the monetary base. It's not the whole monetary base, but it's part of the monetary base. It's the base of the system. Nine trillion dollar equivalent, okay? Uh, market cap of Apple, 2.7 trillion. It's about 3.3x of actual hard cash money exists in the world. 3.3x the market cap of all the Apple computers, phones, iPads in the world, all the Apple services, etc. If you want to see the actual US coin, it's about two trillion plus. That's the dark shaded. But everything else above, yuan, yen, euro, all the rest. How fast does it grow? That's the more important question. How fast does it grow? Cash grows at a blended compounded rate of 10.4% over the last 50 years, and that is rising. That's not falling, that's not staying stable, that is rising. What's 10.4% compounded? It's a doubling every seven years, all right? So again, Wittgenstein's ruler, it's actually, as the dollar has gotten super strong, as I told you, it used to be 30 trillion in Q1, in Q2, we got it down to uh, 28 trillion, and central banks, some, the US Federal Reserve, most importantly, or making the most news, is printing a little bit less this year. All right, they're trying to contract the balance sheet. But still, most of the central banks are printing. It's kind of on balance in the last 12 months. Um, again, you know, Wittgenstein's ruler, that even if it seems like it's not even that high in dollar terms, all right, that's because the dollar is, is actually getting stronger. It's the best looking horse in the glue factory. So imagine all the other currencies behind there. I'm using the exchange rate. It's still growing. And if you blend and, and average the, uh, the compound growth rate, it's 10.4% per year. Let's talk about population again. What's the population of the globe done in the last 50 years? It's doubled. It's doubled once in the last 50 years. What does that mean? It grows at 1%. 0.5% per year compounded annually, 1.5%. So a doubling every 50 years of population, what's physical cash done? It doubles every seven years. It grows seven X faster than population. So again, we're growing as civilization, humanity, only two decimal places in our currency system. We need to print, print, print. Are you sure that nobody is using physical cash? That's the question I have to every journalist that writes about the importance of CBDCs. Okay, so now let's reconcile this. A CBDC to succeed must do one of two things. It can do both, could do one. First one is it has to either ab absorb or compete with that CBPC stock, the central bank physical currency. It's the same institution that's gonna be issuing all of these units. So it's gotta compete with it. Do you think that that, was that number go down or up of the CP, uh, CD, CBPC stock of money, it was flying, it's soaring, 10.4% per year compounded over the last 50 years. So I don't think number one is very likely, at least in the near term, maybe even 10 years. Who knows? I don't think it's very likely at all. Number two, the only thing that CBDCs can do then to gain market share is they're going to have to drain deposits of the banking system. That's the only other place where the addressable market of a CBDC could come. How likely do you think, or how happy will banks be if they need to, if they're seeing that their customers are withdrawing, you know, from their bank accounts, sending funds to a cantankerous, finicky central bank app, that probably doesn't work. How likely do you think they're gonna be, and by the way, the central bank exists, of course, one for the state, but two for the banks. Central bank exists for the banks. How likely do you think the banks will be how, to allow this central bank to happen? It's gonna make them less profitable. Don't take my word for it. What, those two points are in hundreds of papers on CBDCs. Okay, so here's a quote again. This is the Bank of Japan two months ago. At this point, there are few countries that have a clear use case for CBDC. 
The BOJ currently has no plan to issue CBDC. This is from July 2022. So <laughs> it's pretty clear that CBDCs are going to have a rough go. It's pretty clear that CBPC doesn't give enough attention, doesn't get enough attention, excuse me, from, uh, from journalists. But they are telling you right here, it's not really going to work. Banks aren't going to like it. Central banks are going to have a rough go, especially against their own stock of physical currency. Just one more thing about Japan. Sometimes people don't think about Japan as much, don't take it seriously. Japan is the third largest economy in the world. The yen is a top four currency in the world, a right, top four monetary base in the world. Remember back to the future from the 80s? From the 80s, Doc, all the best stuff is made in Japan. You couldn't believe that from the 50s. Japan was a startup economy before startups existed. Also, Japan knows how to print money. They've been printing since the 90s. So I might, if I were a journalist, want to take the Bank of Japan's word for it. That, yeah, BOJ currently has no plan to issue a CBDC. At this point, few countries have clear use cases for CBDCs. They might not work. This, by the way, you can't read this. Don't worry about it. It's just a, a screenshot on my phone. A few months, a few weeks, let's say, after this report, BOJ, CBDC, of course, nothing came up. Nobody wrote anything about this report. All right, so that's CBDCs. Now we have Bitcoin. Just, just to close it out, uh, if you want to talk about, this is, as I call it, the real Bitcoin dominance index. All right, Bitcoin is not comparable to any of this fiduciary media. Fiduciary media. It's not comparable to tokens. It's not comparable to Visa, Amex, whatever. Those are all claims issued by third parties. Bitcoin is on its own, standalone, just like silver, all the silver ounces in the world, just like all the gold ounces in the world, and just like all the fiat legal tender central bank units in the world. All right, so this is the real Bitcoin dominant, dominance index, if you want to know. Yes, it's down. We're down a little bit. We've had a rough go. Uh, American friends are living like the Kardashians here in Europe because the dollar is extremely strong. Bitcoin's a little bit weaker. Uh, it peaked at 172%, the value of silver last year. Now it's only about 60% of all the, all the uh, available silver in the world. It also was about 12% the value of gold in the world. 12% the value of gold in March 2021. Now it's only about 4%. And of all the fiat money in the world, all those euros, dollars, yen, yuan, yuan, etc., it was 3.8% in October 2021. Now it's about 1.4%. So this I just want to explain. This is some of the research what we do. Don't get caught up in the hype about CBDCs. At least learn some lessons from them. I think we can learn some lessons from gold as well. And this is, uh, this is really what Bitcoin compares to uh, as far as real world stuff and real world based money. So that's the presentation. Thank you for listening. Fantastic talk. Thank you very much, Matthew. I really enjoyed that. Uh, he's definitely uh, pushing, your, pushing our minds in a way because uh, it's really, uh, yeah, it's certainly uh, counterintuitive, let's say. So let's uh, get the uh, next, uh, we'll get the stage ready for our next panel uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have that soon. So we're going to be chatting and we're going to be hearing from the guys about Bitcoin privacy. So uh, our host uh, for this panel we Vlad of the uh, of the Bitcoin takeover. So, uh, guys, welcome Vlad to the stage, and uh, he can introduce and uh, get the other guys on. Hi, guys. Suti. He worked for BitcoinIsSafe.com for a while, and up is Chris Stapps, works on Join Market. He's also a Bitcoin Core contributor, and I'm very proud that I'm I'm gonna take credit for this. But I spoke with Max, and he got on this panel because. He's from Riga, he was not getting much love, but he's doing a lot of useful work in Bitcoin privacy. And he has the best belts in the whole entire world. Check it out. Yeah, Next hi. up is Adam Fixor, who is the creator of Wasabi Wallet. Everyone here knows what Wasabi Wallet is, I guess. I'm gonna ask him about that, you know, transaction flagging or whatever you call it, filtering. Sure. Of course. And also we have Victor Vexe, who is from a VPN software. And basically, we know that privacy has lots of dimensions, especially in the case of Bitcoin. And network level privacy is very important. Now I'm also going to sit down. 
And this is the first conversation that we're going to have in this panel. What types of privacy do we have and how can we best cover it? And I'm going to start with Victor because he's the first to my left. Um, all right, so I think the main point I would get across about uh, privacy in general, not, not just Bitcoin, is that, uh, but uh, focusing on the previous presentation and this nice quote from Hayek, so if, if I think if we want to get this uh, money out of the government's hands in a sly roundabout way, uh, that's not going to happen without privacy. And I think that's, that's one thing that many people uh, in this community, uh, at least some, don't realize yet, so that would be my main point. Yeah, network level privacy is super important. And there's also Tor in Wasabi, as far as I know. There's also some other privacy stuff. Talk about it, Adam. So, well, what types of privacy? There is many ways to, to approach this question. But one way would be is to, who can see what? For example, in a Bitcoin wallet, there could be a Bitcoin wallet that's completely anonymous. No one can see what's happening in your wallet. Or the other extent, which everything is completely transparent, everyone knows what's going on in your wallet. And in the middle, there is confidentiality, where there is a trusted third party, TTP, that knows what's going on in your wallet, but at least your neighbors don't. So I think that's a good way to classify the, the privacy of, of Bitcoin wallets. And, and may I say this, this confidentiality is not a silver lining, not a happy middle, middle grant. It's in some ways even worse than complete transparency because confidentiality centralizes power to the trusted third party and uh, that's, that's something we, we want to avoid, power as knowledge. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, I think, well... Uh, pri privacy, it's, it's a really complicated topic, actually. Uh, and Hold it like this. Yeah, like this. Oh, okay. Uh, when, uh, when we think about Bitcoin privacy, well, first thing we think about like things like join market, Wasabi wallet, like stuff like that. But actually, if some Bitcoin newcomer would ask me, like, how can I be private? I think first thing is to learn them to use proper wallet don't reuse addresses and uh, buy Bitcoin using non KIC ways like HODL HODL, for example. And uh, yeah, things like Join Market, uh, Wasabi Wallet, the coin swaps in future that goes on top of that. Also, Lightning Network is, I think, uh, changes the aspects of Bitcoin privacy. It has some issues, but it has a lot of benefits uh, privacy wise. You know, what I was listening to you, I was thinking that maybe the privacy problem in Bitcoin is nothing compared to the privacy problem that we have in the world society, right? So it's like a completely digitalized society where basically we said, okay, we don't need privacy, but now after years and years and years of mistakes, we are like realizing how bad the situation is. So I think it's still an educational problem because uh, we tend to not consider privacy unless we are victim of like a data breach or like, um, like invasion of your privacy and these things. So I think that education here uh, is playing a huge role and uh, that's what I hope to see more people educating about these topics, if, even if, the, if it's like a taboo, right? Because uh, it looks like nowadays that if, if you're talking about privacy, then you're a criminal, you want to have criminals, but it's not like that. We are like humans and we have something that we, we want to, to hide. I mean, we can be transparent, Bitcoin lets us to be transparent, right? But we can also be private if we want. And again, we are talking about money here. We are talking about really important and sensitive data. And I think that we should have the, the software and also the ability to uh, have some privacy degrees in our life. Yeah, and I, I, I agree to this, I want to add that that's the big problem, that people don't care about pr privacy until it's too late. So it's, it's a, privacy is a weak differentiator. Right, like, like innovation must be happening and you don't have time to care about privacy of your users at first, but privacy is the last mover advantage, right? Like when, when, when we built out the whatever system we are talking about, then privacy, security, and such a things, those we neglect at the beginning as innovators, that's when they start to become important and that's when they become like, 
like, uh, like real differentiators between, between products on the market. So privacy is coming, it's just always lagging behind. I just wanted to add that, in, so to complete what you just said, it's very important for Bitcoin to become, become private, not because the people need privacy, but because Bitcoin needs to become good money. And for good money to be good money needs to be fungible. So one uni unit needs to be equal to any other unit. And that's a conversation that we have a lot, that Bitcoin needs to work as cash. You see it in the white paper, and I don't want to turn into Roger Ver or something, but he always said it's peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And the cash part is kind of missing when we have classes of coins. We have Chainalysis approved coins, which are fungible, maybe. They're accepted on exchanges. And then you have dark market coins that have some kind of history. And for as long as we can differentiate between these two classes of coins, Bitcoin is not really good money. We need to make it good money through privacy. And I want to ask each one of you what kind of tools we can use to reach that goal. Now, may I ask, I would like to say something before. I mean, there's no uh, privacy problem in the Bitcoin protocol, I think, right? So this thing about chain analysis and this thing about like differentiating UTXOs based on some heuristics, I mean, it's not part of Bitcoin, right? So you get clusters and you get categorized by external companies based on their heuristics, but again, no one is forcing you to follow those rules, right? So if we talk about like P2P exchanges, there are not these kind of issues, right? I mean, you uh, lose privacy against your, uh, your counterpart if you are like buying or selling or I don't know, like you are exchanging Bitcoin for a product or for a service. But again, the privacy and fungibility problem is when you are um, working or exchanging with centralized companies, centralized exchanges, centralized entities all over the world that they have to follow rules because they are based on a jurisdiction. But again, on the, on the protocol side, there are not like different, I mean, there's no difference between one UTXO and another one, in my opinion. So it's Yeah, but we as humans can make them be different. That's the problem. You can yeah. set your node to discriminate from certain UTXOs. You can make miners not include certain transactions into blocks. And for that, we need to make it truly fungible. And for that, we need some sort of privacy. Yeah, but because you're a company and you have to follow like rules because you are in a jurisdiction, right? So it's still a um, problem if you talk about the, like the physical world, pr probably. Yeah, but I think uh, uh, Lightning Network improves the uh, situation here. Yeah, I think Lightning is super great. It's client side, you only deal with your own channels. You don't have to tell the entire network what you're up to. You have watchtowers that watch over your activity, but that's something else. I, I, I mean that, let's say you are centralized exchange, but uh, when you when you have incoming Lightning Network deposit, you don't know the sender. So uh, you cannot uh, start discriminating. Okay, you could maybe not allow somebody to open channel from some bad ut with, with some bad UTXO to you, but anyway, payment can be routed to other channels, blah, blah, blah. Plus Lightning, as far as I know, doesn't generate UTXOs, so it's pretty cool. It makes it more fungible, easier to spend. But we need to open more lightning channels, right? Is that what you're proposing? Uh, what? Is lightning your proposal for a bit better fungibility in Bitcoin? Yeah, I think so. Because in, in lightning, you kind of, the payment is not tied to kind to your OTIC, so it's but it's just a little, a little part of it, I mean, because we are working on different aspects in uh, Bitcoin privacy, right? I mean, we are talking about uh, side chains, Lightning Network, coin joins, uh, state chains. VPNs. Basic, <laughs> yeah, VPNs. I mean, there are so many crazy things about Bitcoin privacy. You have to consider it on a network level, blockchain level, uh, also about what you are saying about your use engine Bitcoin, right? So if, uh, for example, I know that Adam is working on Wasabi Wallet, probably, I'm pretty sure that every coin join in the blockchain, probably Adam is part of it, so I can start to get, gain some information, get some information about, uh, like, Adam, just by knowing that he's working on Wasabi and he's using Wasabi. So there are so many things about privacy. So it's not just about what you're doing and using, but also what you're saying about you 
and also what uh, like your counterparts are doing and saying about you. I'm pretty sure that most people listening to this don't really understand. I'm making an assumption. But my next question is going to be, how do we make all of this simple for the user? Um, I would just uh, go back to the uh, tools and the um, networking level. So uh, in, in so far as how VPNs can help, so you, you have to understand that whatever service you use and connect to, your IP address uh, is visible to that provider. So this, this is true for like uh, custodial wallets, which you might not you know, be good to use, but if, if you do that, or like public buck, uh, block uh, explorers, uh, so, and also if you do mining, so your ISP is going to see that you are um, doing mining and the mining pool is going to see your IP address. So that's a very specific way that you can Im improve this. And uh, just to add to that, you can use VPNs for this or you can use for the, uh, Tor for this. So some services also, or, or you can use both, but like, I, would, I, would, I would say that, uh, that that comes with some, some disadvantages. So some software, like some nodes out, out of the box and like some, some uh, services also uh, already come with uh, Tor uh, integrated then you are good to go with Tor. And it has some trade-offs. So if, if you're thinking about VPN versus Tor is a, is, is a big question and you usually get asked ask for us. So it, it depends on your threat model and what you want to protect against. Uh, Tor has some disadvantages like speed and also the exit node. So it, it gives you better anonymity than, than, than a VPN and it's, uh, it's not centralized. So you don't have to trust like a centralized provider. But the, but the exit node can uh, log uh, what's exiting that, uh, um, that node. And if it's, uh, there is some unencrypted things leaking there, the, that's going to be scooped up by that. So you have to understand that and you have to make that decision. I mean, first to, maybe it's a long, long way to answer, sorry, but like, but for the VPNs, uh, I want to get across that it's very important that you use a VPN provider that you can trust. That's the most important thing. It doesn't have to be IVPN. Uh, there are some trustworthy providers out there. The list is very short, I think. Uh, but, uh, but use a VPN that you can trust because they can th see and, uh, everything and they can log everything and pass it on to other parties and sell it and share it with government. So, so yes, that's the, that's the network. Level. Can you mention that short list of VPNs that are okay? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, uh, so f for me, the best uh, list is uh, Proton VPN, uh, uh, Movad. I would start with Movad uh, if I think about it, uh, and uh, hopefully IVPN. There are some other, other providers that I don't know as much that gets mentioned uh, from activist circles like uh, Perfect Privacy and IVPN. Uh, but the rest is mostly junk. So, I mean, they, yeah, so ex uh, the problem with Express is that they, they are owned by a corporation which owns uh, multiple VPNs and they have pretty much a profit motive. So they have uh, shareholder meetings and corporate meetings and so that's, that's not a problem, you know, if you think about just the state of the world. I don't want to get into this dark capitalist uh, discussion. But in terms of like who is handling your data and what they're, what they're doing with it, you want, probably want uh, activists and privacy activists who know what they, what they are doing and who will prioritize principles over profits. And that's a couple of providers do that, uh, like, like the list I mentioned, and we try to do that and provide transparency through different uh, tools. Uh, but generally, you have to be very careful about who you give your money to because the big, big providers will cave to governments. That's the, that's the thing. So like if they are, compa uh, in most jurisdictions, they are not compared to log, but if the, the laws change and they will start get pressure for information, uh, they are going to cave. They are not going to put up a fight. They're just going to uh, prioritize the growth and uh, exit targets. So yeah, that's, that's true for most of the providers. Right, so now let's get to the part about making privacy simple. Adam, how do you make privacy simple in the context of Bitcoin? Mm, I see. So in the context of Bitcoin, <coughs> making privacy simple, there is a dimension of, let's say, good Bitcoin wallets, um, properties of good Bitcoin wallets, which would be friction. And there's two major sources of friction in, 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 in Bitcoin wallets. One is that we should, we should all realize what we are trying to do here. We are trying to enable people to send and receive money. And every friction that we put in their way of sending and receiving value to another person, communicating value to another person, every friction there is a problem. So we should, should somehow remove that. Uh, that's how we make it easy. Now, another major source of friction that I identified is the, the heaviness, the, the weight of the wallet. Full nodes versus light wallet. We, we have to do light wallets, but of course, full nodes are very important, so we have a huge problem here that we want light wallets, but also full nodes. Um, 
And the only solution that I can come up for that is we can think that problem away if we extrapolate technology far enough in the future, computation and terabytes of disk space and stuff like that is gonna be nothing. So that's the only way I can think of resolving that problem of, hey, you should not trust, but verify <laughs> and light wallets. So we can have a light full node in 2077. Like the video game Cyberpunk, right? Okay, Christophs, there is a lot of talk about join market being too difficult for the average user, but I do know that there are some user interfaces that make it simple. Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, yeah, uh, well, the, the first thing that we join market and, and we don't compromise on that, it requires running full node. Uh, but using user interfaces, there is QT, uh, graphical user interface, the old one, and then there is uh, 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 s s some person developing the web, uh, web interface for the join market. Also, join in box, which is like in console, like also kind of more user friendly interface. But uh, I myself, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not involved so much in, in, in those uh, UI projects, but I completely agree that we should improve, uh, no, we must improve the user experience, uh, f not only for join market, for using Bitcoin in private way in, in general. I was hoping you would mention that join market is available on some full node implementations, like Raspi Blitz. Ah, yeah, yeah, Raspi Blitz, uh, you can also, uh, there's guide uh, for Raspi Bolt and, and, and and I think others. I, yeah, that that I, I remember that web interface. I, I think it's called Jam. Uh, yeah. Oh, so the conclusion here is that join market it is not as hard to use as it used to be. It's no longer only command line. Am I right? I, I, I may actually also add, but that's not official. There is possibility that uh, some uh, wallets will have join market integration in the future too. I hope you heard that, Adam. <laughs> Ricardo, you work for Bitstamp right now, and used to, hmm? Bitfinex. Bitfinex. Yeah. Why did I, oh, never mind. You work for Bitfinex. I thought it was Bitstamp for some reason. I'm an idiot, anyway. Bitfinex is better than Bitstamp. They have Lightning Network. Bitstamp doesn't. Yeah, that, that's the big difference. So what can you tell us about the policies that Bitfinex has in terms of Bitcoin privacy? Can I send coin joined Bitcoin to Bitfinex and have no issues? Do I get flagged? What happens? Um, so again, that's, there's a misconception about coin join. So people think that every time that you are sending like coin join UTXOs to an exchange, then you're, you get automatically flagged. We ban you, we ask information, it's not like that. So as far as I know in Bitfinex, we don't categorize coin joins like bad. Okay, so when we are talking about compliance and we are talking about uh, um, like uh, how to, um, uh, to understand the origin of funds, there are different, um, let's say, um, anti-money laundering flags and checks that you can follow to like have an idea about your user, your user right? But in this case, in, in uh, Bitfinex, we don't say coin joins are bad, okay? For the same, and in the same way, for, for example, we, we enable like um, uh, liquid and lightning network deposit and withdrawals, and it's the same thing, right? At the end, we are not really uh, sure about the origin if, if uh, we receive like a payment from lightning network or from liquid, right? So again, the problem here is that I don't know why, I don't know what happened in the last few years, but it looks like CoinJoin is completely bad. CoinJoin must be banned. CoinJoin is uh, like uh, um, uh, allowing criminals to like do money laundering, but it's not like that at all because there are so many different ways to like uh, uh, improve your privacy in Bitcoin that at the end we should say, okay, everything is bad. Lightning is bad, liquid is bad, uh, coin swaps are, are bad. So again, I, I think it's, it's all about educating people here that they should try to improve their privacy. Uh, but I think the problem here is it's still too difficult to use this, uh, this software, right? So the learning curve is pretty huge. So you have to consider a lot of things when, when you're talking about privacy, and it's still bad. So I think that developers should start, uh, to, I mean, we should create 
software for final users. They shouldn't be, they shouldn't ask them, uh, themselves, what should I do, how should I do it, why should I do it? They should just say, okay, I, s I want to send uh, this amount to B, and the wallet should do everything, right? It's still too difficult, probably, for, the, for uh, end users, and there are not, like, standards. So imagine, like, I'm joining Bitcoin for the first time, and I hear about SegWit, Taproot, CoinJoin, um, I don't know, Swaps, uh, Lightning, and Liquid, you know, Mempool, Fees, UTXOs. I mean, it's really complex, right? It, it will take some years, but hopefully we'll be able to create, like, software for everyone. I mean, you, sh you shouldn't be, like, a, a nerd or a geek or a genius to use, like, a Bitcoin wallet. It should be simple, but it's still not simple, I think. You know, for, for a minute, you sounded as, as if you're about to announce a new wallet by Bitfinex, because you were like, you don't need to know that and that to use Bitcoin privacy. Anyway, I've been told that we only have a couple of minutes left, and I know that it's, this panel is just before lunchtime. I know that everyone is hungry. I just want to do a quick run and ask you a quick tip from each one of you about how the people in the audience can improve their privacy starting today. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and uh, not give any specific tip, uh, but more like uh, say that, that there is an uh, inherent tension between uh, good privacy uh, protections and convenience. So you have to be very mindful about every step you take and every tool that you use. Uh, by default, it's not going to respect your privacy. So you have to do the work. You have to do legwork, do the research, and find alternatives that, that, uh, where that, that is done by people and built in a way that protects your privacy. And it's gonna hurt a little bit, it's, it's gonna take some more time, but you should start reading upon this and, and care about this. And if you care about this, you have to you know, uh, be willing to take those steps and, uh, and forego some of that convenience. And that goes to social networks, that goes to uh, different tools, that goes to wallets maybe, so that's, that's, uh, that's, my, that's my tip. So I'm, I'm gonna get really practical here, but let me, let me reiterate what I just said in the beginning. Um, classifying Bitcoin wallets, anonymity, transparency, confidentiality. So most Bitcoin wallets are basically completely transparent, even your neighbors know what to do. Um, some of them have confidentiality, like Bitcoin mixers built into that. And there are two anonymous Bitcoin wallets, Join Market and Wasabi Wallet. If you prefer security, because join market is a full node, validating, right, don't trust verify, then you should use join market. If you prefer a frictionless user experience, then you should use Wasabi wallet. And everything else is either confidential or transparent. So that's the state of Bitcoin privacy. Uh, yeah, but improving the privacy, well, it depends on the, on the level of uh, users I could say to everybody just use join market all the time but uh, for most of the people I think the biggest gain in privacy is first when you buy bitcoins do it non KIC way like hodl hodl uh, and that improves privacy a lot and yeah join market school and and yeah and use lightning network whenever possible well I believe privacy is Privacy is like water in a bottle, and there are privacy holes in the bottle. And it doesn't matter if you fix all of them, if there is a single, single leak, all the water, all your privacy is going to leak out. So I do believe that if you're not using Joy Market or Wasabi, then eventually you might can be pseudonyms for a year or two years or 10 years, but eventually there will be a leak that will erode all of your privacy. Uh, just, yeah, well, to, sorry, uh, just to one, uh, add one thing about this, just because uh, um, I think you're right, but, uh, all right, yeah, just to, just to, just to um, that, that uh, you might get daunted by this. And that's, that's, that's a problem for a lot of people because you have to take one step and another step. I'm not talking about the, 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 uh, the Bitcoin thing, but generally about privacy. Uh, don't uh, willing to take that step and the next step and the next step because it's, it's better than doing nothing. So that's just, just, I wanted to add to that point. So I will be fast. 
uh, if you want to improve your privacy, you have to contribute to your favorite privacy projects out there because they need help, actually. So there are a lot of open source projects out there and they, are need, they, need, they need people. So if, you, if you're not a developer, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. You're good in marketing, help uh, your favorite privacy projects in marketing. Can you do some design? Do some design. I mean, we need people, guys. I mean, it's all about uh, uh, trying to, to build different uh, software and really we should try to do as much as we can. Uh, and you know, luckily there are people like Adam, uh, Christoph, me, and a lot of uh, developers out here. And not, not uh, I mean, not just developers, but also like other kind of uh, um, people that are working and trying to build something for everyone. But again, you know, let's work on it together and let's try to, to build privacy products together. Joy yeah, Market I, I needs a website. <laughs> yeah, and I agree to this, and by the way, and a lot of people maybe are not contributing because they think like, oh, I'm not a shadowy super coder. Uh, but uh, for example, in joint market, we, we, it would be very, very useful if people will just uh, test and review uh, even not only code, also documentation and stuff. We, we really lack people. Uh, also on, on, on that review and testing side. Uh, so I've been told to wrap it up, but it seems like we're just getting started. I think we're gonna do a podcast with the five of us and just I'm talk right. for f two hours. Thank you guys for listening and enjoy your lunch, I guess. Yeah, thank you for the moderation. Thanks. Thanks guys, thanks for the panel. Um, I won't keep you long. Obviously, we're going to lunch straight away. Um, just letting you know, we have to, we have to hard start at 3 o'clock, okay? So please be back at 3 o'clock. We won't be able to delay. We'll have to start exactly on time. So 3 o'clock. So enjoy your lunch, and I'll see you back here.
very familiar with Marty Bent. So Marty, welcome. And uh, we'll get, and uh, Marty can uh, get everyone else up. Thank you, Stefan. Let's give it up for Stefan. He's been uh, crushing it today. Um, as some of you may know, I'm very fascinated mining in the mining industry. This is a talk about mining. I'm going to be joined by Alex Petrov, Thomas Bakia, Jan Chapik, and Dr. Adam Back as well. Uh, gentlemen, let's, uh, let's hear for these guys. And for this discussion, considering who we have on stage here uh, and the experience they've had in the mining industry at the different layers, that's our conversation I had with Eric Voskul yesterday for about six hours. I thought it would be interesting to talk about uh, decentralization at the different layers of the Bitcoin mining stack. So you have actual geographic distribution of hash rate. You have uh, the pool layer where that hash rate is getting pointed to. How do we decentralize that layer? And then above the pool layer, sort of not materialized yet, but a lot of people think it will materialize is derivatives, uh, types of contracts for hash rate, how that could help distribute hash rate globally. So uh, I think we'll start with geographic distribution of hash rate. Uh, Adam, I know that you are working on some uh, mining uh, in here in the United States, and obviously you guys partnered with Square to do some mining as well. Considering the China ban and the exit from China uh, last year, what are your thoughts on the state of geographic distribution of hash rate right now? Um, yeah, I mean, you could, if you look at the uh, global hash rate, when the China ban happened, it was real this time. I mean, there were rumors about China batting Bitcoin and became a meme for many years, right? But finally they did, and the hash rate dropped, and it seems like quite a bit of that uh, came back in the US basically so the uh, geographic distribution changed and maybe the pools have a like Jan might have a, a better view on because the pools can get a view on IP addresses and where they're coming from that kind of thing but it certainly seemed like it changed quite a bit over that time yeah I mean that's a big meme in the US right now everybody's thinking all oh, the hash rates gonna go to Texas and there's a lot of people is that a good thing is that a bad thing what are your thoughts Thomas uh, I think the concentration is probably a, a bad thing over time. I mean, if there's plenty of cheap energy in Texas and, you know, the thought was that there was going to be a much more uh, welcoming uh, climate there. ERCOT, the manager, how do you describe ERCOT? The, the marketplace. Yeah, the, you know, market for Texas energy sort of did an about face on Bitcoin miners and made it a little bit less hospitable. So I think these concentrations, they kind of ebb and flow no matter what. Um, but North America still looks pretty attractive on the whole. Outside of North America, are you seeing anywhere uh, where mining's popping up where it wasn't before, Alex? Uh, so, once again, question is... Are you seeing mining popping up where it wasn't before um, since the China ban outside of the U.S.? Uh, so, according to my information, so uh, it was approximately 4.7 gigawatt of the mining uh, equipment and firms uh, migrating from China, uh, approximately 1.5 uh, trying to migrate to Kazakhstan, but there is no one out electricity and they was just false lead it. They sent the equipment, but normally you can use only 700 megawatts during the summertime and not able to use the rest during the winter. Some equipment was moved lately elsewhere to Russia or somewhere in Europe where they found sources. A lot of equipment immediately go to U.S. and Texas and booming Texas was take a lot of a lot as well. But the rest, it depends. So in some cases, uh, some miners will fail. Uh, it's still providing a lot of benefits for um, ecosystem because then you facing bankruptcy, you doesn't have money to move the equipment to establish a new like mining facility you're practically selling your equipment for, for half of a price and newcomers are able to buy equipment cheaper and it's like normal discount and all these differences gaming in the value of Bitcoin. Uh, but real distribution is in some cases is very hard to predict. The rush is never exposing how many megawatts we are using right now because the uh, legal status is not clean and they're using like different companies outside the Russia, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, like 
official res representative. Real distribution is like still mostly grasses for us. It's not even representative selection from the mining pool because they can see like VPN addresses or <coughs> some parts in different pools see different customers. The China pools, they're getting the specific customers. Euro pools, they're getting another specific customers and US pool getting another one uh, specific part of the customers and also legal part of the US. Yeah, Jan, at the pool level. To, to complement this, uh, in fact, after the China ban, we really had our uh, Chinese uh, mining endpoints completely useless, so we had to shut that, shut that down. Uh, we used to actually have uh, a publicly uh, provided information about the geographical distribution based on the endpoints where the miners do connect, but uh, we took it down uh, quite uh, a long time ago because it was basically giving hints to our competitors like where they can fish our customers. So, uh, but internally we, we still see the distribution. So you would see a big trend like of a lot of hash rate moving to the US and part of it uh, going to the uh, Russian area, uh, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan and so on. So now staying on the pool layer, moving uh, to decentralization at that layer, a big theme right now, Stratum V2. It is, uh, you guys are running it already in BOS Plus. How, what is the problem it solves and how will it uh, decentralize the, the mining pool layer uh, of the mining stack? Okay, oh, well, there are like few problems with, uh, with the existing mining protocol, which we call now Stratum V1. Uh, first of all, there's like no security. So basically the miner has to trust that it has connected to the uh, service endpoint of the pool that he believes is the, the correct one. If there is anybody in the middle, man in the middle attack, they can easily steal a uh, hash rate. In fact, like there are nice viruses for, for cheap uh, routers made in China that actually steal a little bit of hash rate. And if you're losing like two, three percent, you, you may not even notice. So so it's, it's done in a very smart way. So Stratum V2 tries to address this by providing a security layer. So basically uh, ev every connection from a miner to, towards the pool is uh, encrypted and it, the, the, the connection is basic, basically keeping the integrity of the data. So if anybody tries to interfere with the data, uh, the connection breaks down. So it has the same level of security as if you connect to your bank account through TLS, uh, HTTPS and so on. Um, then uh, the, uh, uh, the decentralization part, uh, we tried to outline in the Stratum V2 uh, proposal of a protocol where uh, a miner can actually negotiate its own or come up with its own uh, transaction uh, block template with, with its own set of transactions uh, and propose it to the pool uh, and mine on it. And at the same time, the benefit is that the pool would not if the miner finds a block, the, it would broadcast the results, obviously, to, to, uh, to the pool. But at the same time, since uh, the miner would have, uh, through the job distribution protocol, running locally uh, a small Bitcoin node, it can also broadcast the result of its work uh, locally. So that would improve uh, uh, this part of uh, the Bitcoin security, that it, you would not rely just on the pool to really broadcast such block, because in case of uh, some censorship, they could sort of say, okay, it's valuable to us more to censor this block and create that economical damage of not getting the reward, but we just made the censorship happen. So this is like an alternative uh, approach that could uh, allow, uh, you know, the, the miners uh, really be in charge of selecting the, the transactions and be able to broadcast the blocks that they find. Surely you also mentioned better hash? Um, the better hash, um, in fact, like this was like the first outline that Matt Carrello came up with. Um, and once we started discussing like all the tiny details, uh, the problem with better hash in a way was that it was like sort of like designed uh, from scratch, but without the experience of like running the, the actual pool. So we sat together with, with Matt and now he's actually a co-author of uh, Stratum V2. And uh, some of the ideas that we're outlining better hash are reflected in Stratum V2 and the other way around. Yeah, uh, so I'd add about just about the kind of fundamental problem that Stratum V2 is trying to solve is that if you look at it from, you know, what what is a, what service is a pool providing, it's trying to combat the phenomena that if you have, you know, one miner or 10 miners and you're solo mining, 
you're not going to find a block in a few years, and by that time the price could be very different, or you may never find any, any blocks during the life of the miner. And so it's like buying a lottery ticket in a pool, you will win more frequently at the same rate the pool does. And so they're reducing the randomness for you as a service and charging a fee. But the, um, the fundamental problem is that, you know, for a pool to provide a reasonable amount of randomness reduction, it has to have a reasonable amount of hash rate, and there's only 100% of the hash rate. And so there can only really be, you know, maybe 20 pools or you know, maybe a bit more. Um, and that's not a very big number for distribution, right? And some of them are larger, you know, they have 10% or more. And so with Stratum V2, it doesn't matter as much that there are few entities at the top level doing the averaging because you retain control. So I guess the other point is like, what's the problem with there being very few pools is that in today's protocols, they're choosing the transactions. And so if there are only, you know, 20 entities that could collude and censor a transaction, you're not very censorship resistant. So what's Stratum V2, which was, you know, an iteration on better hash and before that open hash. So it's a problem people have been looking at for a while. Um, what it does is it means that now you can get decentralization at the level of the uh, transaction producers, the miners, which is a lot more. I mean, most of the miners are probably, you know, running a megawatt plus, but there are people with fewer miners. But even a guy with one miner, he can like get lucky once in a while, find a transaction, choose the transactions that go into it, sorry, find a block and, and control it. So it greatly improves the protection against censorship. I think that's the point. Thomas, I know um, we've talked a lot about P2Pool in the past and that, and that sort of peer-to-peer -peer pool structure. Does anybody think something like that can make a resurgence moving forward? I mean, potentially. I mean, P2Pool is kind of interesting because it uses a peer-to-peer -peer protocol to do something similar. And um, I think the problem with P2Pool is its, its hash rate fell too low, and so it wasn't a good experience anymore. And it's... Um, it, it basically tries to pay everybody out in the Coinbase transactions, so it, there's no central entity that's accumulating a balance and paying it out pro rata with shares. So every block it tries to true up, and if that block is found, people get paid out. Um, yeah, I mean it, it's an interesting protocol. It could that could also be uh, redeveloped, you know, updated and brought back. I think there's a couple of choke points that are getting sort of like worrisome. It's not just the pools or the concentration. Like in US, uh, chip manufacturer options are pretty limited. We saw in, starting in 2020, 2021, these like gatekeepers, these like crypto prime brokers. So like a Foundry, Galaxy, Nidig, Anchorage, BlockFi, Celsius, buying out huge uh, amounts of hardware that's coming from the, the, um, the manufacturers. And then they're effectively the gatekeepers for ASIC lending agreements that go out into, I guess, the, the operators themselves. Um, it's going to take time for a lot of that bad debt to get worked out. Um, in the middle of 2021, probably $150 a terahash for some of these contracts, down south of 20. So we'll see some consolidation as large miners are able to see distressed pricing some of the biggest miners, if they have cash, are going to be able to take advantage of this situation. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit of a, uh, I went on a little bit of a tangent away from the pool stuff, but I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, disconcerting elements of centralization across the mining stack. No, I'm happy you went on that tangent because I didn't mention the layer below the hash rate production, which is the, the chip production. And obviously we have two major players uh, in the game right now with Bitmain and MicroBT. Bitmain produces their chips using TSMC, which predominantly produced in Taiwan, which is uh, obviously a very geopolitically hot topic right now. And then uh, MicroBT leverages Samsung, which produces their chips in South Korea. And so we've recently had new entrants, like in, and Bitfury uh, has created chips as well. And we've had entrants like Intel get into the game. We've heard about Foundry boundaries being built on U.S. soil and elsewhere throughout the world. Uh, is this chip production the, the most centralizing part of the Bitcoin mining stack right now, in your opinion? I think you hit the point. I think this is actually the really the weak point of, of the mining industry is that we are still, even though the landscape is now changing dramatically, especially in 2022, 
uh, until now, like nobody was really talking about this danger when you look at it, like when you, when you see the, uh, the structure of uh, the mining hardware that is out there and that essentially secures uh, our network. Uh, it's kind of scary that you basically have uh, two companies uh, that were able to make it through the last 10 years. There were more companies producing miners before, but most of them went bankrupt. Um, it's, it's also interesting to dig a little bit into the details, like why, for example, Bitmain was like so super successful. There was this famous affair about ASIC boost that was actually uh, giving an, an advantage to, to uh, the manufacturer, but it was not like really publicly known information and they would never like admit it. So like these tiny details like shape the landscape of, of the mining manufacturing. Uh, and now nowadays it's finally changing, but then when you look at the detail, uh, the mining machines nowadays are using the cutting edge technology that's in the latest cell phones, Apple, MacBooks, whatever, and they are essentially competing for these resources with those big companies, and we technically have only two physical foundries in the world that are able to produce this cutting edge hardware, and that's, that's of a risk. Well, and I, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think another development a few years back is, um, apart from Samsung and TSMC, Global Foundries ha produces ASICs, and they dropped out of the seven nanometer, like they, they abandoned their seven nanometer fab process. So that was one less player that was keeping up with the cutting edge. Uh, obviously, it's a cost problem. As the foundries get more advanced processes, the cost of building a fab increases and so there's been shrinking. I think one of the Chinese uh, manufacturers is slowly catching up because currently there's no kind of latest advanced process node manufacturer in China, but they're getting closer so they might eventually be able to do that. Um, and I think the one other new thing is in Intel was mentioned that Intel is historically only making chips for themselves. Intel CPUs and other Intel chips. They weren't doing contract manufacture like TSMC and uh, Samsung do, but they some reasonably recently announced that they would enter that space. Uh, so I, d I, don't, I don't think they're active yet, but the prospect that they might is interesting to go from a centralization factor of two to three, maybe to four when China catches up. But it's, it's not an area where you can compete if you're not on the same class of uh, advanced process. You know, you can't compete with a 5 nanometer with a 10 nanometer. It just won't work. I would like to add a couple of points because the chip design and uh, also chip manufacturing is part of my knowledge and experience and also great. So uh, for 10 nanometers, there is like seven factories existing in the world. So two factories belonging to Intel and Intel, like some, uh, like Adam was mentioned, really was closed factory, uh, fab line manufacturing quality for Intel internally. But because the CEO of uh, the Intel was changed, and right now there is another one person who is thinking more openly they would like to decrease the cost of a production, uh, making their fab lines more open, and they already manufacture free chips during this year, free mining chips. By the way, Binanza 1, Binanza 2, and one more what is not released yet. Uh, the Samsung is also manufacturing 10 nanometers, and a lot of miners also came in from a Samsung, not just this year, but last five years. Inner Silicon was using also Global Foundry and Samsung as well, and they manufacturing a lot of miners, and maybe for you, the market is looking like there is only two players right now, but they are huge players, but for, uh, 2021, there is 22 manufacturing companies who are manufacturing their own mining chips, who are manufacturing their own mining equipment. A lot of them is doesn't sound like something for you, like hippo miners, like beer miners, like uh, uh, gray miners, and many, many else of China, uh, uh, China manufacturing, what doesn't have the adequate, the uh, English names, but they are manufacturing for their own customers in the small volumes. And this is all specific of the chip manufacturing and also mining equipment. You cannot manufacture like huge amount for mining. It's self-regulated area. 
below some limits. If you're manufacturing more, you will not earn more money. You will just spend. In result, it will be your losses. It's limited, mathematically limited. And this is a beauty of Bitcoin because you can not <coughs> overproduction or you cannot overspend the electricity. It's self-regulating. And also what was mentioned, and I would like to be try to be short, about the small nanometer technology chips and fabrication, uh, the smaller nanometers we get, the more expensive fabrication la uh, lines became. And just to get the profitable factory, they are not building a lot of the factories because we, we should load them 99% to get the return of the investment. The other was mentioned, Global Foundry was closed seven nanometers only because they perform all the researches of seven nanometers, but they decide to combine and sell all their researches for Samsung for manufacturing seven nanometers. And Global Foundry decided to uh, jump exactly to five nanometers and skip seven nanometers because for them it's very high cost. And staying on this same tip with ASIC manufacturing, I mean, the concept of ASIC commodification is a reoccurring theme in the Bitcoin mining space. We're hitting uh, crazy levels of efficiency from a joules per terahash per perspective. Do you guys think we we reach a, a point where ASICs are essentially commodified uh, and widely accessible to the masses, helping with decentralization? Thomas, you want to We're, well, I guess uh, we're seeing, uh, like, let's say, starting version of this in, in the form of when, when somebody wants to buy the mining hardware, they essentially prepay it, and it's sort of like a forward contract that he can get rid of. But this still is not like the fully featured commodification of the ASICs. And it, it is very a nice analogy if you think about the ASIC chip af, as if you were growing crops, because technically the, the wafers are really growing in the foundry, and you cannot speed up the process, you just have to wait. Uh, so that it would be interesting if really we would have the, the market and, and the ASICs would be commodified. So you as a, as a manufacturer of the mining hardware, not of the chips, would place your orders because you want to get your crops or ASICs in this case delivered in January when your PCBs whatever are ready and in case you mess things up you can still sell those contracts. So it would be really interesting to get to the point where we had this market. Yeah I mean I think to just to be explicit today it's quite difficult to buy ASICs without the miner. So most of the people manufacturing ASICs are putting them in their own manufactured miner and so I guess a different layer of uh, sort of area where there's a centralization question is the uh, manufacturer of uh, miners too. So you mentioned a few companies. So most of them are based in China. Bit, bit Fury obviously is not. Um, but you know it's interesting to see more global, different supply chains um, manufacturing. You know the boards and then power supplies and the finished miner, even if the separately from the foundry, because the foundries are the foundries there, you know, you can't, it's very expensive to build a new foundry. So, you know, if you put that problem to one side, it's still interesting to build a, a miner somewhere else in Europe or in the US or Israel or somewhere, right? Um, and so there are a few initiatives to, to try to do that. You know, I mean, Blockstream is one of them, but there are multiple projects trying to do that at the moment. Secondary market's been pretty interesting over the last uh, couple quarters. Um, it's actually pretty robust right now. Uh, it's an opaque market, it still is taking shape, but as we see a lot of miners go bust and send their equipment back to either those gatekeepers I was talking about, the Galaxies, Nidigs, um, from a ASIC lending perspective. Um, but there are also marketplaces that are popping up, Luxor, and Kaboom Racks, and other ones that have been, you know, I think doing a fair amount of business. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of like loose telegram trading going on too. Yeah, it's, uh, I would say it's in the early phases of its formation. It still is not like a, a mature marketplace, but there, um, there's a lot of distressed pricing. I would imagine that's putting a lot of pressure on the primary market, the manufacturers selling directly to miners because there's pretty attractive spot deals right now. They don't have to have that future delivery. They can go out and you know, maybe they'll take a little bit of a hit on the health of the equipment. Maybe there'll be some loss or whatever, but um, uh, I think it's uh, slightly more attractive for miners to go that direction right now. 
Um, but uh, that could flip in a heartbeat. If something happens to one of the large foundries, one of the large manufacturers, if there's sort of like a, a geopolitical situation that causes a disruption for new hardware, that secondary market's going to evaporate like overnight. Uh, I think you, you mentioned also secondary market, and this is really critical key point. I think the uh, absence of a legal regulation and also huge misunderstanding from the some governmental level, but um, the equipment uh, is also depressing, losing, uh, losing a lot of its value during the time. Uh, creating huge barriers because you need pay taxes, then you're importing and exporting uh, the equipment. Uh, I, I saw a lot of the people who are trying to sell miners and a lot of the interest in from different countries, but then they're starting calculating, uh, calculating all the export and import taxes. It became absolutely not financially like reasonable just to perform it because all the governments try, try to collect their taxes, but they doesn't think about is it profitable or not? And in reality, it's creating quite complex space, importing from like Asia to US or from Asia to Europe. Uh, it's not reasonable. You can mostly buy the secondary equipment only inside, but just to find the proper seller and proper volumes, it's a very complicated task. And so moving to a layer above, with hash rate derivatives, and this is something that you're also fascinated with, Thomas. What, what do you think? I mean, this is something that's been talked about for years in the Bitcoin mining space. When will hash rate, uh, not just the, the A6, but the actual hash rate they're producing, be commodified and openly tradable in, in secondary markets? So uh, in traditional mining markets and energy markets, you always had this like third prong to raising capital where you sell production forward. and that exists to some level for Bitcoin miners today, but what we've seen is the formation of some rudimentary hash rate derivatives take shape ahead of a spot market for hash rate. So when that happens in commodity markets, you have lots of dislocation and terrible terms around you know, price, quantity, duration, and having a, a, a contract that you know, buyers and sellers can really understand. When you're selling hash rate forward, and you have to price one, let alone multiple compounding difficulty adjustments. It's kind of a nightmare. Um, but there's clearly, you know, a lot of demand for this. Like the debt window right now for miners are largely closed for most miners. Um, you know, we're not seeing uh, uh, the, the big, you know, sort of orders coming out of those, those gatekeeper, gatekeepers that I mentioned before. Um, so you know, being able to sell production forward for a small miner that's looking to upgrade, you know, their facility or even a new miner is going to become an increasingly important, you know, decentralizing component for the industry. Yeah. And Adam, you guys have been working on this at Blockstream too with your hash rate token. How, how do you see this market moving forward? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a long-term instrument compared to what you were describing there, but it's a three-year term products. The difference from... A hash rate contract is that it's uh, tradable and standardized, i.e. fungible. So even though we've had eight tranches of it sold, the tokens are financially fungible because, you know, if the ones we issued six, this, this, uh, the first tranche started in uh, mining in July last year, and um, it's mined, I think, about 4.7 Bitcoin per unit at the moment. It was a 200,000 euro uh, unit with 2,000 terahash uh, per unit. Um, and um, so what what happens is that as we add more units, we buy the Bitcoin equivalent that's already been mined by the existing units. And so if, you, if you're a unit holder, it doesn't dilute your anti-dilute. And uh, so yeah, it's just a, a kind of securitized version of uh, buying hash rate um, where I think some of the previous hash rate contracts were maybe not as tradable, or the hash rate contracts that you can buy are typically shorter term, like three months, six months, that kind of thing. Whereas this has got a common maturity date for a collection of hash rate contracts. Yeah, and this is uh, another interesting question, like will these contracts be cash settled or physically settled? And this is something I'm very interested to hear. 
Yeah, so these, these are, you could choose to receive the Bitcoin or the Euro equivalent, uh, your choice at maturity. And of course, if you, you know, as, as the holder, you could also sell it a day before maturity and then you don't even have to take delivery, right? Because somebody will buy it and receive it later. And then, Jan, do you think about this from the pool perspective at all? If these products developed and they're physically delivered, setting up a structure where people could point the contract hash to, to Brains well, Pool, excuse me. I will probably add a few technical notes. It's important to realize that the mining infrastructure has to be ready for the commodic commodification act of the hash rate. And what I mean by this, uh, just imagine a simple example that uh, you have a hash rate producer, basically a miner in North America, and somebody who is interested in getting the hash rate buys, buys the contract, but that person is, um, let's say, based in eastern part of the globe, uh, and he is into terminating that hash rate uh, also in his geographical location and it would be super inefficient to try to really ship the shares and the, the mining jobs across the globe um, so you need to get into a similar situation as what you have with the current electricity market so basically the one who is selling the 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 hash rate it doesn't necessarily mean that the physical hash rate is delivered across the globe but you need to find another source that is also participating in the market and like sort of do an accounting game as you go this is how it's the same thing with electricity if you sell if you if you're owner of a power plant and you sell the electricity you don't deliver it across the globe you deliver it to the local grid but but the rest is the accounting game around it so we need to sort of get there uh, to prevent inefficiencies, because physically it is possible to send the hash rate across the globe, but you would face um, inefficiency that you wouldn't like to see. The latencies would not and be very, very favorable to it. And much, much higher risks, what existing in reality. So, uh, Jan mentioned a very critical point. So, uh, the same way, like the miners using the Christie, what they doesn't really notice quite closely, because it doesn't think about numbers. So. When you're building the city and you need a uh, power source, if it's like hydro energy, it can be like 200 uh, or 800 kilometers away from the city because you are not choosing the dump to be built closer to the city. It uh, can be dictated by geography, by multiple obstacles. But the energy what you're sending from hydroelectric station to city, uh, you're losing huge part of electricity during transition. Uh, in Europe, it can be approximately 60-80% uh, of the energy, what you're losing in transit. Uh, in uh, US, uh, because it's higher temperature, and wire in higher temperature losing and providing more resistance, you can lose 20-25% of electricity. What the miners do, they build their mining location closer to energy sources, increasing the efficiency, avoiding to lose the electricity and providing the better balance. But the same, absolutely the same, we can mention about the uh, hash rate traffic, what you're sending across the internet. It's not just the distance. The distance is creating delay. Yeah, it's a little bit less profitable, but you're also creating a huge risk because the internet is not stable. It can drop down. For you, it's direct losses. And you should keep all that numbers in mind just to build properly like all the infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, usually when people are buying a hash rate, they have the option to give their own pool account. And so they will be able to monitor the hash rates being delivered. And I think sometimes they um, uh, sort of give some guarantee. So, you know, if you bought a pet hash and over the month it's a little bit less, they'll provide the difference or something. So there's usually some kind of uh, assurance buffer, like maybe 10% or something. At least the people in the middle who are sort of reselling the hash rate demand that of the hash rate seller so that the hash rate buyer gets, you know, one pair of hash if they bought one pair of hash because the actual output of miners varies with temperature or failures and things. I think we got to wrap up here, Seth. Yeah. yeah, I think we got um, five minutes left, Lake. So we've been talking about this market. Uh, and the structure, let's just assume that the structure materializes and there is a robust secondary market for this hash rate. It's obviously growing. You're all uh, working on products that are bringing this to market. What happens when it's fully fleshed out? What does this mean for the decentralization of mining? You know, what does it afford players to do? I think it's access to capital. It, 
young miners or new miners or expanding miners don't have to sell more equity or, or you know, have access to large debt facilities. Um, so it's more optionality there. It's more predictable um, uh, revenue streams if they're able to. Once we have some of the market infrastructure developed a little bit further, we'll be able to better partition, let's say, like difficulty risk, you know, transaction fee volatility risks embedded within hash rates. So it just makes everybody, you know, better, faster, stronger. Yeah, I think one other novel thing about the uh, Blockstream mining notes is that it's kind of deleveraged. So a lot of people are, you know, if they've got a million dollars to do some mining with in a, in a small company, they will, you know, buy a million dollars off the miners and then they will sell Bitcoin to pay the electricity bills uh, f until they run out of useful life and then they'll buy new miners. And what, what we did at Blockstream, we did some prop mining, like mining in the company and modeling of that. We decided that it's probably better to, you know, do half a million dollars worth of miners and set aside the money to pay the power bills and not sell any Bitcoin. Because what tends to happen is in the bear market, when you're selling Bitcoin, you're selling like 80 or 90% of it to cover the power bills. And that's when you're mining the most Bitcoin. And if your aim over the long term is to have more Bitcoin, it's counterintuitively better to buy less miners but keep all of the Bitcoins than to buy as many miners as you can and then sell Bitcoin to cover the, mire, the power. Or what some people have done is go even higher leverage and actually go to leverage and borrow money against the miners and then they have to basically sell Bitcoin to pay the interest payments as well, um, uh, which can add to this uh, kind of uh, distress situation where people are not just affected by the Bitcoin price, but they're affected by the leverage they took on. You will be surprised. I already did the search, but to how many months you should keep in reserve for electricity to just to be profitable in uh, uh, decrease the risk of bankruptcy. So six months and seven months is like most profitable one. If you're keeping like for two months, uh, it, it will, uh, I was using like historical data from 2011. Uh, and uh, because of variation of the difficulty, because also the uh, variation of the electricity price, if you able to pay only last month for electricity bill, then your risk is much higher and possibly because the Bitcoin price can be down, you can lose approximately 25, 24% of your profit. If you're able to pay from your own pocket for two, three months, then it's missing, uh, meaning you can also uh, decrease your losses and increase your profit profitability. But if you're keeping like six, seven months, then it's possibly you can keep Bitcoins for a longer time during the beer market and then sell it lately, successfully pay for electricity and also decrease your risk of bankruptcy, finally. That's a normal strategy, it's working, but not a lot of people are really thinking from that point. Like you mentioned, people who like just starting the business, they doesn't know how it's really working, they doesn't understand all the models, and here I think the secondary market can help quite seriously because even when you're selling like secondary equipment it's making mining felt like business more open because people can invest less money perform experiment at home better understand how it's working and better improve strategy when they're going for full market or full, full in building huge business yeah especially this year given the dumpster fire that took place with uh, some of the like leverage in the market um, treatment of collateral is going to be, you know, I think uh, uh, tremendously important, ongoing, evolving issue for miners, the collateral, whether it's the ASICs or the Bitcoin itself. Um, I think this ultimately is going to be an advantage for the U.S. because of the legal and the capital markets infrastructure that's already in place for mining operations to take advantage of um, uh, uh, being able to, to lever up more effectively. Um, but you know, leverage kills too, so it'll be interesting. Well, gentlemen, it's been a, a fascinating conversation. I want to thank you for all the work you guys are doing in the space and um, uh, for riffing on these topics. It's very, very interesting. Mining is an extremely deep rabbit hole, uh, and these guys have been falling down it for some time. So let's give it up for, for the panel.
Hello, everyone. Um, conference organizers were very kind to provide frequently used words in Bitcoin Twitter in 2022, and this word is contagion. While for Bitcoin base layer code is low, this doesn't apply to custodial platforms or trusted third parties, which are owned and managed by private entities. Trusted third parties are, in fact, security holes. This was true before Bitcoin, and it's still true. Now let's talk about recent facts and numbers. This is only a part of the platforms that have suffered from contagion 2022, but the worst part is actually that their users were affected. Now, Celsius alone had lost 60, more than 60,000 Bitcoin of customer funds, but the ultimate question is why do people actually trust their Bitcoin to custodian services and give up on their keys? We actually at HODL HODL and other our projects ask this question every, every once in a while. So I guess it's because of the yield and because most people actually just want to have free money without doing anything. Yet not many understand how yield is generated. And if you don't understand how yield is generated, this probably means you are the yield which effectively means that your Bitcoin is used for risky investments and it's only a matter of time when the house of cards will start falling down. One of the reasons why people use Bitcoin to earn yield is because they don't understand how valuable and unique Bitcoin actually is. They treat Bitcoin as any other asset, while Bitcoin itself is a super asset. It is highly liquid, traded 24-7, programmable, ever easy transferable, peer-to-peer, -peer, scarce, decentralized, and many more options and features. But Bitcoin is not only super asset, it's also a super collateral. While for the last 10 years the market has been focusing on trading Bitcoin, I think it's time to shift our attention to another important use case for Bitcoin as a collateral asset. Now why Bitcoin is a super collateral? Well, first of all, liquidity. Bitcoin can be traded 24-7. This means if you're a lender, for example, and you want to liquidate the loan, then you will be able to convert your collateral into fiat almost instantly. Bitcoin is also programmable. You can create different lending products and ownership mechanisms with your Bitcoin. This actually allows you to solve problems of trusted third parties to some extent. Your collateral is getting more valuable over the course of the time, which means that there's less incentive for you to sell it. And it's actually more lenders that are willing to accept it. Bitcoin allows you to show full transparency of your assets when it's needed, but it also allows you to be fully anonymous when you want. In case of the lending, you can easily prove to the lender that you actually have assets to borrow. And ownership. You have keys to your Bitcoin just like you have a keys to your house, your car. Bitcoin is actually your personal property. The crucial problem with modern Bitcoin lending platforms is that you have to trust them. You have to give up on the ownership of your collateral, and when you do it, your assets become someone, become someone else. Just like four horses of apocalypse, modern Bitcoin lending has four main issues that must be addressed. Number one, collateral ownership. You need to give up on your ownership rights of collateral in order to use the vast majority of existing lending platforms. Number two, rehypothecation. Gotta hate that word. Are you ready to risk Bitcoin for 2% annual yield? Are you ready to risk your whole stack in order to borrow for a bit lower borrowing rate? Is it worth it? When you send your coins to someone else's wallet, ask yourself these questions. Middleman. Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Once again, peer-to-peer. Yet most lending platforms act as a middleman between liquidity providers and borrowers. You basically have a centralized platform and you need to play by its rules. And global liquidity. Most lending platforms are highly liquid in certain markets, but they are liquid or even not operating in the majority of other countries. However, there are platforms that have solved most of these issues, at least to some extent. We have non-custodial lending platforms on the market where your Bitcoins are stored in multisig to which you have one of the keys and none of the participants have full control over the collateral. These platforms partially solve issue of collateral ownership. They fully solve replication problem and middleman problem. 
but what they lack is global liquidity, meaning that their liquidity is limited and not comparable with custodial lending platforms. So the ultimate question is how and where we can take so much needed liquidity. I believe that the answer is traditional finance. If we will onboard banks to the Bitcoin standard, this will be the next step. big step money evolution and next step in Bitcoin adoption. I believe that we need to educate bankers about Bitcoin, how unique and valuable this asset is, and we need to onboard them to the Bitcoin standard. Would it be great if your local bank could be able to lend you out money in your local currency against your Bitcoin? Would it be great if you could hold your keys to your collateral, have full transparency and no risk of being rehabilitated? Bitcoiners have tools and knowledge and bankers have liquidity. As of the end of 2021, 15 largest U.S. banks hold 30.4 trillion in assets, which is like almost 10 times bigger than the whole crypto market valuation. Of course, none of these assets are liquid, uh, but these are only 15 banks from the U.S., and the global liquidity held by banks, funds, tra funds, traders is far more bigger than we can imagine. So how do we onboard banks to the Bitcoin standard? First of all, okay, by showing them a use case that every banker understands, lending. Lending business is simple yet profitable. Bankers love lending. And actually banking started as a lending business. The banking industry in its modern form was born in 14th century Europe with bankers funding trading operations. Second of all, you need to show them the money. Bitcoiners are not ready to sell. We can pay more for that opportunity to hold our Bitcoin and to borrow against that. We like to huddle and we understand the value of Bitcoin. Finally, you need to have a solution and it's crucial to onboard banks to Bitcoin. It's crucial to give them a proper understanding of some core values. We need to onboard them to non-custodial Bitcoin only services where they will be able to directly interact with their peers. This solution should be globally available and it should be easy to use. We provide technology, they give us liquidity. With all that said, I would like to reveal a new Bitcoin-based lending platform for institutional lenders, Debify. Debify will have an interface and features suitable for institutional customers, allowing any institution to become a lender and accept Bitcoin collateral and use new type of smart contracts with four keys. This platform will finally allow us to match global institutional liquidity with Bitcoiners. But what makes it so special? First of all, it's non-custodial. Debify will use multi-six for collateral storage with consensus mechanism three out of four. Every time the contract is created on the platform, it will create a unique escrow on a public Bitcoin blockchain with four keys that will be equally distributed between lender, borrower, platform, and fourth key holder. In order to move funds from the escrow, you will have to have at least three keys out of the four. Secure. As I mentioned, the platform will be non-custodial. Debify will allow you to use hardware wallet to store your keys to the escrow. We're also building a special application that will hold your keys on a standalone device even if you don't have a hardware wallet. And furthermore, with the new consensus mechanism, even if the lenders and borrower keys are somehow compromised, it is still not enough to move funds from the escrow. There will be, of course, no middlemen. Lenders and borrowers will interact with each other directly, meaning there will be no person to charge extra fees and more importantly there will be more options to negotiate a better deal with your peers. For banks there will be no need to build their own technical solution. We will offer simple and reliable service with fast and easy onboarding for every bank. Furthermore with our API companies will be able to create their own lending products on top of it. And of course the platform will be more trustless or I would say trust minimized. You don't need to trust the platform itself because even if we try to collude with your counterparty, we won't be able to move collateral. Fourth key holder is actually acting as an independent and neutral part of the contract protecting both lenders and borrowers. Now about the fourth key holders. Uh, we have managed for now to partner with several companies that have confirmed that they're going to be a fourth key holders for this platform and they will be also our technical part partners. Our technical partners in this new venture are Blockstream, Casa Hodel, and Gen3. The list of the fourth key holders actually is going to be expanded 
is going to be bigger at some point creating an opportunity for lenders and borrowers to choose their backup key holder. Our initial liquidity providers will be XBTO and Bitfinex with more companies and financial institutions joining later. We will launch the platform with stablecoin loans and will add fiat loans in the first six months of operations. We would also like to announce that we have successfully closed the pre-seed funding round and would like to thank our lead investor in this round, 1031. Thank you. The platform itself will be launched in Q1 2023 and you can already go to debify.com and sign up for news and updates. And I would like to finish my presentation with uh, quoting one of the speakers that were on stage before me, Marty Band. Uh, it is time to make Bitcoin a super collateral and provide it with infrastructure it actually deserves. Thank you very much. I hope it wasn't too boring, guys. Um, one small thing. We're also opening Debify Lounge, and if you want to learn more you can come there grab some goodies play some games and enjoy thank you very much max we'll uh, just give it a few minutes before our next one starts at four o'clock guys One, two, one, two.
All right, everybody, I'm sure it's the event everybody's been uh, waiting for. So we are now going to have a Q&A. Uh, so we're going to have uh, the host of the Once Bitten podcast, Bitcoin uh, educator and uh, author, uh, Daniel Prince, come up and do a Q&A with the one and only Michael Saylor. Now, one, just one quick note, there will be some Q&A, but uh, just because of the, uh, the recent lawsuit, that's uh, one topic that we're just going to say is off limit. is focused on Bitcoin acquisition. And uh, every quarter we do thousands of transactions. Uh, one of them or two of them is oftentimes a Bitcoin transaction and all the other transactions are software transactions. So the, the software business has been run by Fong, who is the president of the company for the past uh, few years. And that's 99% of the transaction and the labor of the company. And uh, it makes sense for the CEO of the company to be the person that's running 99% of the business. So that's the labor intensive part of the business. And the plan has always been for Fong to be the CEO of that. I've been grooming him for that job since about 2018. And uh, after about two years in the president role, we decided it made sense to make him the CEO. My role is as chairman and as executive chairman, I'm, I'm still a full-time employee of the company, but I focus upon the Bitcoin part of the business. And so that means once a quarter, we may do a finance transaction or we may do a, uh, a Bitcoin acquisition transaction. And, and uh, those things are managed by the investments committee of the board of directors. And I'm the head of the investments committee. And of course, as the chairman of the board, I'm, I'm uh, in charge of the board of directors. And I, I remain the controlling shareholder of the company. So my role is primarily to focus upon the balance sheet and the strategy. I've got, uh, I do some operational work now focused upon some, uh, some lightning development that we've been working on. So I'm focused upon the Bitcoin side of the software business and finance transactions and Bitcoin, but Fong really is running the software business and, uh, and this is a, it's a good career step for him to do that. And it makes room for our new CFO, Andrew Kang, who uh, joined the company in May. Uh, the CFO in April was Fong. So Fong moved uh, back in like August of 2020, the company had an enterprise value of approximately $660 million and uh, didn't really have any active investments. And now the enterprise value of the company has ballooned by a factor of not quite 10, but, uh, but many, many, many billions of dollars. And we have a much more sophisticated balance sheet where we have, uh, we have convertible debt and we have senior secured debt and we have a Bitcoin backed loan and, and we have other financing opportunities and activities. So it makes sense to have uh, a CFO that's full-time and dedicated and, uh, Fong really couldn't be that dedicated CFO because he was also serving as the president of the company. So what we've done is I think matured as a business and it allows us to move forward and more aggressively pursue the software business as well as more aggressively pursue the Bitcoin strategy. Well, yeah, my enthusiasm right now is uh, for lightning development. I really think the most exciting thing going on in the world of technology is the lightning protocol. The ability to move Bitcoin, you know, at the speed of light, friction free, uh, no transaction or, or de minimis transaction cost. And the, all, the, the appeal of lightning is not just that you could scale up Bitcoin to billions of people. And it's not just that you can drive the transaction cost to near nothing, but also um, the ethos of Bitcoin is, is go very carefully and, and uh, don't move fast on the base layer without universal consensus. 
but in lightning you can move much more aggressively developing functionality and you and you can take more risks with the lightning protocol and you can take more risks with the applications that are on top of lightning and uh, build more functionality and build more performance than uh, you can in the underlying bitcoin layer so microstrategy has got some R&D projects going on right now where we're working on uh, enterprise applications of Lightning, enterprise Lightning wallets, enterprise Lightning servers, enterprise authentication, things that would, um, yeah, things that would appeal to a company. If you wanted to roll out Lightning uh, to 100,000 employees in a day, right? How would you do it? If you wanted to give a lightning wallet to 10 million customers overnight, how would you do it? And uh, we've got a lot of, a lot of uh, enterprise development uh, capability in that area because we've been doing enterprise software for 30 years. And so we're working to marry our enterprise software development with the lightning opportunity it's still, I would, I would characterize it as R and D stage. It's still early days because we need to see, you know, what comes out of it, what products evolve and whether they're commercially viable and, and how it will be received by the market. So um, I'm not really ready to announce anything more concrete than that, but uh, I do think uh, that the future it, uh, the future of the Bitcoin network, all the future technology innovation is uh, lightning based and uh, and anybody that can actually develop software applications that integrate with a lightning protocol has an extraordinary opportunity. That's where I'd be focusing my my venture capital and my investment right now. Been pretty much two years since uh, since you announced made the announcement of going into Bitcoin with MicroStrategy. What's changed for you uh, the most, do you think, uh, personally, your views to, uh, towards Bitcoin, towards finance, towards uh, the legacy system? I think that uh, our, when we first embraced Bitcoin, it was a defensive strategy. Uh, we were trying to avoid getting destroyed by the inflation that was coming. And we realized that we couldn't just sit with $500 million of cash uh, on the balance sheet. So the, I mean, the first, the first view was how do we avoid having our treasury assets melt away in a market that's just getting increasingly difficult and hostile. I think that the second stage was opportunistic. Uh, Bitcoin's an extraordinary opportunity and um, and we can uh, increase the size of our balance sheet and we can do some interesting things like issue convertible debt in order to acquire Bitcoin. And uh, and we can build uh, up uh, an interesting business that we didn't really know was there before. I think the third uh, stage is really strategic, right? The Bitcoin strategy where we're going to acquire and hold Bitcoin, you know, consistently. Uh, aggressively whenever we see um, an opportunity that makes sense for the shareholders. So that that's the corporate, uh, the corporate evolution. I would say uh, from a personal philosophical point of view, um, I started looking for uh, a better goal than gold, uh, a digital gold, a store of value. And, and uh, I would say that's like, uh, you know, I describe different types of investors. You've got the deniers, people don't believe that Bitcoin is real. You've got the skeptics, you know, people that, uh, you know, that uh, just don't uh, don't think it's going to work. They think the government's going to ban it. And then you've got the traders, who think it's a it's an uncorrelated asset or it's a correlated asset. I would say I came in as a trader. Uh, this is a uncorrelated asset, and it doesn't make sense to invest the company's treasuries in the stock market, or invest the company's treasuries in art collections, or invest the company in in real estate. So here's a here's an asset that it makes sense to invest in. I think that that's stage three. Stage four is to be a technocrat, 
that's when you say, oh, this is a digital monetary asset and it's a digital monetary network. And, uh, and I can use it to move money on a Saturday morning. How do you move a hundred million dollars on a Saturday morning from London to Tokyo, right? H how do I put money on an iPhone or an Android phone? And so when you become a technocrat, you start to see it as a, as a monetary network, just like Google's an information network or YouTube is an entertainment network or, or Facebook is a social network. And so I think I, I kind of evolved from the trader mentality to the technocrat mentality. But if you spend enough time on Bitcoin, eventually you find your way to be to stage five and stage five is Bitcoin maximalist. And I define Bitcoin maximalist as someone that thinks that Bitcoin is an instrument of economic empowerment. I mean, I think Jack Dorsey stated that most eloquently and first. He said, Bitcoin is an instrument of economic empowerment. So it's not, not that far. You know, once you say it's a, it's a digital asset that runs on a smartphone, the very next thing that follows is, wow, um, I can give a bank to 8 billion people and I can give property rights to 8 billion people. All they got to have is a $50 Android phone and uh, download an app. It'll take about 60 seconds. So I, th I think that, that uh, when you're a technocrat, you start saying, well, you know, YouTube is, uh, is entertainment for free to the world. And, you know, Facebook is what it is. It's, it's a, the friend network and Twitter is that speech network. And you get kind of interested in those companies, Twitter and Facebook and Google and Apple. But you also go through this process uh, where you say, well, do I trust Google more than I trust Alibaba? And do I trust WeChat or Tencent more than I trust Twitter? Do I trust any of these companies because they're run by individuals and they're subject to nation state capture and maybe they'll be censored and maybe there's a limit to what they can put on their platform. And maybe if you put the wrong thing on the platform, it'll get ripped off the platform. And so it, it's hard to, it's hard to have a philosophical, ideological commitment uh, to a company that has a digital network because you've always got politics. And so the, the most I could be as a technocrat when it comes to investing in Google or Apple or Twitter or Facebook or Alibaba. And I can't really go beyond being a technocrat. But if I could take uh, a digital network and I could eliminate the company, and I could eliminate the management team, and if I could eliminate the, the, the country, the nexus, and the headquarters, and I could decentralize it, and I could give it as a gift to uh, every nation, and every company, and every person, and every family, everywhere in the world, then you can transcend the technocrat stage. You can become a maximalist, because now you can say, this is utilitarian, egalitarian entitlement to 8 billion people. We have the ability uh, to give property rights to 8 billion people. We have the ability to deploy a digital monetary network to 8 billion people. We can, uh, we can give it as a gift to the world, just like giving them steel, electricity, fire, math, right? Uh, water, clean air, right? So I, I would say that you know, I, I didn't have a need for Bitcoin in February of 2020. In March of 2020, I had a need, right? That was a catalyst. You stumble around and you discover digital gold a la Bitcoin. And uh, we entered the market in August as traders. We evolved into technocrats as we started to appreciate the power of, of the protocol. And uh, eventually you graduate to maximalist when you realize that it's, it's not just a good technical idea. It's an, a, it's an essential entitlement to the human race. And so I, I would say now I just, uh, I view my role as maximalist, what I want. And I don't get caught up in all the other definitions of maximalist and what, what do people think that means? If you believe that Bitcoin is a technology to give property rights to 8 billion people, and if you believe that property rights are a good thing and freedom is a good thing and sovereignty is a good thing, then you're a maximalist and now you're just gonna to try to figure out how to spread the network.
to as many people as possible in any way possible. <laughs> well. I'm going to open this uh, up to questions to anybody out there that wants to ask Michael a question. He's happy to take any kind of questions, but uh, as the disclaimer at the beginning from, from Stefan, uh, Knut did want to ask the first question. There he is in the hat over there, if we can take over. Um, Michael, your biggest fangirl is here, Knut von Holm, and uh, he's going to ask you the first question. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Nice to be talking to you again, and once again, thank you for everything. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're not here too, but but you're here in spirit, just just like Hodl or not. <laughs> so my question to you might be a little predictable or obvious, but uh, how did you celebrate Bitcoin Infinity Day 2022, <laughs> and how will you celebrate the next one? <laughs> I just imagined everything there has been and everything that will be and divided it by 21 million. Be it in Europe Likewise. or in Miami or anywhere else. Thank you. Uh, hand up just down the front here. Thank you. Hello, Michael. I'm Juha from Finland. But actually, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think, what would be the best way or the fastest way to, sp oh, sorry, uh, fastest way to speed up the Bitcoin adaptation in Africa? How do we uh, speed up Bitcoin adoption in Africa? Um, I think that there's one killer application that all 8 billion people on the planet want. Everybody wants it. It's not even uh, controversial if you think about it. It's um, everybody wants a, a wallet, <clears throat> a lightning wallet, and that lightning wallet has a checking account and a savings account in it. And the checking account would, uh, would be USD, something like Tether, <clears throat> and the savings account is BTC. And uh, what we can see is that there's a massive, massive demand for uh, dollars as a short-term medium exchange and an understandable store of value across Africa. Uh, and um, we know actually that they, they would trade all of their local currencies for the dollar if they could. There is no African currency that anybody wants to hold more than a short period of time or only they wanna hold it if they're absolutely required by statute. And we also know that in terms of stable coins, everybody wants the dollar. They don't want a digital euro. They don't want a digital CNY. They don't want a digital yen, yuan, franc. Everybody just wants USD. And so if you want to spread Bitcoin uh, to everybody in Africa, you create a lightning wallet that has the ability to hold uh, dollars and the ability to hold BTC and you can swap between the two. You, you know, and maybe we do it with the Tarot protocol. Maybe we do it with another Lightning protocol extension. Maybe we do it with some other proprietary software. There are a lot of ways you could imagine getting there. It needs to be a non-custodial wallet uh, that's open. I need to be able to download it to an Android phone or an iPhone, but probably an Android phone in a matter of a minute. And then if I'm in Africa and I want to sell my tutoring services or, or any of my services to someone in North America or Europe, I can get paid uh, initially in dollars and I can convert uh, whatever portion I want to hold for the long term into BTC instantly. And then if I want to buy something outside of Africa, I can buy them in dollars because dollar is the universal medium exchange. And if I want to trade, I can do that. I, I really think I think that that uh, the dollar would spread uh, if it was on a lightning rail. It would spread to all of South America, all of Africa, all of Asia. Everybody in China wants it. 
everybody everybody wants it everywhere but they only want it uh for the short term i mean you know this is all a, a relative thing if um if inflation is running 15 percent or 20 percent then you think uh well, uh, I guess I want Bitcoin uh, instead of the dollar because my dollars are being devalued 15% a year. And that's my thinking if I live in the US or I live in Europe, right? Your currency is losing 15% of its value a year. Uh, but if you're in, um, I think in Turkey right now, uh, they have 100% inflation. And of course, uh, you know, in Argentina, the formal inflation rate is 71%. So I guess the informal inflation rate is probably like 90%. And I know that in Africa, there's substantial inflation. I mean, because so many different countries, they've all got different numbers, but they're all extreme. So when you actually get to hyperinflation or more than 25% inflation of the local currency, your view of the inflation hedge is just flip the local currency to the dollar. That's, the, I mean, that's just self-preservation. And the way you know people want it, right, is that uh, they're making it illegal to take uh, payment in dollars in a lot of African countries right now, right? So, so um, I, I would say of the 8 billion people in the world and everybody in Africa, it's likely that 95% of the people in Africa know they want the dollar and they can't get it. And um, it's likely that 25% know they want Bitcoin, but they want Bitcoin as a long-term asset and they want the dollar as a short-term asset. Now, the question is, how do I actually get those two things that I want in a fair, equitable, technically sound fashion, right? I mean, I, I don't wanna trust you know, some private proprietary network. I don't wanna trust a company. Uh, it does, a company won't work because there's nation state capture. And if a company were to offer you those services, the company would find itself out of compliance and banned. So, I mean, a company can't do that. And an altcoin network controlled by a development team, they can't really do it because eventually they'll be targeted the same way. And who wants to trust, you know, who wants to trust six people with their money? So who do you want to trust? You want to trust a, a non-custodial, open, permissionless, ethically sound, technically sound, economically sound network. And that means Bitcoin as a settlement network and Lightning as a transactional protocol. So I, you know, I, I really think that's what we're looking for. Bitcoin is going to spread like wildfire everywhere in the world and especially through Africa and South America and Asia. When we have this open non-custodial Lightning wallet that anybody can download and then anybody can get paid. Uh, you know, if I wanted to send you $10,000 or $1,000 and you lived in Africa right now, I can't do it. And if I did do it, the government would probably require that you convert the money into the local currency and then they devalue it 50% a year. So, so uh, it's pretty hopeless if you're relying upon uh, a, a banking relationship on the continent, or uh, you're relying on a custodial application or the local currency. Um, and uh, so that's why you kind of need this, you need the lightning wallet with USD and BTC in it that's non-custodial. And uh, I, I, that would be the definition of a viral application because I wouldn't have to convince you you wanted it. Like I, I still think that in the best of situations, three quarters, 80, 90% of the people don't really understand Bitcoin. So if I'm trying to explain to 100 million people why they want to actually trade in Bitcoin, it's a, it's a lot of uh, education. But I think that 100 million people on the continent of Africa, I think that 90% of them know why, that they want dollars more than they want the local currency. So the dollar will spread virally over lightning on top of the Bitcoin settlement network. And uh, if we want to go from 150 million Bitcoiners to 1.5 billion Bitcoiners to billions of Bitcoiners, I think that the path there is, is very straightforward. It's a, it's a non-custodial lightning wallet that holds USD and BTC available to everybody in the world for free. And then it'll spread just like, you know, all the other viral technology spread. Like, why wouldn't you want that? 
So I think that's the key to focus on. Everything else is is a heavy lift and hard. And uh, you know, I know a lot of people are working on this right now, right? <laughs> and when someone cracks that code, right, uh, the answer to your question will be uh, Bitcoin and USD on Lightning. But it will be the answer to the question: How do we uh, distribute Bitcoin in Japan, in China, in Asia, in Kazakhstan, in South America, in North America? Right? It'll be the answer to all eight billion people's problems, right? Because Eight billion people, they really want a medium of exchange, which is the world reserve currency for medium of exchange right now is the dollar. And the Chinese know it. That's why it's illegal to move money out of China. Right? The Argentines know it. That's why there are capital controls in Argentina. Everybody knows they want the dollar, right? They don't want anything else, but they only want it to trade with Right? They want to sell their products with, uh, with it. They want to buy products with it. They want to hold it for a short period. Call short less than four years. And then long term, more than four years, well, your dollar is going to zero. Right, You're going to lose 99% of your value over the long term in the dollar. So long term, you want to, you want to uh, preserve your wealth. You got to have BTC. But short term, you got to have the dollar. And so there is a opportunity. It's a technology opportunity. And uh, I look forward to the day when somebody cracks that code. Thank you. There's uh, another question. Uh, Italy's most famous Bitcoiner. Oh, come on. Yeah, Hi, Michael. Ricardo, Bitcoin Italia podcast. It's good to see you again. Um, a follow up on this answer Michael I, I agree with you a hundred percent but we all know our governments are working on CBDCs right now as we speak so don't you see a future when they're gonna crack down on stable coins and since they are decentralized and since stable coins are centralized it's gonna be an easy task for them to crack them down and they want to achieve what and they're going to achieve what you just said uh, with cbdc's so with centralized digital currencies thank you well you know i i, I think that uh there's going to be lots and lots of developments in the regulatory area and and i i think that ultimately uh you're not going to see uh, most nations issue a CBDC anytime soon because nations aren't that good at executing on technology. Um, I do think that I, I think that in the United States they realize they'd like to have some stable coins issued by FDIC approved banks, but they expressed that sentiment last year. We're still not there yet, and I think that there'll be a competition in the marketplace. I think that uh, there will be private issuers of stable coins. There are right now. I mean, uh, Tether and, and Circle function right now as private issuers of stable coins. I think that uh, there's a lot of pressure on the regulators to make it possible to continue to issue stable coins because the market wants it. And so I, I don't think that uh, that will be nationalized in the near term, you know. I just don't see it happening, uh, you know, personally. There, there's no sentiment uh, in the U.S. to do that. Like, there's a lot of political resistance at, at, in D.C. and on Capitol Hill against issuing uh, a CBDC. So although we talk about it a lot, I just don't see uh, that, the, that the governments have the technical capability or the political will to do it. I think that more likely what will happen is there'll be a market competition about about uh, stable coin issuance and the requirements and the and the reserves and what you can do with it. There'll be continually there'll be continued jockeying over the issues of compliance and reserves and and um, AML KYC and institutions and uh, and. I don't expect we'll get a resolution on that anytime soon. I do think that uh, I, I think that the reason that uh, Bitcoin is essential is you need that open, permissionless, neutral underlying settlement 
layer in order to be trusted and embraced by 8 billion people. I don't think there's any way that uh, a credit card company or a bank is going to be able to appeal, you know, to all 8 billion people. We're not going to bank the 3 billion unbanked people on any centralized network. So ultimately, um, I guess I just, I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, I would focus upon building the solution that 8 billion people want. What they want is they want for free to download an application to their smartphone, put Bitcoin on it, move it at the speed of light for free and be able to convert it into dollars. So when someone figures out how to do that on a lightning network, it's going to spread, you know, because it's, it's kind of like saying, are, are people going to want fire in their house? Are they going to want to breathe air? And are they going to use steel, you know, if it gets invented? Right. And the answer is they're going to do that because it's just human nature. I expect in general, with regard to regulation, the industry is going to benefit and Bitcoin is going to benefit from the next set of regulatory steps. I think I think this as the SEC gives more guidance on uh, on what it takes to be established as a digital commodity, it'll be clear that Bitcoin is unique as a digital commodity. And most of the other altcoins are securities. They'll be regulated as securities. And that will benefit uh, Bitcoin and cause a lot more capital to flow into the Bitcoin network. I think as the CFTC gives more guidance, I think that'll also benefit Bitcoin. I think the FDIC regulates banks in the US and sets the tone. So if they start to provide guidance on how you can hold a digital commodity like Bitcoin on your balance sheet, I think that will cause mainstream banks to enter into the space. They will buy Bitcoin. It'll be good for Bitcoin. It'll be good for institutional adoption. But ultimately, I mean, you got to keep in mind the difference in requirements between Amazon and Microsoft and the requirements of someone that lives in, uh, in Central Africa, right? A Amazon is only going to move a billion dollars a week on a, uh, a stable coin that is fully backed by a regulated transparent institution in the US. So it Sachs or JP Morgan issues a stable coin, then perhaps Amazon and Microsoft will do global remittance with that stable coin. That is true. But on the other hand, if you're in a country where the economy is collapsing, right? If, if you're in Iraq, if you're in Afghanistan, if you're in Central Africa, if you have hyperinflation, right, you're not going to be able to get uh, access to a regulated bank or a regulated institution. You're going to want a non-custodial lightning or technology solution. So ultimately, there's there are billions of people that have a problem that won't be solved by uh, a, a Western bank. But there are also lots and lots of mega corporations that have a different problem and they're going to want that solved. And you're going to see both of those things, I think, coexist together. For anybody that's in the stablecoin business, if they want to prosper, as if you're a company and you wish to prosper, then yeah, you're going to have to find a way to get compliant and post reserves and, and comply with, uh, with all of the regular, uh, all of the regulations that that develop, that get put in place. That's true as a company, but if you're a decentralized network, I think what I'm saying is the world really wants a decentralized network that provides them with a medium of exchange and a store of value, and uh, perhaps long term, way out in the distance, 30 years out beyond that, maybe Bitcoin will be both, but in the near term. Uh, what you have is BTC as a store of value, USD as the medium of exchange, and billions and billions of people that want an open permissionless solution to that problem. And so we're really waiting for the technology to be available. And when it is available, uh, there, if you're about to lose everything and you're a refugee leaving Afghanistan, you're going to use what's available. Right? It's pretty obvious if your choice is, is uh, starving to death or, uh, or using an a Android app you know, on uh, the Lightning Network, you're going to use what's available. So I don't think it'll be very difficult to persuade people to use the technology when it's a life or death situation. 
Uh, was there another one? Just here? Okay, go ahead, sir. Hello, my name is Nick. Um, I think before 2008, there were two types of people in the world. They did not read the Bible and the user's manual. But after we are today, 2012, 2022, and people are not reading Bitcoin's white paper. How do you think is the education is the way out of ignorance to the glorious, not to glorious, light in light? What do we do, people? How to educate people about Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin? People don't want to read Bible, user's manual, white paper. So what's the option? What's the purpose of white paper? Please explain this, people and everyone in the globe. Let us know. I got about Isaac Asimov where he said, he said, uh, my editor said that for every equation I put in my book, I would lose half my readership. So if you put eight equations into the book, you have to cut your readership in half eight times. People don't like math. And, uh, and, and so there's always been uh, a problem distributing uh, any kind of uh, scientific paper to the masses. But uh, I think also uh, in the modern era, people don't read anymore. I think Steve Jobs said people just don't read. So uh, the white paper is a combination of something you need to read that also has math in it. And so that's why it doesn't necessarily spread to the hundreds of millions. But what does spread to hundreds of millions of people is uh, YouTube. People love video and uh, I think that <clears throat> Yeah, we can see from the success of TikTok, right? The most popular medium is like a 15 second video with music backing it. And uh, other than that, it's short videos that are instructive. So I, I think that um, education is key. I think that the way to educate the world is probably not to write books. We've got, we've got some good books. They already exist, right? And uh, we know about them. Uh, Newt wrote one, uh, a couple actually, and there's uh, the Bitcoin Standard, the Bullish Case for Bitcoin. So there's a lot of good books, but but um, even if I send the book to people that are interested, there's only a 10% chance they read the book. Um, Four million people have listened to my interview with Lex Friedman right by now. So I think that probably I did more communicating on that interview in four hours with Lex than probably every meeting my entire life. And I'm sure it's more than the number of people that read my book, The Mobile Wave. So um, I think that uh, you want to spread uh, Bitcoin. If you, if, you, if you wanted to spread uh, all the insight in the white paper, my suggestion would be let's focus on a really good video that brings the white paper to life right? It animates it and explains it in an entertaining way. Post that on YouTube and blast that to the world. And maybe we get 10 or 20 or 30 million people to watch that video, right? If we can make it as, uh, you know, as catchy as, uh, as uh, Baby Shark, what was it like 10 billion people have listened to the Baby Shark video? <laughs> we need kind of like the Baby Shark and Bitcoin, right? We need to need to think about how we do that with a combination of the right, the right models, the right music, the right uh, graphics, and uh, and then we spread it that way. There's a, there's other things you can do too, but I, I'm pretty bullish on uh, on uh, on uh, video education because I do think that works pretty effectively, and uh, I I think that you you can't. Uh, you know, I think we can't just fall in love with just one thing too. Like the white paper is is uh, pretty brilliant and insightful, but there's a hundred different ways to explain what the white paper meant. Maybe there's a thousand different ways to explain the white paper. And there's a thousand ways to explain Bitcoin, a thousand different metaphors, biological metaphors, you know, mechanical metaphors, mathematical metaphors, financial metaphors, political metaphors, you know, uh, religious metaphors. And um, there is no one answer. There's no, there's no one way to do it. Um, 
uh, sometimes uh, semantic representations are inadequate to the task at hand. For, for example, uh, you know, I, I put a bunch of food in front of you on the table and I put 20 delectable dishes. And now um, I challenge you to write a menu and describe them in words. And I give you one sentence per dish. And now how, how good can you uh, do in describing the stuff with words? Now I give you mathematical equations. How many people can describe uh, how fluid flows, you know, or how water and air flow through a tornado or a typhoon over the Atlantic for an hour? Like how, how would you describe that with words, right? Not one in 10,000 people could describe it with math. And the one in 10,000 could describe it with an imperfect theoretical mathematical model. On the other hand, I could put a camera on it and I can show you what it looks like, you know, to be in the middle of a hurricane over the Atlantic. And that's probably a million times better than the math of the words, but it's still incomplete representation. It's not really what happened. It's just what you view as happening from a certain point of view. So I think we have a challenge in education, but there is no right answer. I think high bandwidth rich multimedia uh, is the solution. If I want to teach you how to design an airplane, uh, you know, showing you a three-dimensional representation of, a, of an airplane moving through, uh, you know, a wind tunnel or through fluid flow, that's interesting. Giving you the ability to smash the wing in real time and see what happens to the airplane if you bend the wing or change the speed of the air or change the viscosity or hit it with lightning, all those things are interesting. Words won't work. Math, you know, equations won't work, right? We, we have yet to invent the perfect way uh, to communicate what Bitcoin is. And, uh, you know, to this day, 99% of the people that uh, think they know money don't understand Bitcoin. And probably 99% of the people that think they understand Bitcoin don't really understand Bitcoin because, you know, it's like trying to explain to someone you know, what is life on the earth? Describe that organically, right? Describe that. How do you describe it, right? Probably right can't, answer. right? Words won't do it. So uh, there's opportunity. And, and I'm optimistic that we'll create more and better education materials. And, and the way you'll know they're working is they're spreading virally. People want to watch them. People want to share them. So thank you, Michael. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm going to start closing this down um, because we've got two minutes left. But to sum up, what I think I've heard is, Michael, you've stepped down as uh, CEO of MicroStrategy so you can concentrate on making TikTok videos. It's upon acquiring more Bitcoin and educating the world on Bitcoin. There's a, it's question. We know. <laughs> we got, you got like 50 seconds to think about this one. If you had one last orange pill to give to somebody, who would you give it to and why? I would give the orange pill to the President of the United States. And the reason why is, is because uh, the United States sets the regulatory tone uh, for the entire Western world. And, uh, and I think that, uh, that as the United States embraces Bitcoin as an you know, instrument of economic empowerment, you know, as a technology for freedom, and as, as a technology to improve the economy, Right. If, if the leader of the free world understood that the human race would benefit, everything would work better and we would all achieve uh, our goals and realize our full potential using this technology. Then I think uh, I, I think uh, the entire network will grow. Right. And uh, the United States embraced oil and it embraced electricity and it embraced steel. And when uh, civilizations embraced technology, we embraced air power. We sort of 
quasi embraced nuclear power and then we got coal feet, right? But we know what happens when you have a technology and you reject it, like what's going on in Germany right now, turning off your nuclear power plants. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, what we want is we want to orange pill political leaders and explain to them how it'll make uh, their citizens happier, it'll make their nation more successful, and it'll allow them to leave a legacy uh, to the benefit of the civilization. Cool. Thank you so much for your time today. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Saylor. Thank you, Daniel. All right, I think we've got, uh, is Chase around? Oh yeah, there's Chase, okay. Fantastic, so Chase is uh, founder of uh, an interesting startup in the Bitcoin and Lightning world, Impervious, so uh, everyone welcome Chase up. Hello, hello. I'm Chase Perkins, uh, founder and CEO of Impervious AI. We build the tools and infrastructure for the peer-to-peer -peer internet standard. You guys hear me okay? Right. A little closer. There we go. All right, so I'm Chase, founder of Impervious AI. We build the tools and infrastructure for the peer-to-peer -peer internet standard. Uh, this includes the Impervious web browser, uh, an open source browser with a suite of peer-to-peer -to -peer tools for communication, data transfer and payments all natively built in. So what I'm going to be speaking about today is removing digital intermediaries, decentralized identity and decentralized communication. So if we take a step back, let's bring it back to Snow Crash. So Neil Stevenson uh, invented the metaverse in uh, the epitome of Snow Crash, but the cypherpunk classic serves as an endearing mediation on the future of identity and society. Uh, the novel follows hero protagonist and yours truly um, on an adventure that spans an alternate present of America's West Coast, um, a land balkanized by quasi-sovereign corporate entities and into the metaverse to battle the deconstruction and subjugation of the human mind by an authoritarian supervillain. All right, so what the dystopia that Stevenson describes in Snow Crash looks eerily similar to the current state of the internet, where intermediaries and nation states uh, practice censorship and surveillance at will, is that better? And leverage the control of our data for power and profit. So since antiquity, uh, societies and governments have used uh, centralized identity to, uh, for taxation, to raise armies, to settle disputes, and administer uh, the law. So centralized identity has always served, centralized identity has always served as the foundation uh, for centralized power. Cool. Um, and decentralized identity relegates the power of intermediaries and uh, centralized power structures, enabling individuals participate in society without 
uh, prescribed or issued centralized identity. So leveraging cryptographic key signing and Bitcoin's proof of work, decentralized identifiers can be implemented at the application layer. The conditions we face today in society make this essential. So basically, um, you have to think about decentralized identity as the basis for the peer-to-peer -peer internet and a free and open internet. So what would this enable? So imagine cross-platform communications. Um, imagine I initiate a, a multi-party video call. I initiate the call from Skype, you call in from Zoom, another party calls in from WhatsApp, third party from uh, Google Hangouts, another from Microsoft Teams, um, and they all meet up in one place. This data transport agnostic um, standard allows cross-platform communications and opens up the internet, removes the barriers and gatekeepers to all these siloed uh, networks. So let's talk about what it's based on. So Bitcoin layer one, by far uh, the most uncontested and uh, authenticated best ledger and source of information. This makes it extremely useful for applications and infrastructure. Layer two, one of the aspects of layer two is uh, ION, the identity overlay network. So IONS implemented, uh, implements the side tree protocol in order to support a public permissionless decentralized um, identifier network and it sits on top of Bitcoin. The ION side tree consists um, of the Bitcoin distributed ledger, nodes to observe the decentralized ledger, write transactions, fetch and replicate data and uh, store on content addressable data stores. So this does not require additional blockchains, or ledgers, um, or tokens or coin, ION fetches, processes, and assembles DIDs in parallel, meaning the network is scalable and you don't need a new token. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about decentralized identifiers. Decentralized identifiers enable cryptographic ownership and decentralized user identity. Uh, impervious employs ION, to create globally resolvable decentralized identities um, based on the side tree protocol we discussed and generate derivative peer dids within the impervious document. Now, that sounds like a lot of technical jargon, but essentially it allows some really important points. Control of your identity, user-based control, um, discretion basically by the user and by developers as to how they like to send and receive information, how they're gonna port their data from one platform to another. Um, authentication across applications, pseudo uh, anonymity, uh, did switching, so identity uh, switching, and, um, and the prioritization and transport methods across endpoints. So everything we do on the internet right now can integrate dids. Uh, full adoption of a peer-to-peer -peer internet standard means uh, single secure sign-on and cryptographically controlled user accounts uh, that guarantee user data protection, discretion, and control. So DIDs cons consist of a uh, uniform reference indicator and a DID document. The uh, uniform reference indicator is a unique string uh, that can be shared across contacts and followers, and a DID doc includes uh, instructions for endpoints and how you'd like to send and receive data. So, um, so that's a sample of a really, really long document, right? Like, it looks like gibberish. But what you're doing here is you're, you're de uh, designating the endpoints on how you would like to send and receive information. The most important takeaway from this is that transport agnostic property of DIDCOM, uh, transport agnostic data transfer is resilient, resistant to censorship and surveillance, and inherently decentralized. So it's interoperable and uh, transport data agnostic and mutually reinforceable. So the, uh, so this really long document, what you're doing is you're designating who you are, how you'd like to send and receive information. Um, 
in how parties across networks can communicate with you. So the implications for privacy, security, and personal data discretion um, is, what, is what has inspired the Impervious team to build the decentralized identifiers and implement DITCOM as a core foundation of our platform. So any developer team can implement decentralized identifiers. Uh, they do not require special infrastructure and decentralized identifiers enable portability and verification across products and protocols. So this decision has enabled us to build that suite of peer-to-peer -to -peer tools for messaging, for payments, uh, for communication. And um, that example I gave where one party calls from Zoom, another calls from uh, WhatsApp, another calls from uh, WeChat, uh, that's essentially what DIDCOM allows. So one party can initiate a call via Lightning, another can uh, call in via HTTPS or WebSockets or arbitrary third or, or uh, any other platform that you support. The whole point is bringing discretion and control back to the end user. So we view this as imperative for society. Um, So free expression is the bedrock for um, all their liberties. It's necessary and uh, it's a prerequisite for representative government. Uh, it's a check on tyranny. Um, and right now it's under duress across the world where intermediaries, nation states, and governments um, censor and survey at will. So we view decentralized identity and DIDCOM as a practical solution for unlocking the utility of the internet without compromises, without third parties, without dependencies. So every organization doesn't serve as a de facto kill switch, which can toggle on and off your participation in society. So in Snow Crash, to bring it all the way back, um, Stevenson predicted identity without the state as an adaption to the, uh, adaptation to the dystopia, um, which hero protagonist fights for, survival and human dignity. So the state of intermediary controlled web demands um, adaptation and, and technology that enables end users, opens up the gates and allows things like the portability of social graph, the um, access to your data, and, and not just where it's stored, but how it's routed and those pathways. So you can learn more about um, Impervious. Uh, it's an open source uh, web browser, but most importantly, it allows other developers and users to make those decisions on their own. And we don't dictate the uh, transport pass mechanisms. Um, it's free and open source, and we hope to see everyone in, the, uh, in this audience either use it or contribute and uh, have a self-sovereign uh, free future. So thanks, guys. <laughs>
Hello everyone, welcome back. Okay, so uh, we've got another Q&A and uh, another host who you all know very well. Let's uh, get Marty Bent back on and everyone give Marty a, a welcome back. What's up? End of day one. Uh, here we are. I'm going to be joined by Jack Mallers from Strike soon. Not sure how they're piping him in. And Jack and I have had no... Uh, no coordination before this, so it's just going to be, hey, dude, what's going on? Let's talk a bit. Let me pipe him in. All right, before Jack comes, does anybody have a... Oh, there he is. He sold out. He's corporate now. He's a suit. Audio connecting, connecting. Can you hear me? That's the question. And I think we're on mute. Uh, it's weird because I want to ask him the question when looking at him up here, but then he sees my back. And so <laughs> I should face this way. Is everybody having a good day? This is my second hodl hodl. I was here in 2018, before uh, before Jack comes live here. I'll tell a funny story about my 2018 experience. I flew from New York, and at the airport, I believe it was JFK, I ran into Mac Parallo, and he looked a little bit stressed. He was on his laptop. He was in the corner, and I was like, "What's wrong?" He was like, "You'll find out in a few minutes." And we got on the flight. And he was finally able to talk. And I said what was wrong. Uh, he was patching the CVE bug that, that launched, uh, or that they found that year. And it was like really funny being with him <laughs> as they were announcing it, like on the plane. He was like, yeah, Bitcoin, uh, something's wrong with it. We gotta patch it. That's a random story for you. From my hodl hodl, uh, Baltic honey badger experiences. Are we good? Can you hear me, sir? Marty B. What's oh, there we go. Yo. How are you, buddy? I, I apologize for the conference. I have a wedding. I was courted to celebrate love this afternoon here in Chicago. Um, and so that explains the suit and my absence. But uh, I'm happy to be joining you, buddy. Uh, the first time I've never worn a hoodie, I think, when I've talked about Bitcoin. So monumental moment for me. Very sad that I can't be there, but good at a suit. Hey, Thank clean you, up well. buddy. I appreciate that. Ladies got to keep it together while, while Marty and I talk, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm happy to be here. Well, yeah, I mean, I, we have an hour. Do you have an hour, just to be clear? I know you have a wedding day. Yeah. All oh, right. yeah. I'm, I'm straight into the Uber as soon as we're done, but uh, they're going to hold it off until we're done. All right, so That's how important Hoddle Hoddle is. Yeah. Uh, and since we have an hour, obviously, obviously you're building out Strike. You guys have a lot of big things dropping. We'll get to those eventually, but I, I think I was thinking I was talking um, with a friend in the back here, and like I've been a Lightning user from pretty early on, and uh, one of the first apps I ever used was Zap, which mm -hmm. you built with a few open source contributors. And uh, I'm sitting here, what is it, August, September, 2022, thinking about where the Lightning Network started and where it is today. As somebody who's been building on it since it launched, what has the development of the Lightning Network been like for you to, to watch and build on? Oh, man. Um, it's been, I think, generally speaking, uh, surreal. I remember back in the day, uh, Lightning at the time was uh, more like a, a lot of the enthusiasm was a reaction to the block size war. Um, so for those that were unfamiliar i'd be surprised if the hodl hodl crowd is unfamiliar but maybe those watching the stream there was <laughs> can you hear me yeah no i was gonna say it's surreal because back in the day 
Lightning was a proposal to scale Bitcoin, and so was the increasing the block size. Back in the day, it wasn't actual a proven solution. It was a theoretical one. There was a white paper. And so when I started testing the Lightning Network, mainnet wasn't even encouraged. I remember I made one of the earliest mainnet transactions with Charlie Lee. And so to watch it go from a theoretical proposal to scale Bitcoin all the way to something that is used not only to scale Bitcoin, but also start to invade uh, other payment industries, remittance industries, influence the way countries think about money inclusion and monetary access. So it's been a surreal experience, dude. I mean, it's one of the craziest fucking things I've ever been a part of. And uh, outside of the technicals, just being along the journey of an idea and then watching it manifest itself into people's lives is one of the coolest things ever. Yeah. And so, like I said, you started out building apps uh, with Zap and Yalls.org really uh, proved the way, the proof of concept of microtransaction content paywalls, which I'm leveraging today. So thank you for building that. But what about the Lightning Network gave you the confidence to move from just building an app uh, in the space that people could use in their everyday lives to building an actual company around this? What, what gave you confidence to go build Strike? Yeah, okay. So the real story I can probably tell in two hours over whiskey, so I'll shorten it. But for those that don't know, I don't really have a background. Being the CEO of Strike, I think, is the second job I've ever really had, arguably the first. It depends if you count the first one or not. But my background is I have a really kick-ass family, a kick-ass dad who uh, let me drop out of college and just shadow him while he was getting into Bitcoin. And so for the record, I've been in Bitcoin for close to a decade now or just about and almost all of it was just helping my dad out. I was just like really miserable college dropout. And I was like, fuck, man, you know, I can't, you know, my dad, I don't want my dad thinking I'm a loser. So I'm just going to help him out. So I got into lightning because my dad was building a Bitcoin position and my dad was a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, and I wanted to help him scale Bitcoin and show the big blockers that we didn't really need the big blocks that this thing was going to scale in layers. This thing was going to scale off chain. So the reason I started zap, I actually didn't really think anyone was going to use it. I just wanted to demo lightning on Twitter, on Reddit and on the internet, because it's hard. It's a hard thing to understand from a white paper or from technical conversation or from a mailing list. I just wanted to have a UI and a button that looked really familiar where you could click send and Bitcoin would settle in clear in real time and at no cost. And I figured, hey, I was like 23, 22, whatever the, however old I was, I was like, man, if I could do that, that'll be a big contribution to Bitcoin. Maybe Roger Veer, I literally thought at the time, would start to come around and Jihan Wu would put the guns down and we could move on. Now, obviously that didn't happen, but that was my true intent, Marty, when I started the thing. It blew me away that people used Zap. It blew me away that people started to contribute to it. And so that was in 2017 of August. So well, five years ago, I published that blog post. It was announcing Zap. And it said very clearly, I just wanted the community to rally behind this thing and really show that lightning worked. You were able to touch it and feel it and see it. And it, and it made everything more real than just an idea. Then from 2017 through 2019, I, of course, was on the front lines. Like you said, I was testing everything. I was losing. I lost a ton of Bitcoin making lightning transactions, accidentally closing out channels I wasn't supposed to. Uh, it was a lot of fun, but I was in the front lines with a ton of other people trying to make this thing work. And my favorite story that I tell, Marty, is I had a buddy, well, still is a buddy, uh, in London. We're an I IRC lightning friends. And uh, we wanted to recreate the pizza transaction. And so there's some nerdy historical Bitcoin shit, right? Like there's no other like value add to that other than just thinking it was cool. And so I send him a lightning payment and he, uh, and I, and my address and he ordered me pizza. It was in those type of moments, Marty, where I kind of started to realize like, holy shit. Um, I just did something that Visa couldn't do. Western Union couldn't do. TransferWise couldn't do. That was a cross-border payment but it was also a commerce payment and it didn't have any interchange. It settled in real time. How did it settle in real time? What did I send? And then you go down the visa rabbit hole of what is a visa payment? It's they're sending credit liabilities. They're sending promises of future settlement. Uh, and I, that thing settled in real time. What did I send? I sent a physical bearer instrument and it cleared instantly. There were no intermediaries. There was no interchange. There was no central clearing of it. It also had 
no border recognition. It had no idea that it was in Chicago and then went to London. It actually lived within its own confines of its own system. And so I went from a kid that was just trying to help his dad. And then just through my own experiences was like, holy shit, I started to think of this thing as what I created this term value transfer protocol. And that's how I started to think of it. I was like, okay, Visa is a protocol. Swift is a protocol. They are, they're, they're messaging systems. And I started to think, so is Lightning. There's, it's a messaging system and it's a value transfer protocol. Now it's better because inside of Lightning messages is actually money. And that's the big breakthrough aha moment that I came across is that Bitcoin being able to be value that's representative of bytes of data could disrupt payments. Because before all payments were messages of promise of future settlement, right? Because how do you digitally send a dollar? How do you digitally send a Vincent Van Gogh painting? How do you digitally send anything that isn't barely digital? And so we finally had bytes of data that was encompassing of value. And so now when you send a message for a payment, inside of the message could have value. So that removes intermediaries, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper, and it makes it global. Uh, because of this bare instrument, these bytes of data do, are not issued by a state and are, do not know the confines of any religion or any jurisdiction or any regulatory sense. And so that's when I started to come up with the thesis of like, well, what the fuck? And the last part of the story is I sat I, throughout my whole life, like I said, college dropout, uh, more than half my life, I've known myself to be an idiot and a loser and um, still very often times to this day. And so I was really confused. I was like, what the hell? Like, am I, what am I missing? Why isn't Jack Dorsey using this thing? Why isn't Western Union scared of this thing? Either I'm really early to a monumental concept, which is a global value transfer protocol for the world, or I've totally whiffed and missed something and I got to go get a job one of these days before my dad kicks me out of the house. And uh, I went through a multi-month exercise of why people aren't using it and people don't want to spend Bitcoin, Marty. If you spend it, you usually regret it the taxes, compliance, and accounting for someone like a Walmart to use this instead of Visa is tremendously complex. The accounting infrastructure in America is not going to update for at least 25 years. It's just the reality that is. Uh, then also volatility. You watch the bars down the, the local water, watering holes here in Chicago that I'll go enjoy after this wedding. You watch them go through COVID. They don't have a bad quarter. They just go out of fucking business. Guys that sell beer don't know how to manage balance sheet. So I built up this list in a journal of mine. And then the first product for me to kind of realize what I thought was taking the global value transfer protocol and pairing it with a solution that's commercially viable was Strike. Was I wanted to be able to make a payment, a lightning payment, a global value transfer protocol payment from my bank account. And I wanted to be able to receive it into my bank account. And listen, I, I also use Samurai. I also use Moon Wallet, right? This, this is, I don't think of those services as competing. I was like, how can Walmart benefit from this value transfer protocol? That was always what I was thinking. It's like, how can I slowly orange pill? Like Elizabeth Warren, she says she hates Bitcoin, Marty, but she also hates Visa and MasterCard. She also hates the monopolistic, colluded environment that is commerce in the United States of America. So I thought of Lightning as very American. I think Elizabeth Warren is a Bitcoiner because she's a Lightning maximalist, that she wants open, fair value transfer on a distributed payment standard. And so that's what the product always was. And so I recreated the pizza transaction with my buddy. This was at the tail end of 2019. But I sent him the payment out of my Chase account. He was able to receive it into his Barclays account. And that was a generational monumental. I was like, all right. I got to start this company. Uh, and then I published the blog post uh, in January of 2020. So Strike is only as an idea two and a half years old and we were in the app store about two years ago. So that's the story. And By the way, people in Massachusetts, can you please get Elizabeth Warren out of office if you're listening? I know I'm going to send this message all the way from Riga, Latvia, but please for the rest of us, for sanity. But in that, you mentioned like getting adoption from people like Walmart and other large uh, companies here in the US or globally more broadly. Uh, you, you mentioned that like you wanna get them into Bitcoin, but slowly but surely. So do you see uh, Strike in its current form as a stepping stone to something much larger if and when we transition to a Bitcoin standard? Is that how you view the long-term trajectory of Strike? speculating on that 
is that helpful or useful. Um, the way I've traditionally lived my life, especially as of recent years, is there's a lot I can do tomorrow and next week and next month and next year to push the needle. And if things um, go a certain direction or a certain way, a lot of that is largely outside of my control. So I just focus on uh, what I can control and what I think I can accomplish. But I do think inevitably there will be hyper Bitcoinization. That's me speaking as an individual. I think a really important thing that I've learned, you know, and how we think of Strike as a company is listen, if I were at a Christmas party, Marty, and I tell everyone the dollar's a piece of shit, little do you know some of the side effects of World War I and what the Central Bank of England did and all you guys, I'm going to give you all Bitcoin and you have to understand and today's the first day of the rest of your life. They could be like, yeah, 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 you're goddamn right it is. And then they can go home and they're going to sell it for dollars, right? And if I do the reverse, if they, if they want dollars is the point. If they want to truly hold dollars, then that's what they're going to do. If I do the reverse and I say, Bitcoin's a scam, these guys are cooked up in their parents' basement, which I, I was, and this kid doesn't know what he's talking about. He's in a suit in an empty closet. This guy's an idiot. You guys need to just hold dollars. And then everyone goes and turns around and buys Bitcoin with it because they want Bitcoin. What's the difference, right? My point is your, your dollars are just as good as, as they are Bitcoin in the function of three seconds. How many fucking apps let you buy Bitcoin? And your Bitcoin is just as good as dollars in the reverse, right? And so- for strike, it was I like whether you want to in that very second hold Bitcoin or hold dollars, it don't matter to me. I don't give a shit. In fact, I kind of mentally segregate that away. People are gonna go about their own journey on eventually, I think, owning Bitcoin. However long that takes is totally up to them. There are consequences of it taking too long, but so so is life. Okay. What I'm trying to accomplish is how can I get lightning? which is an open, inclusive, global, effectively free and instant value transfer protocol into society. So let me tell you guys something. If you want Wendy's, for example, or a supermarket down the street to accept lightning payments, it has to be compliant and accounted for the way the world works today. It's going to take these large corporations a very long time to account for Bitcoin hitting their balance sheet, even if it's for one second. It's a huge, huge deal. So all Strike is trying to do is really deliver the Visa experience or the Swift experience just with cheaper, faster, more inclusive, all these properties that actually define value transfer protocols and their value to the world. But then if a corporation wanted to take the dollars that they're receiving for the goods they're selling and then immediately buy Bitcoin, sure. Do I have the licensing and the platform to allow that? Yeah, you damn right I do, right? But if they didn't, they didn't. But I can tell you this, it's not going to exist. I'm just being honest at that scale. So if you wanted Lightning to drive value to merchants, to the commerce setting, to hardworking families, all the people, like we get double taxed by the card networks. Um, it, it's, a, it's a huge problem in America, which I can get into, but that was it, Marty, is that, Hyper Bitcoinization eventually. What can I do now though? I could replicate the experience that a Walmart in theory has, but then use Lightning, which makes it a lot better. And then if they want Bitcoin, they could just buy it. And if they don't want Bitcoin, then they don't have to. But segregating, holding Bitcoin as an asset, but using this physical bare digital instrument inside of payment messages to disrupt payments and really like, it goes more than just cheaper and faster. It's really opening a free market to commerce in the world uh, and what the results of that will be. That was what strike was and currently is trying to do. Yeah. I think you uh, touched on it there and want to elaborate, but I think you're alluding to the, the Durban amendment and the sort of negative externality that came with that particular law. Uh, what is it? How does it work? And then, from there, what I'm really interested to dig into after that is how are you guys allowing these companies to leverage the Lightning Network without having to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet or touch the asset at all? Yeah, yeah so the Durban Amendment. So I'm talking to a non-American crowd. <laughs> so I'll rewind even a little before the Durban Amendment with the Dodd-Frank reform. So uh, to the world, 
rewind a little bit to 2008 in the United States of America, we had the financial crisis. And because it was the United States of America and the positioning of the US dollar, it turned into a global financial crisis. And so a lot of people point to real estate being the reason, although we all, I think, are smart enough in this room to know that it was extensive amounts of credit and monetary expansion that really, I mean, it, pick your, pick your uh, reasoning, real estate's fine. What ended up happening though? So national government, they put together what was known as the Dodd-Frank reform. And it was supposed to be, some of the intention was admittedly good, Marty. It was these big financial actors, Wall Street, these big banks pose a huge risk to the citizens of America and the citizens of the world is that people are threatened by how woefully irresponsible these people are, and we need to make them be held more accountable. And so we're going to put together a reform that puts restrictions on what they can do. So now some of that I agree with. I think people in Wall Street are traditionally way too risky. They have the leverage to do that because they get bailed out. We collectively as people bail them out. Um, so that I agree with. Now centrally planning on what they're allowed to do, I disagree with, but that's what happened. What Marty's referring to very specifically is the Durbin Amendment. So Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois, where I reside and was born, he put together an amendment that changed the way interchange is priced. So this is gonna be a little long-winded, so keep following. He changed the way interchange is priced. What is interchange? Interchange is what MasterCard and Visa American Express and Discover, the four big card networks charge. So they will go to a, let's say a supermarket and say, in order to accept our payments, we charge 3%. And that is what's known in the industry as interchange. And if you watch my Bitcoin conference presentation, that's divvied up. And so some of that 3% ends up going to the bank that's banking the supermarket and then some of that 3%, actually most of it, goes to the bank that issued the user the card. And then Visa, obviously, for example, or MasterCard or any of these folks take a cut. And so Senator Dick Durbin said, well, that's a load of bullshit. That's about as criminal as it can get. Because this was before credit cards, guys, which I'll get into in a second. This is just a traditional debit card. They said, you're taking dollars out of a checking account of a consumer and moving it into a checking account of a business and charging 3% and you're colluding while doing it. You guys will all raise pricing to the same pricing at the very second of the same day. It'd be the equivalent of all the bars in Chicago going three, two, one. Every beer is now $400 and no one else is allowed to issue and sell beer. So that's collusion, that's monopolistic, and that's bullshit. It doesn't cost you nearly 3% to move dollars from one bank to another. And so Senator Dick Durbin put an amendment together and said, if you are a financial institution with over $10 billion worth of assets, then the Federal Reserve gets to price interchange, not you. Now, again, was his intentions good? Sure. He, f he thought that this line of business was morally corrupt. It was colluded. It was monopolistic and it didn't encourage a free market and that small businesses and the consumer were paying the consequences. All of our shit that we're buying is hiked up by at least 3% so that people could buffer in for margin. So Senator Dick Durbin had good intentions. Now how he fixed it was unfortunately woefully incorrect. The federal reserve now to this day, ladies and gentlemen, twice a year updates pricing for interchange on checking accounts for institutions with more than $10 billion worth of assets. So interchange right now is around 25 cents. So Senator Dick Durbin and the Federal Reserve accidentally fixed the price. So if you fix the percent, let's say 3%, well, that's a different price based on $100 or a billion dollars. What do I mean by that? 3% of $100 is different than 3% of a billion dollars, Marty, right? We following? Now, if you fix the price, now the percentage is variable. So if it's 25 cents, 25 cents out of $1 is very different than 25 cents out of a billion dollars. So now all of a sudden, small merchants that are selling small ticket items of a dollar, like a dollar cheeseburger, now their interchange, if the Federal Reserve is pricing it, is now 25% instead of 3%, right? on a dollar ticket, they're paying 25 cents in fees instead of three cents. So they accidentally fucked that up uh, big time. And so 
that's the story of why merchants are still upset. So Senator Dick Durbin may have had good intentions of getting in the way of Wall Street's collusion of setting interchange, but he didn't actually solve the merchant's problem. Then what did the big banks do, Marty? This is a, I mean, as a Bitcoiner, I don't like federal government overreach in t saying what certain people can and cannot do. And so as much as I may despise some of the things Bank of America has done, in this one, I'm on their team because this is what happened to them. They're like, well, it's 2009, 2010. The mortgage lending industry for us is shot. We're not making any revenue on dishing out mortgage lending. And now we don't make any money on checking accounts because the way we monetize checking accounts is we built a big brand. Consumers deposit their money into Bank of America. We help them spend it via Visa, for example. And then Visa pays us every time our consumer spends at a merchant. Now the federal government took that away from us. So we can't make money on mortgage lending. We can't make money on consumer checking accounts. So ladies and gentlemen, when did the credit card industry start in the United States of America? It is the only country that has such expansive, extensive use of consumer credit. It is the only credit card boom that hockey stick. Why and when? In 2010, 2011, 2012, because banks needed revenue from consumers. So who sets credit interchange? Wall Street does. They just created it out of thin air and said, we're going to give 30 days of revolving credit and we're going to move our 3% worth of interchange over there. And that's literally what happened. You go look at credit card usage. How many Americans had a credit card in 2005? Not nearly as many as in 2010. And that caused a natural financial inclusion problem, Marty, in the United States of America. You think this is the most developed, supposedly the best country in the world. How the fuck do we have a financial inclusion problem? We got the best tech, the best universities, the best companies. Amazon is here. How in God's name do we have a financial inclusion problem? Well, all of a sudden, if all the big banks have to decide who's credit worthy enough for a 30 day revolving door of unbacked, uncollateralized credit, do you know how many, pr probably I'm guessing, racist, sexist, fucked up shit was in that code base. Like if you're below the age of 25 and you are from this part of Chicago, you don't get a credit card, right? Now, all of a sudden, not everyone could get a Bank of America account. Now, all of a sudden, not everyone could get a Chase account because if you weren't credit worthy enough, Chase couldn't make money on you. And so when did Chime start? When did Square start? If you listen to Jack Dorsey tell the story of Square's founding, he said these small businesses, the big banks couldn't trust them to process credit cards. So all we did is in the founding of the business is start by initially trusting them. We flipped the mental model, but why did the banks not initially trust them? And I know Wall Street gets this like, well, it's because they think they're cooler than everyone. I know they do, but it was because the federal government kind of fucked everything up for them. And so I kind of hilariously, and it's not a knock on Chime, they've built an amazing business. I call Chime a Durban Amendment arbitrage because Chime's not competing with Chase, Marty. If you're credit worthy enough, you bank with Chase and you get a Chase Freedom credit card. If you're not though, where do you bank? You need a checking account and a debit card. That's what Cash App and the Cash Card is. That's what Chime and the Chime card is. That's what Venmo and the Venmo, all of these businesses, Stripe, Chime, Venmo, Square, Robinhood, serving the underserved. In America, the underserved, the fuck? Uh, that was all in the era of 2009 through 2013. And so now what you have today, you have these neo banks. By the way, sorry, I should have alluded to this. How can Chime make money on interchange and Bank of America can't? It's the $10 billion of assets rule. It's because Bank of America exceeds the Durban rule where they have too much money to price their own interchange. However, Chime does get the visa kickback because they don't have $10 billion worth of assets. So you see all of these companies will partner with, if you see like Chime or Cash App or Venmo, you're like, this is provided by Pathword Bank. And you're like, the fuck? Why, am I, why are they using Pathword Bank? Why don't they use Bank of America? Cash App's one of the biggest businesses in America. Why don't they partner with a bigger bank? I'll tell you exactly why. Because they don't want to exceed $10 billion worth of assets and sacrifice the interchange, right? That's exactly why. It's all a game based on the rules that the federal government overreached and established in the United States of America. So the result of all of this, you have these new fintechs that are giving you commission-free trading, that are giving you financial experiences that you've never had before because the big banks got shot in the foot as a reaction to 2008. The federal government and Senator Dick Durbin and many more reacted. I mean, these guys are politicians. They want to get reelected, right? They want 
the people to believe in them. So they were like, we're going to go to war against Wall Street for you. Federal overreach and central controlling and central planning never solves anything. So merchant ticket pricing is up 75%. So in theory, if you solve this problem, then the, the cost of goods should come down. It's like double inflation. It didn't. It's gone up almost double. The consumer preference in pleasure is down. Uh, now you have these fintechs, you have a divided industry where the chimes of the world are looking at Bank of America like, fuck you guys. The only reason that you're still in business is because you've been able to build and accrue a balance sheet of over 100 years. And we would offer revolving 30-day credit lines if we had the positioning and the balance sheet that you do. Fuck you guys. And Bank of America is looking at Chime like, fuck you. You wouldn't even be in business if Senator Dick Durbin and the federal government didn't overreact to the 2008 financial crisis. This is a load of bullshit. You guys are, should be lucky that you're driving the Lamborghini that you're driving. Fuck you. And Senator Dick Durbin here is actually in the, in the process of proposing the same for the credit industry. Now he wants to control and have the Fed centrally plan the credit card market. And my whole proposal, Marty, is how about lightning? Why would lightning solve all of this? Why do I think lightning is the most American way we can solve commerce? Because Visa and MasterCard's ability to control interchange and set that price is because that value transfer protocol resides in servers in California. It has a general counsel. It has a CEO. Guys, Visa was a nonprofit in 2007. Nonprofit not like Red Cross, nonprofit like the NFL. It was owned by the constituents of the system. All of a sudden, its ability to flip for for profit, navigate certain laws, and make business decisions, that is the problem, is that the value transfer protocol is not distributed, it is not open, and it is promises of future settlement. It does require intermediaries and credit assessment. And my point is if we just take the value transfer protocol that's in the world, and we make it open and distributed. If you were to rebuild a card network, it would look like Lightning. Lightning, guys, is not decentralized. This is super fucking important. It's not decentralized. It's not a blockchain. It's distributed. It's not a blockchain. That's why it'll be faster than any other shit coin or fork or whatever. It's not a blockchain. It's not decentralized. It does not come to consensus. It doesn't solve the Byzantine generals problem. It is distributed. It is a distributed value transfer protocol, which solves the problem of central collusion. And it really will relieve. So now if I can offer a service to a Wendy's, I set my price with Wendy's, but anyone can also offer that service to Wendy's. You have a free open market. And so who sets the interchange? Who, this is a free open. So of course, price suppression is going to come down. Financial inclusion is inherent and apparent because the standard to get money to Wendy's is open. Anyone can build within it, right? And so I think the most American thing to do is not try and centrally plan the credit card market. I think everyone should adopt Lightning. And whether you want to move dollars over Lightning, whether you want to move Bitcoin over Lightning, whether you want to move Bitcoin over Lightning and over Tor is totally up to you. And if there's a viable market for it, businesses will build it and serve it. So that was a lot. But that <laughs> is the history of payments in the United States of America and where we are today and why I think Lightning is going to be the most American thing we can do and uh, what I'm working on and why I want it in Walmart. Um, and, uh, and, and Walmart wants it. Bank of America wants it. That's the other cool thing. Everyone wants it. Everyone wins. Right? So anyway. Yeah, I mean, they're... <clears throat> I think the beauty of this is not only do they want it, why do they want it? Because they're financially incentivizing to help them cut their costs and create a better experience. So let's get into, like, what you're building for these companies at Strike. What's it like interacting with these companies and how are you helping them implement the Lightning Network into their stack? Yeah. So um, when I was starting the company, you have to come up with a thesis on where the value capture is, right? So because you got to make money or else I, I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm like an influencer, which is fine. But um, no, I wanted to start a business. I was very interested in where the value is going to go. I'm implying a lot of value transfer and I needed to come up with a thesis of value capture. When I was going down the rabbit hole of how does Visa work? What's the story? Because it's really fascinating. And listen, it's like no harm, no foul about Visa. I'm not talking shit about anyone. I, I really like if I were Visa, I built an amazing business, a great defensible moat, and it makes a ton of sense. I serve the people. Um, and so how'd it work? How'd we get here? 
one of the things I learned, Marty, is uh, it's the relationship with the merchant that matters. So let's take a look at a business like NCR, for example, is a big flashy headline, right? Like working with them has been in a joy. Obviously, they're a huge business. They're one of the oldest S&P 500 companies. I still believe they're still in the S&P 500 uh, and like in America. But let's take a look. So NCR's market cap, Marty, is $4 billion roundabout. Visa's market cap is $400 billion. In fact, Visa's market cap exceeds all constituents of the system that initially founded it. So there's no single bank that has a bigger market capitalization than Visa. But we'll do NCR and Visa. NCR and Visa. So Visa is about a worth 100 times more, right? There's a $396 billion delta between the two businesses on, on whatever, any given trading day. I'm rounding numbers, right? Okay, so what does that tell you? It tells you that the value is in the settlement. Because what happens when a Visa card holder goes to a Visa merchant and swipes the card? NCR is the hard that ends up forwarding that information to where the settlement actually is. So it's between the two banks and the card networks, right? So NCR, you can think of them as a messaging proxy, right? They're just taking in data from the card user, the guy buying burrito or buying his groceries, and they're forwarding the data along. Now, the fascinating thing about Lightning is, again, inside of the message of a payment is actual money. And you're like, how is that possible? I thought money were pieces of paper. No, money can now be value, can now be bytes of data. And so the really amazing thing is we jokingly call ourselves internally at Strike Marty the a fifth payment network provider. And it's a joke, right? You got Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, and now you got Lightning. And, and so we enable folks like NCR, folks like Blackhawk, and there, um, I got a blog post in draft mode. There's a, a few more, more than a few more, uh, to receive the fifth message. The fifth message is a Lightning message. It's a Bolt 11 invoice. And so that, though, is a huge deal because if – NCR receives one of the first four messages, then they forward that along to the acquiring bank and settlement happens 15 days later. Settlement happens between big Wall Street corporations. Settlement happens outside of NCR. Now, if someone sends them the fifth message, inside of that message is actually money and we help them receive that money and then deliver it to their customers in a very compliant way. They, obviously, the dollars get there faster. Obviously, the dollars get there cheaper. But then we also do it in a compliant way that's accounted for where someone like Wendy's could actually turn this on, like literally. And so that's the way I like to think about it is you go to all of the people that are in the business of receiving payment messages, right? TransferWise, NCR, Blackcock. Like think of everyone that receives payment messages and you enable them to receive the fifth one. And it's amazing. It's good for the business. It's good for NCR. It's good for everything because you don't have to proxy the value of settling shit uh, to the banks and to the card networks. And so that's how it works is uh, we have an API and the API allows you to receive lightning payments as cash final dollars. So you actually never touch the Bitcoin. Our infrastructure and our service and the business we offer and sell is that Someone could say, I want a cheeseburger, a fry, and a milkshake, and that someone would be able to, along with a visa invoice, post a lightning invoice. And then if that were paid, we see the Bitcoin coming into our infrastructure from any interoperable wallet, and we do a lot of fancy live trading, conversion, accounting tactics to, in real time, post those dollars to uh, your account as a fast food restaurant. And so you get the same experience that you get with Visa. After a Visa payment, you get dollars. It takes maybe two weeks and you pay 3%. And then, so for us, it's a cheaper, faster, but the same experience. And so um, anyway, hopefully that answered your question. No, it did. One thing you touched on there, which I'm really excited about, because this is something we think about in Bitcoin a lot, is like, all right, how do we incentivize open source projects, how do we fund open source development? And one thing you mentioned there, that you can pay these lightning invoices from any wallet that, that you choose. You can use Moon, you can use Blue Wallet, you could use Zeus, whatever, whatever you're fancy. And the nature of what you're building at Strike allows you to share some of the revenues that you guys are getting with these wallets. So can you dive into that a little bit? Yeah, so um, back to the Durban Amendment story, guys. Uh, 
anyone that issues a card to a consumer and that consumer spends at a fast food restaurant. So I go to McDonald's and I buy McDonald's and I bank with Chase. Chase gets paid. Okay. So let's say Visa is charging McDonald's 3%. Visa is probably paying Chase 2% of that three every time I go spend at McDonald's. Right, so they're charging the merchant. What, are the, what is the merchant paying for there is really important because it's actually a viable service. What the merchant is paying for is there's a sea of people in this world and we are willing to pay someone that helps these, the people's money to get into our account in exchange for burgers. <laughs> and, it, and it is like if they had to build their own card processing and they had to build a brand that can connected and collected customer deposits, right? Like they're in the business of cheeseburger sales. They don't give a fuck. So they're like, okay, it's really hard to build a brand and be compliant and build the software and the technology to collect a consumer deposit and then have them spend it at our store. So we're willing to pay if we get that money securely in, in cash final, we're willing to pay for that. And so what Visa does is they charge the merchant for that. And then they take the money that they're making from the merchant and they give it back to the, what's known as the issuer, the person that's giving the consumer the card. And so who's actually paying for your airline miles, who's paying for your credit card points is the merchant. The merchant's paying Visa, Visa's paying Chase and saying, hey, I'll tell you what, if you could build a card and an experience and a brand that gets consumers to spend at our merchants, we'll give you 2%. And that 2% is a, is a fraction of the overall interchange cost of the 2%. So anyway, that's how it works. And that's why you see now the problem is like who gets to issue a visa card is very complicated and it's a very difficult process. And it's largely a lot of it, and especially credit cards, is because you have to be credit worthy. They're going to check your balance sheet. They're going to check a lot of shit. Um, so now Lightning solves a lot of this very uniquely, Marty, and that all Lightning payments are cash final <laughs> is, is that – there are no chargebacks. There are no reversals. There is no fraud. There is no credit assessment. You could be someone I've never met before and pay a lightning invoice of mine, and I won't ever give a fuck. You can't reverse that on me. And so a lot of that cost is gone, uh, and it's totally open, so anyone can issue a lightning wallet. If Chase and Bank of America and Citigroup, these are card issuers, well, everyone in this room that's listening to me is a lightning issuer. You could go build a lightning wallet and do whatever the fuck you want, right? And so you think of it the same. Lightning is a value transfer protocol. Visa is a value transfer protocol. You've got lightning issuers, which is anyone that can build something that makes a lightning payment. And so what we are, are working on and building is, let's say I charge Wendy's 100 basis points. I don't know, making these numbers up. Then what I will do to the whole Lightning community is say, hey, I have 100 basis points of value that I'm getting anytime anyone checks out here over Lightning. Hey, Lightning Network, this open, global, ultimately inclusive payment standard, I will pay you all 100 basis points, or I'll pay you 80 basis points. So a basis point, by the way, so 100 basis points is 1%. So I'll pay you all 1%. I'll pay you 0.8%. I'll pay you 0.75% for every single time <laughs> You make a payment into this store. Imagine if our API was a data dump of all of the brick and mortar stores and all the Shopify stores and all the supermarkets with how much we'll be willing to commission every time you make a payment. And you're like, how do you know they made the payment? What if they're lying? What do you mean? It's all cryptography. It's all cash final. They could share with me the pre-image. I would know for mathematical certainty that that motherfucker made that payment. <laughs> and it's cash final. I don't have to trust them. Right. And what, what am I, what would I be paying lightning network wallet issuers for? Well, they're doing the same thing. Bank of America does. They're building a brand in an experience to collect customer deposits and then, in, and then allow them to spend money and live their life. And I will pay you for that. And the result of this is I get to charge merchants a lot cheaper, way cheaper than any card network ever could because of all the cost savings that lightning gives me. But I also, can pay way more to Lightning Wallet. So anyway, what I think, like, if a Blue Wallet user, we so we're in the month of September now. This is going to be a big month for Strike. That's all I'll say. And we publish all this shit. If a Blue Wallet user goes and shops at one of my merchants, I'll pay him. It's the same fucking thing that banks in the card networks do. 
And to say that like, so Blue Wallet deserves that revenue. They're, they're doing a really difficult thing, which is building a brand. So like they open source their code. They stand for something. People use them for the experience, for the brand, for the beliefs. And then they allow the consumer's money to become money for a merchant in exchange for goods and services. That is a viable service that exists in commerce. And so like we'll pay. And so it's about replicating the experiences that are today. Again, same accounting, same compliance, same, same, all of that shit. And, uh, and just doing it better with more, more open, more distributed. So it's really, really exciting. Uh, and that's the, uh, the last thing I'll say, Marty, is that like, how would a privacy focused and enhanced lightning wallet ever be competitive with bank of America? Well, you got to solve one thing. They have to get paid just like bank of America gets paid. You have to be able to compete with the engineering talent. You would have to be able to have the money to compete. And so it's not fair that if I wanted to use blue wallet at Starbucks, Blue Wallet doesn't get paid, but Bank of America does over Visa, right? And so like these people should be getting kickbacks. They should be getting revenue. And so for the people that are like, who's actually going to like use this and do this? Like why wouldn't Chime integrate Lightning? It's just, it's just value transfer protocols. The reason Chime uses Visa is because guys, they get paid to use Visa. They don't use Visa for any like religious altruistic shit. They're getting paid. And so, okay, fine. I'll pay you too. I'll pay you more. And so that's kind of the thesis. And so there, if there is a market for privacy, open source services and wallets, then that business will finally have an opportunity to grow because people will be getting deposits. Even if you're Marty, even if you are running a node in your basement over tour and you check out at a supermarket, very soon you should be able to upload that pre-image to strike and I will pay you. You're your own bank and I will pay you, right? And so if there's a market for consumers to deposit and use an experience, if we can get the merchants on board, if we can get the messaging receivers, the NCRs, the Blackhawks, the Shopify's of the world to be receiving lightning messages, then we could bootstrap an economy on an open distributed value transfer protocol by paying people to adopt it. <laughs> Yeah, when, when you first explained that concept to me of being able to pay these open source projects, it blew my mind because it's something, again, that has been a big theme in the Bitcoin space for quite some time is how the hell do we pay these people building great experiences? And it, it, it's insane that we can sort of use the system and ha hack the system to build this alternative financial system at the same time. Yeah, not to interrupt you, but like if I'm a merchant, like a Walmart, let's say, and like Nowadays, dude, like whenever I open my mouth, I feel like I go on Twitter and I'm getting misquoted. So everyone take, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. I'm just trying to like give examples here. But let's say Walmart. Walmart, what, what would Walmart be willing to pay for, Marty? This is cash final, instantly accessible, and cheap as dirt processing of dollars. Do you understand that when you make a Walmart payment, they can't actually use the money sometime for a month. And so they're like, yeah, I'll pay X amount for that. Are you kidding and so, okay, so they're paying X amount for that service, which is an amazing service. It's a mind-blowing service. There's a bare value that can be represented in bytes of data that can be dollars in their bank account, instantly accessible and extremely cheap. Okay, so then who should we collectively, me and the merchant, pay to get the money there? So what, like, a Walmart's way more interested in you using Lightning than you using Visa. And it's not because like they've been orange-pilled and they like SATs. It's no, they like cash finality. They like cheaper processing. They like less intermediaries. Whether they end up holding dollars or not, again, who fucking cares? They could get an orange pill to not, today, tomorrow, send them a bunch of Michael Saylor podcasts, whatever, right? The point is they're paying for the properties of the system, the cash finality, the open inclusion global processing, the less intermediaries, which allows it to be way cheaper right? How fast it is. That's what they're paying for. And so then we should pay everyone to use that one. And so I'm not talking about like, yes, of course, like moon wallet users should be getting paid when they check out at my merchants. Yes. Okay. But I talked to banks about this. I've talked to chime about this, right? Like, like the, the point is like, if these guys are getting paid by Visa, why wouldn't they use this one? And maybe merchants are willing to pay them more
to use the better one. Online merchants, more than half their cost is fraud. So interchange isn't even half the story. They'd be willing to pay more if it meant no reversals. So I'm not talking about lightning adoption. Yes, open source wallets. Yes, the existing Bitcoin community. I'm talking about like, how do you get Robinhood onto lightning? Like, what if I were to call Square and say, hey, how much is Visa paying you to check out at all these merchants? What if I doubled it? Now, all of a sudden, it's not about who, like, whether you're lightning or not, or whether the user's been orange-pilled. Square would, in theory, have an economic incentive to use lightning instead of Visa. It's not any bias. It's not who's better or who's worse. It's who's paying me more. And why? It's because the properties of the system are better for the merchant, for the consumer, for everything. Yeah, and this is so uh, it's a big I think I think the next few years like the adoption could be big because because you could be getting big institutions using this thing and it's not because they're anti dollar or whatever it's because like it's better for everybody it's a better value transfer protocol that's my thing I think Elizabeth Warren would be a huge fan when she learns about a lot of this stuff we should still get her out of office but uh no, it reminds me of something that Peter Rizzo from Bitcoin Magazine was saying earlier this week. I think he was on the What Bitcoin Did podcast, and he, he basically mentioned uh, there's two ways in which you can market Bitcoin. And one, one way, and probably the more popular way, is to point out the rot in the fiat system and the fact that it's probably going to collapse under its own weight, uh, which I certainly believe is true and will happen over time. Or you can do something like what I believe Jack and his team are doing at Strike, which is highlighting the step function improvement that Bitcoin provides the market uh, per, from a monetary asset perspective and now uh, at, and at the protocol layer, the settlement aspect, and now with Lightning, a, a payments and settlement aspect as well. And so with the market beginning to realize, holy crap, this is a, a better solution to the problem we have of final settlement and uh, cost of payments, and if you think that adoption by uh, these companies is going to explode in the coming years, what, in your perspective, does the Lightning Network need to do to prepare for that growth? Is it prepared to to experience that type of onboarding action? Um, I, I mean, like, listen, like, the internet is not done as a project right we're still working on it and you got guys like elon musk that are and everyone's working on internet access and security and it's still an ongoing project however it has drastically changed the world unquestionably so right um i think similarly for lightning if i were to sit up here and be like nothing we're ready to go is that true or false both i truly from the bottom of my heart think that America could use the Lightning Network today at scale. Think about it, guys. Like, I run on behalf of Strike. Strike runs about a dozen Lightning Network nodes, and we have failover policies. It's, it's really matured into some incredible compliant infrastructure for these big businesses. And so we can represent, like, an asinine amount of merchants with about 12 Lightning nodes. And let's say Square, I don't know how many – Lightning nodes, they run for the cash app, but let's call it the same or less. I don't know. And that's 80 million Americans. <laughs> that's like one in, well, I don't know the math, math off the top of my head, but that's like a huge chunk of America. And so all, all we really are looking to do is be able to escrow physical value, bear value between each other on a distributed payment standard. That's all we're trying to do. And can Lightning do that today? Yes. Now, also, does Lightning have some problems it needs to fix? Should there be a lot of investment in particular areas of research? Are there security versus uh, feature-based trade-offs that protocol implementation teams and, and everyone is considering and working on? Yes. So I think that like the truth, oftentimes in life generally, but like especially here, is, uh, is very nuanced. So I think that we can achieve an immense amount of scale. Like you could have Bank of America, the Cash App, your five favorite lightning startups and all the merchants in America on the lightning network. So between us and all the other people working on like lightning processing, right? Like it's not going to be, it's not a winner take all thing. Like Strike's going to play our role. Other businesses are going to play their role. And collectively, if everyone's on that could in theory be like 
I think that that's today, dude. I think it is. Um, so I do think that there's stuff we all need to work on, but um, people underestimate the fact that two independent balance sheets can escrow value between each other cash final right now. And that's a lot better than what exists. Yeah. We've got five minutes left here. I'm getting a lot of, I mean, I've had a lot of freaks here at the conference knowing I was going to interview you. They're asking when you're up. Um, I could say this with, uh, with confidence that we'll be adding make, uh, currencies, hopefully to the API. Um, that'll probably come first. Um, Europe is like the biggest market opportunity for us. We're really excited about it. And, uh, I can assure you that a lot of work is going into it and has gone into it. Unfortunately, it's super complicated. And we also, unfortunately, we're kind of caught in this evolution of regulation and law. And uh, as a foreign business that's trying to find their place, uh, it's been a super complicated process. But um, it's, it's come. I mean, we're working on it. That's all I can like confidently say. Uh, and then I can take my best guess, but that hasn't really worked with my career over the last few years. But uh, what I'm really excited about is being able to use our API with many different currencies, which is going to be really cool. And I think that there's a remitting opportunity. We talked a lot about commerce, but I think remittance is arguably a lower hanging fruit. So you heard it here. He's working on it. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of builders here in Riga, particularly building on the lightning network as somebody who's built apps, who's experimented with lightning early on, who's built a, a relatively large business in the space using the Lightning Network, what advice would you give to anybody out there who's beginning their journey on building their product, leveraging Bitcoin and Lightning? Oh, man, leveraging, I mean, just building anything in life, I would just say, um, just remain curious. Um, ask why not instead of why uh, is my general advice. And then for Lightning in particular, I think one of the really cool properties of Lightning is when I, fa or rewind, excuse me, to when I was coming up with the idea and I was sending the lightning for pizza payment the last insight i had that was really powerful was that lightning is an open network and it comes with economies of scale and network effects that are just you you can't make this shit up so i would build a service on lightning and then 10 days from now there'd be double the amount of nodes double the amount of services and double the amount of people using my shit and i didn't market that I didn't do I, there. I, no part of me was involved in acquiring more interoperable services, users. Uh, it, like it was crazy. And that's what you get out of the internet, right? Like Google, they, they are one of the biggest businesses in the world. They built their initial product like 30 years ago and it hasn't really changed. Not to say that Google isn't a great company. Google isn't doing all this crazy shit, but like the function of indexing the web is what they built hasn't changed, but the value of the thing they built has changed the value of the thing they built 30 years ago has grown and grown and grown because it's a function of the internet's growth, right? Like as the internet has grown, the value of indexing it has grown. And so I think very similarly of lightning, I think lightning is going to eventually, whether it be in the next five years or 10 years or 15 years, represent one to 10 to more trillion dollars worth of opportunity in payments, whether that's disrupting cross-border and commerce, or that's creating new markets like pay for content, whether that's representing new opportunities like messaging. And so I would just recommend it's not a winner-take-all market. In fact, all of our success is predicated on everyone else being successful, which is really fucking dope. Um, but I would say take advantage of the network effects and take advantage of the economies of scale and focus on one thing and be really, really good at it. Because the value of being really, really good at something within the Lightning ecosystem is going to accrue and grow in value as Lightning grows in value. And that's taking advantage of the network effects. So for example, Strike, we don't preach that we're no KYC. We don't, like tr Strike, like if you want privacy, you don't download my app. And like you make fun of me all you want. I'm trying to like backdoor this thing into America and into the world um, for what I think is morally and principally sound reasons. But it, we're not, we, we don't pretend we're something we're not. And the reason for that, amongst many other things, is because we want to be really, really, really good and really, really, really well known and really, really, really well trusted at what we do. And I think what we do will grow partly because we'll get better, but mostly because lightning will get better. So that would be my advice. We are right 
at the 615 mark here in Riga, Latvia. You've got a wedding. Will you send the bride and groom the, our love from Riga yes, for their nuptials? I uh, love it, yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you for what you're building, uh, really pushing the ball forward here. And thank you for joining us. I know it's early. I know you've got a wedding to get to, so we appreciate your time today, dude. Uh, each and every one of you, thank you guys. Hey guys, uh, first day, thank you very much, you've been amazing. We will have after party right here, and there's open bar provided by Gravity Team, so go get some special honey badger cocktails. Thank you, see you tomorrow.